Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we're going to prepare for a plus certification exam. If you go to comptia.org, you can find these training resources, and you can see here is the link. If you'd like to go to it, you can do so as well and get these free practice tests. As you can see, there are all kinds of different certificates that they offer, and they offer some of the practice tests that you can look at in order to prepare or at least get an idea of what kind of questions to expect during a plus exam certification. All right, guys, if you got one moment, the like button, I really appreciate it, and especially if you find this type of stuff useful. Thank you so much, and let's get into it. We're going to go over both of these free practice tests. And the first one is A plus core 220-1001. Uh, and then there is 1002. We're going to go through both of those. There are total 10 questions. So not only will I provide you answers with some of the basic stuff, but also I'll show you what you can do in order to prepare. So if you're looking at these practice tests, they're going to be the exact same thing as I'm looking at here. However, if you find a different resource for practice questions, uh, this is a way that I will show you on how to actually figure out to answer these questions uh, by doing some research, of course. All right. Question number one. Which of the following devices provides the portability of a mobile phone and functionality of a laptop desktop? So we're looking for a device that provides portability like a mobile phone and also functionality of a laptop or a desktop, if you will. And then first uh, option is tablet. Second option is GPS unit. Third option is in C is e-reader. And then D is a last option here for a fitness monitor. Of course, we know that we're looking for something mobile, like a mobile phone, so something small. The first thing you think about is a small screen that you carry, and then, of course, something that works like a PC, right? And the first thing, of course, is tablet. That's the answer. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Question number two, a user brings in a smartphone for repair. The device is enabled to send, receive calls, or connect to Wi-Fi. All applications on the device are working unless they require connectivity. Which of the following is most likely causing the problem? So keep in mind, the main issue here is there is no connectivity no matter what you do with a smartphone, right? So first option for A is airplane mode. And then the second option is tethering. And then, as in C, is disabled hotspot. And then D, as in VPN. So a lot of these things can be confusing uh, to somebody who's not familiar with computers and stuff like that, if you're brand new to it. But the key here is actually to look at the overall picture. Uh, so the issue here is enable to send and receive calls. So first of all, uh, that means that the signal, cell phone signal, is disabled, right? And you're also not able to connect to Wi-Fi. So that's another issue. And of course, all applications and devices are working unless they require connectivity. Connectivity being the key word here. So we got no send receive calls. You cannot connect to Wi-Fi, and there is no connectivity. So. What is the first thing that kind of disables all of these things? And that would be airplane mode. Remember, whenever you get on an airplane, they say put in put your cell phone into an airplane mode, which disables all of these functions that we have mentioned. Um, tethering, uh, of course, that just allows your phone to be connected or allows your phone to serve as a hotspot or whatever uh, but that's not the answer and we got disabled hotspot we already know what the hotspot is and then vpn has nothing to do with this okay third question here a human resources manager requests wireless ap's to be set up for the office a server will manage the wireless settings and authorized devices should be able to access uh, confidential records over Wi-Fi. Uh, which of the following settings should be uh, should um, be configured to meet the requirements? So, what is wireless AP? So, wireless AP in this case, in this specific situation, is wireless access point, a uh, place where you would just connect your device to a Wi-Fi 
connection, right? The symbol is that. And but the requirements for this are that server has to have the ability to uh, to manage wireless settings, and authorized devices should be able to access confidential uh, records over Wi-Fi. So uh, we can't just we have to put another layer of security is, is what I'm trying to get at, and not just regular Wi-Fi because we're talking about confidential information. So we're in order to provide the correct answer, we have to think of what's another layer of uh, of security we can uh, add to this Wi-Fi uh, connection in order to make it secure. All right, so here are the options for our configuration. Number A is WPA encryption, and then it's set up with UPnP and MAC filtering. So if you are not familiar uh, what WPA is, um, we can certainly Google it, and that's one way to do it, but you've probably seen it. It's just a type of encryption that's used for your password. So if we look at this, we can immediately see that this is uh, basically an acronym for Wi-Fi Protected Access. So it's a type of access um, or security access that dictates what kind of password you would use, and there are different uh, security requirements depending on the level. If you're talking about just the regular WPA, that's the first version of it, and uh, it has less requirements when it comes to security um, connect connection and the security um, certifications that are allowed over that network. And with the WPA2, it kind of elevates that to another level of security, meaning that it has to meet certain criteria in which makes that connection uh, more certified in a way as in that it's more secure. So um, the password has to be a little bit stronger than usual as well. And then, of course, we can look up what the UPnP is. If we look up what the UPnP is, it says universal plug and play. So do we necessarily want universal plug and play when it comes to a connection that's going to carry, let's see here, confidential records? No, we don't. We don't necessarily want. We don't want that uh, because uh, we don't want to allow just random people to be able to just walk up and just plug in and play anything on this connection that we're talking about here. And then, of course, we get Mac filtering, and of course, we can Google that as well. Uh, Mac filtering, as it says here, it kind of says security method based on access control, and what it deals is that. Whenever you set up a connection, uh, for example, on Wi-Fi, it only allows the specific MAC addresses to connect. So that's a good thing to have. Um, if you want to set up MAC filtering, only those MAC addresses uh, will be allowed to connect to those connections. The way you would set this up is whenever you connect a certain device, you know this is a device that needs to be connected to this um, to this router, um, you can see it, the, its MAC address, and you can s click um, to add that MAC address to that, so that way, next time, um, but of course, you'd have to change the setting, you would have to turn on MAC filtering on later, uh, but when you, with the MAC filtering turned off, this is just a basic way of doing it at home, for example, you turn, MAC filtering is off, you let the devices connect, and then you turn on MAC filtering on, and make sure it has those MAC addresses for those specific computers um, copied over and has the record of it. So that way, it doesn't allow anything else but besides those MAC addresses connected, meaning physical addresses of those components. And then we got the next one, which is WPA encryption. So again, WPA um, is just a basic Wi-Fi protected access, the early version iteration of it, um, and is not as secure as WPA2, but it's not necessarily bad either. It's just that it's less of a security and less uh, certified. And then again, we got universal plugin. And then we got blacklisting, is simply a list of computers or devices that you blacklist access, meaning that you won't allow these, um, you you block a certain uh, IPs and addresses and devices that will, they will, you will just prevent them from accessing this access point. Okay, and then we got third one, which is WPA encryption and, and infrastructure mode. And then we got also Mac filtering. So if we look at what the infrastructure mode, do we really need this? Infrastructure mode is an 802.11 network framework in which devices communicate with each other by first going through an access point. So there you go. 
access point. That's something that we should definitely consider as a possibility. And then, of course, we got Mac filtering. And then for D, we got WPA2, infrastructure mode, and QoS. So what is QoS? We haven't talked about QoS. Let's Google it. And it's a quality of server. It refers to any technology that manages the data, the traffic that reduces packet loss latency generator on the network. So we don't necessarily have to have this in this type of environment uh, because this looks for data packets that are dropped to make sure that uh, all the manage uh, all the data that goes through over the network is uh, has very loss, very uh, low packet loss. So we're talking about quality of the network speed. And this is we don't necessarily need to worry about this in this situation because we're not talking about constant um, data transfers when it comes to using this access port. These are just people going to connect to the access port, maybe access the internet, and of course they're going to share um, confidential records over Wi-Fi. All right, so let's, that was quite a bit to talk about, and uh, let's kind of get back to it and pick the, one, the first one that, that, that we looked at. WPA encryption here, uh, that's fine, but do we want the universal plug and play? We don't want that. Mac filtering is cool, and but you know we don't need a universal plug in place so we're going to say no on a number two wp encryption and again universal plug and play we don't need that and then blacklisting blacklisting is not really going to make the difference this is just mainly good for access points that are getting a lot of connection requests and we're not this is not going to be that this is going to be probably centralized we're not going to have a lot of people trying to connect to it so we don't need number two or B here. And then we got WPA encryption under C, infrastructure mode, and MAC filtering. So, so far, this is the best option for us here. WPA, so it's going to be a basic um, uh, password encryption. It's still going to be secure enough where you still need to have a, you know, a certain, certain level of uh, password protection. And, of course, we have MAC filtering is in the key uh, features here in order to allow connection. So we will have, we'll only allow specific computers to be connected to this um, network, to this network. So this is very, very safe to have turned on when it comes to um, accessing confidential records and only sharing it between things that are connected to this access port. In this case, MAC filtering is very crucial uh, because. Um, we're going to only allow those specific MAC addresses and specific devices and nothing else connect to this. And of course, we got that infrastructure mode, which again is just a framework um, that just basically sets up our access point. And so we definitely need that infrastructure mode and basic, you know, basic level of uh, password encryption. That's fine. And then the last one, again, we talked about this QoS as the last thing, and we don't need the you know, quality of service uh, protocol are set up running at all. So the answer here um, should be and, and most likely will be C and because it gives us all the things that we need and none of the things that we don't want. Okay. All right. Question number four, which of the following technologies can be used for wireless payments? So this should be a pretty, pretty s simple one. So we got NFC. As for A, we got Bluetooth, we got IR, and then we got LTE. So, which of the following can be used for wireless payment? So, what is NFC, right? You all know what NFC is. If we Google it, again, this is the way to do anything in case of a... Uh, in case you're studying by yourself, you know. This is how you learn about these things. This is how you come across the correct answer. I know during the test itself you won't be able to do this but if you're practicing this is what you exactly have to do so it's a near field uh, communication right that's what it stands for nfc is a communication protocol between two electronic devices over a, a distance four centimeters or one and a half inches or less and nfc offers a low speed connection with simple setup that could be used to bootstrap capable uh, or capable uh, bootstrap more capable wireless connections so NFC, right? It's something that you just simply scan. You just kind of pass it over something. Think of um, those, um, the way you can pay for things using your 
phone, right? You just kind of flash your phone. Um, you can also have NFC on your card. You just flash the card, and that's a wireless way of, of payment. Um, and then we got Bluetooth. We all know what Bluetooth is, but is it really good for wireless payments? Uh, not not really. And then we got IR, which is infrared. And if we if we look at that, infrared networks enables computing devices to send and receive data wirelessly within a short region using infrared beams. How reliable is this, guys? And I mean, you can have it. You know, the, like think of just like your, uh, uh, like whenever you're using your remote on your computer. That's what the infrared device is. You know, you flash it and you have to point it exactly that way. And I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's certainly not secure. And then we got LTE. We all know what LTE is. It's on your phone, right? Um, it's just an evolved version of 4G um, internet connection. So, logically speaking, what, 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 which one of these things apply the most when it comes to receiving um, wireless payments? And that would be NFC, right? And if we go back to it, we can kind of see that, again, it is a near-field communication type of protocol that you literally just flash something or put your card against something, it scans it, and it, it can be done with your phone or just a credit card that has a built-in NFC chip in it. Uh, by the way, this is how people steal credit card information sometimes. Um, they, if they're near enough, let's say you go on an airplane. We're going to talk about airplane again. And you have your credit card in your wallet next to you. And a person with an NFC reader has the pocket on the same side as your pocket where they're sitting next to you. Uh, <laughs> they can clone that. Um, they can scan it and credit card. Uh, you know, there are, and there are uh, specific wallets that can protect from that. Anyways, moving on to question number five. Which of the following connector types can be plugged into a device both right side up and upside down? So right side up and upside down. <laughs> That's an interesting one. First one is a USB. U then the second one is USB-C. Then we got mini USB. And then we got a micro USB. So it's something that basically plugs in either way you turn it. USB, we know that USB is not going to work because if you look at the USB, it only goes one way. Uh, it only goes one way, and uh, here it is. There's actually a pretty good picture of it. Uh, let me see if I can get a better angle of it. There it is. See, you only have, can only put it one way. I don't know why. I don't even have to explain to you guys. So that's, that's not it. Uh, let me close some of these windows here. So it's not USB, right? We looked at that. And then we got USB-C. That's what that is. I know it's this is the one, right? Uh, we know that this will work, but only from one end. So if we look at the USB-C, uh, that goes either way. Either way you flip it, turn it, it's going to work. But that's only on the one end of it. Well, it depends. If it's just a USB like this and it goes to regular USB 3.0 in this case, well, it says 3.1, whatever. It's 3.0. The, the blue is 3. Point. Oh, 3.1 um, is actually orange in most cases. Anyways, this end of it will um, go either way. So whichever you, way you turn it, um, it will fit. And then we got mini USB. If you search mini USB, this is the predecessor of it. Mini USB. This is this came before mini USB. Mini USB is like the first. Uh, change of a USB as in something that you would plug into your phone, for example, to change, to charge, for example. And this is what it looks like. This only goes certain way, so it's not that. And then we got micro USB, which is which came after mini USB, which is just thinner, but still you have to face it a very specific way in order to plug in into your device. And that's how it looks like. Uh, no, that's, uh, that's the other one. Here's the mini. Anyways, guys. The answer is USB-C, which is the most recent one, and that's the answer, USB-C. Question number six, a user, a user wants to build a computer with high-end CPU, plenty of RAM, and high-end graphics card for online gaming. All right. The user wants to verify the graphics card is compatible with motherboard. Which of the following connector types would 
user most likely utilized to connect the video card to the motherboard. So this is a basic, uh, basic uh, hardware stuff. Uh, and uh, let's see. The first option is, and we're, and the key here is most likely, most likely. We got a PCIe, so PCI ISA, and then we got AGP, and then we got USB. All right, we already know what the USB is, and I'm not saying it's impossible. There are GPUs that can be connected over USB, but it's incredibly slow and very impractical. Um, usually, you would just be a dongle that lets you push a display. Um, like connect to an external display. That's it. AGP um, is the predecessor of PCIe, not PCI. PCI slot is something totally different than PCIe. This is AGP, Accelerated Graphics Port. If we if we look at this, um, let me see AGP port. Accelerated Graphics Port is designed to high speed for designed for high speed a point-to-point -point channel of attaching video card. So AGP used to be the main way of plugging into your uh, GPU into it. But that's outdated and old technology, and it looked like this. Um, actually, like this. It's been a while. Maybe this. Man, it's been a long time. It's probably this one. Anyways, uh, all of these very look very similar. PCI, it's all of these white ones. The regular white ones that you see here, regular white slots, those are the PCIs. And then we got ISA, which is old, old technology. And I'm not saying that GPUs weren't used it, but it's just so old. And the uh, the the most likely kind of just falls out of it. The idea of being that most likely just kind of falls away and it, it just disappears. It's a huge, huge slot. And you can see here that it's a quite a bit bigger uh, than just a regular PCI slot, which is the one right here. Uh, PCI is, is still used in some cases, maybe, but I think I, I think it's just gone from new stuff, from new hardware, just a regular PCI slot nowadays. Um, you may still see it occasionally, but the answer is PCIe. PCIe uh, is, and this is how they look like, it's just this is the most you see in a lot of uh, you know computers nowadays. It's just usually it's two of them in case you want to have more than one uh, GPU connected for a Crossfire or SLI or whatever. Basically, if you want to connect more than one GPU, and the biggest tell, uh, biggest uh, tell I should say, uh, to differentiate this from regular PCI slot is that it's flipped differently. You can see how it's flipped uh, positioning that way. This little notch is actually over here as opposed to regular PCI slot. So the card is uh, inserted slightly different. Okay, so that's the most common um, GPU uh, slot for a high-end graphics card especially. And if it being a high-end graphic card, do you really want to try to use AGP or, or just regular PCI? I mean, it's just... You know, it's it's be ridiculous nowadays. All right. Uh, by the way, different versions of PCI are uh, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, and they're even testing 6.0 right now. Although it's not, you can't find that anywhere. It's pretty, well, what's the newest one is 4.0 that's available to people to buy. I think uh, 5.0 not yet, but they were also working on a 6.0. Question number seven. Which of the following peripheral types is most likely to be used to input actions into a PC? So an input device. We're looking for something that's input. You know, whatever you use to control the, the PC itself. So we got webcam. We got mouse. We got monitor. And we got optical drive. And then it says, which of the following peripheral types is most likely to be used to input actions into a PC. So action, anything that I do. I'm, I'm doing an action right now, so that's the thing here. And I'm sure you guys already know that mouse would be the most likely input device here. Okay. Question number eight. Which of the following resource types would be the best suited for saving photographs from a mobile device with a limited onboard storage? So we're looking for a resource type that will be best suited for saving photographs 
from a mobile device with the limited onboard storage. So we're offloading some data for off of just you know your cell phone, I guess, for example. Uh, and we got first option, which is cloud file service. We got B virtual desktop. We got offsite email, and then we got resource pooling. Uh, the first option here, we got cloud, cloud file services. If we we'll Google this, we all know what that is. For example, if I go over here and then we got Google Drive, that's cloud file service. Anything that you can, any place where you can upload things to and just have it like a storage. Use that cloud-based storage. That's all it is. Virtual desktop. If you don't know what the virtual desktop is, it's just a virtual desktop, as in a virtual computer on inside of your computer. That's ridiculous. You don't want why would you want to do that? So that's not it. Offsite email. This is totally unrelated. No. It's just simple no. <laughs> resource pooling. All right, let's see what resource. This is not a common thing that people do. Resource pooling uh, is it in term in IT used in cloud computing environments to describe a situation which prior provider uh, which providers serve multiple clients, customer, and tenants with, with provisional and scalable device services? No. We already know that's in it. So what's the most likely here? Cloud file service. So that's the answer. Cloud file service. I'm just going to click a button, and it's going to automatically put my stuff in, for example, the, the you know Google Drive or whatever the Apple alternative is, for example. All right. Question number nine. An engineer's workstation experiences a BSOD. If you don't know what BSOD is, it's blue screen of death, right? This is what it looks like. You get this. Okay? Whenever loading very large CAD files to modify. Uh, CAD files... These are design files. These are 3D model files, okay? Used for just for 3D modeling, but it can also be used for like product development. Anyways, it's 3D models. Which of the following troubleshooting steps should technician take to isolate the issue? So, engineer gets blue screen of death. Blue screen of death means a lot of times, this is what it looks like. The computer crashes and it says it's dumping memory, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times and most of the time, it's a hardware issue, right? Something happened with the hardware most of the time. And then here, here are the first option. Install additional RAM rated at the fastest speed the motherboard will support. So do we really think that blue screen of death is caused because there's lack of RAM? And it needs we need to set it the fastest speed that the motherboard will support. I'd say it's it's irrelevant. Uh, computer didn't crash because it didn't have enough RAM. If it didn't have enough RAM, all it would happen it was just take longer to load very large files. That's all it would happen. Uh, B perform a hard drive scan to identify and lock out any bad sectors from use. So they're basically saying here, do a defrag on a, on a computer. And that's what defrag does. Defrag basically, you know, locks out any bad sectors from use. And, you know, this, this could happen. This could help speed up the computer, but it wouldn't necessarily fix blue screen of death at all. And... C, run a memory test to verify all memory addresses can be reliably written to and read from. Now, here, here we're getting into something here. Run a memory test to verify all memory addresses can be reliably written and read from. Reliably written and read from. So what we're doing here, we're moving, we're loading large files. And whenever you're loading something, whenever you do anything on a computer... Your computer has to write to RAM, to all memory, has to write to it, memory addresses, which is your RAM, um, or or hard drive, 
and it has to reliably write to it and reliably read from. So if it can't reliably read from, here we get into hardware part of it, chances are we could get blue screen of death. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now let's look at D. Increase the size of the swap file to ensure adequate virtual memory is available. Again, if the issue is not enough RAM, then you could increase the size of the swap file, which is the virtual memory. However, doing any of these things would still not cause blue screen of death. Okay? Things would run slower if you don't have enough RAM. And, you know, if you can kill your computer by leaving a certain amount of virtual memory. So if you run out of RAM, your computer can crash. There's no doubt about that. But increasing the virtual memory uh, will, all it does is just creates virtual RAM and it gives you the ability to just process something that requires more RAM. But, but virtual memory is automatically set by the operating system unless you tell it otherwise. It's automatically set. And your operating system will automatically adjust this. You don't have to do any of this. The answer here should be uh, run a memory test to verify all memory addresses can be reliably written and read from. Okay? All right. And then finally, we got question number 10. A user is enabled to browse internet websites. So internet websites are not working. There's an issue with the internet. A technician runs ipconfig and sees the following output. So you would do ipconfig uh, command. For example, ipconfig forward slash all. This is the result he gets. You get an IP address, which is, looks like to be a local address. Starts with 192. Um, if you guys can probably see that same thing on your computer. And then we get subnet mask, which is the default subnet mask, which is normal. And then we get default gateway, which is the router itself, providing you a gateway to the outside, which is the internet. So this is the basically the IP address of your router or a switch. And through this is how you get to the internet, which, again, is the location or the IP address for the router itself. And then the technician pings the gateway and gets a reply. So whenever somebody, whenever a technician types in ping 192, ping space 192.168.0.54, they get a reply. That means it's working. That means the router itself is working. The gateway itself is working. And then the technician then pings the external IP address and also gets a reply. So... Somehow, this technician uh, figures out what the internet IP address for a website. For example, let's say it's Google. All he does is types in, in command line, types in ping space google.com and gets an IP address. And then he takes that IP address and then he pings it and he gets a reply. That means he can reach it. That means the website itself is reachable, but we are bypassing uh, DNS, which is the main name system, which routes Google dot com um, to that IP address that he just pinged, meaning that google.com itself goes to a specific IP address. And you can get to that specific IP address by typing in the address directly, but when you type in google.com, it doesn't work. Um, for it to work, uh, DNS or the, the main name system is used for that. It basically main name, which is google.com, and then it tells your computer, okay, Google.com is actually located over here, and then it understands that Google.com is the domain name for it. Okay, here are the options for our answers. Uh, number one is netstat-nbt. So what is netstat command? I mean, we can look at it in a couple of different ways. Netstat is used in Windows as well as in Linux. Here's an example of a Linux a utilization of netstat commands. It gives you basically information on TCP IP. And in this case, this is not something we would do as technician. This is more of an advanced stuff, for example, for network administrators. Uh, but it's also used by Microsoft itself. So it is used within Windows. If you, for example, use any of these switches or commands, if you will, um, we will give you basic, for example, information, for example, netstat uh, dash A displays all active TCP connections and TCP UDP ports of which computer is uh, listening to. And you can do things like display Ethernet statistics, display active TCP connections. But this is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about 
from one point to another, in which case uh, we're mostly worried about not being able to reach a specific website by using just the domain name. In this example, again, google.com. You're not going to be using it. And then we got net sh space int ip reset. Well, let's see what that is. So to reset TCP IP stack in Windows 10. All right. Well, let's look at what's relevant when it comes to that. It's Microsoft. Here we go. We're talking about NetShell utility. You know, this is something that network administrator would be using to remotely reset TCP IP of a device. As a technician, you think I'm going to have access to this? No. And then we got IP config forward slash flush DNS. So this is the flush DNS command which flushes DNS or resets the DNS record on your local computer or refreshes it, if you will. We talked about DNS, didn't we? This seems very relevant. And then last thing, we got NS lookup under D. So what does the NS lookup does? Well, let's, let's do a Google on this as well. NS lookup. Let's see if I can get a, here we go, Microsoft document, sure. Uh, displays information you can use to diagnose the main name system infrastructure. So now we're getting into DNS infrastructure. Uh, you, you know, th this is something that's used by network administrators uh, when it comes to troubleshooting these type of different type of things. As a technician, you, you're not going to be doing this. The best thing you can do here is do IP config forward slash flush DNS because we know that this computer can reach the IP address for this domain and hopefully by updating DNS locally um, next time you type in google.com it's going to fix it so the answer should be C IP config forward slash flush DNS alright guys that took a little bit longer than I expected uh, I will do a second part as well because remember there are two of these practice tests here's the second one 220-1002 uh, and if enough people are interested in this, I will definitely do a follow-up and do the other one. Uh, but for now, I'm just seeing if enough people are actually interested in this type of stuff. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because lately there really haven't, hasn't been that much interest uh, in my videos, uh, which is honestly a bit confusing to me. But that's okay. <laughs> Not a problem. I understand people got other things to do uh, or other things to watch as well. So... Uh, but yeah, let me know if you like this. Uh, leave a comment. I'd really appreciate to know if you want to see the second part of this. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. Today's video, it's all about a practice test for CompTIA A Plus Core 220-1002. Previous video, we did 1001. So if you want to check that out, it's also a good one and it leads into this one. Today, we're concentrating on this one, 1002 Core A Plus Action. So what's the point of this video? Just like I mentioned in my previous video, is to prepare you for A Plus tests. These are free, completely free practice questions. Uh, there are also answers uh, from CompTIA itself. You can see that this is directly from CompTIA. So we're going to go through it. We're going to talk about each question. And I'm going to show you how to research every little thing that you may not be familiar with. For example, things that have acronyms, command lines, all these things that are not very common knowledge. I'll show you how to research that. It's very simple. But I will also go through each question and we're going to answer it together. So this is a really good learning practice and it's completely free. All right, question number one. Which of the following is the best use case scenario for a Chrome OS device? So you guys know what Chrome OS device? Chrome OS device is a laptop. A laptop that runs Chrome operating system. Very simple, cheap laptop. But they're good for people that just need to do some data um, entries or like, you know, some basic college stuff that you need to use it in browsing internet. It's pretty good for that stuff. And if you use Google Apps, it's also really good for that. So here's an example of that. I just did a really good or really uh, quick, I should say, uh, search for it. And you can see that they're pretty cheap. I guess they can get pretty pricey too. But anyways, it's a laptop and it has a Chrome operating system on it. So what's a good a best use case scenario for that? They are very simple. Keep in mind, usually very simple. Number one, or I should say A, it's web browsing and email. Then we got B, photo and video editing. Then we got C, application development. And we got D, database queries. So again, this is a very simple, not 
necessarily super fast uh, laptop. So what's the most um, common thing that we can uh, use that for? And that's web browsing and email, right? We know for sure that that's, uh, you know, that's something we can use it for because pretty much every computer can do this unless it's something ancient, right? Something ancient with like Pentium 1 or something. <laughs> and then we got B, photo and video editing. For photo and video editing, well, for photo, you can probably get away with it for a little bit. But for video editing, you definitely need something that's going to be a lot faster. So B is out of the question. We got C, application development. Uh, not necessarily, because we could be talking about a HTML, which could be fine. But if we're talking about application development as in 3D design or uh, game engines or stuff like that, this thing ain't going to handle it. So C is out of it. Database queries. Database queries uh, can also uh, demand a lot of processing power, in which case uh, you would query databases, which you know can take some processing power as well. So chances are for this are very unlikely. Most people that buy Chrome OS device is for web browsing and email. Now, I just want to mention real quick, Chrome OS device can't is not just a laptop. But it can also be like, you know, those things you plug into your uh, TV to make it a smart TV. So it's like a, you know, something that's going to make your TV smart, I guess. I, mean, I don't know how else to explain it. Anyways, the answer is web browsing and email. Okay, question number two. A technician implements a group policy change and needs to apply it without restarting the workstation. Which of the following commands can be used to accomplish this task? So... What is a group policy? Group policy is something that affects a group at a domain level. So let's say you work for a company and you do tech support. Your login ID for that domain or for that computer belongs to a certain group, right? So if you make a change to a group policy, we have to keep that in mind, okay? And then we're going to go through we're going to go through these, you know, answers and see what which applies the best. For A, we have a command that says GP update. For B, we got GP result. For C, we got netstat command. These are all commands, by the way, if you don't know what these are. These are CMD commands. And then D, we got DISM. DISM. <laughs> it's a DISM. That's kind of funny. Anyways, so... Let's let's Google what GP update does. Okay, so this is how you research if you've never heard of it. We're gonna pretend like we don't know anything about this stuff. This is the first time I are seeing it, and some of you are. There's nothing wrong with that. So this is how you do the search. We're just gonna right click it and search Google for GP update and see what that does. All right, here we go. Microsoft document for GP update. Let's see what does that do. We're gonna click on it. Microsoft being the source for it, so it should be good for it. I apologize, my internet is kind of slow. I'm actually streaming at the same time, so it's taking up a lot of my bandwidth. I apologize for that. Anyways, here we go. GP update. What does GP update do? And here it is. GP update, and here we'll see what it says here. Updates group policy settings. Well, let's see what the question is again. A technician implements to apply it without restarting the workstation. GP update command updates group policy settings. So here's our answer. Okay. Now, <laughs> we know the answer is GP update at this point. It's kind of weird that both of them are A, 1 and 2. Uh, the answer to both of them is A. It's kind of weird. Anyways, let's see what the GP result is, too. We're going to Google that as well. GP result. All right. Same type of source. It's Microsoft Doc. Microsoft Docs, and here it is, GP result. What does that do? What does that do? What does that do? What does that do? I'm sorry, guys. Displays the results. Uh, the displays displays the result set of policy information for a remote user and computer. Right. So this command, what it does, it simply gives you information for a remote user. Uh, and a computer. And if you look at that, and here are examples on how to use it. Um, you can target specific name or a system. And so basically you would type in, um, where is it? The GP result, space forward slash S, and then you specify a system or a computer name or the IP address for that. And then it will display results for that. 
All right, now let's look at the net stat. What is net stat? Google it. Here we go, net stat. We had net stat on a previous, um, previous uh, session that we did. And here we go. Net stat means this plays active TC ports on which computer is listening. Ethernet statistics, the IP writing table. So it displays the TCP um, statistics or information for a specified computer. So the way you use it is just simply type in netstat in command line and type in, for example, A to display all active connections. If you want to do something else, you would use these other switches here. And accordingly, you would display all these specific uh, things that you need, you know, whatever you need. So if you want to go over this as well, I highly recommend it if you want to learn a little bit more about networking. Very good stuff. All right, let's see what DISM is. DISM. So DISM, uh, let's see, Windows Central. I'm trying to figure out, let's do this one, Docs. I like to go to Docs. All right. So DISM is... Deployment image servicing, right? Servicing and management. So this is specifically used to deploy images or software um, that's associated with that. So the way um, you can use this is to basically push uh, Windows uh, operating system installation, and you can put it like in in, in a different uh, format. You can mount that. You can simply just set it up so it's booting from the network. It's just a way to install an operating system. And DISM here, Deployment Image Servicing and Management, allows you to do that in different ways. So instead of just putting in the CD in your computer and installing image or USB, uh, this gives you different options where you can just, you know, do it differently, basically. Uh, but yeah, it's a deployment um, tool that allows you to deploy these operating system images in just different way and in a more organized way that's used by IT. Okay, so our answer is GP update. Uh, we're going to move on from that. All right, question number three. An end user has requested assistance from the help desk to install new video editing software, okay? The user wants to create several .wma files. Which of the following should the help desk consider before installing the software? Okay, so for number one, or I should say A, um, it's disk space. For B, we got network connection. And for C, we got aspect ratio and D, power supply. So let's think about this here. They want to install video editing software. And the user wants to create several WMA files. Uh, we should know by now that WMA files are just a type of video file, which is Windows Media uh, type of file. Um, there is that. If you want to Google it, you certainly can, but it's a video file. And then we know what video is, and we know what editing software is. So it's a piece of software that allows you to make changes to videos, like I'm using right now, basically, um, the way I'm editing this video in, in the way. And for that, we kind of touched about talk, talked about this when we talked about this Chrome OS device and how these things are not usually very fast and they're not very good at doing heavy loads, if you will. Uh, of uh, that didn't sound right. They're not very good at processing uh, things that require a lot of uh, uh, heavy lifting, I should say, not heavy loads. That didn't sound right. <laughs> so it's video editing software. We need something that's going to be fast and something that's going to need a lot of that's going to use a lot of processing power. So first thing we need the, for A, it says disk space. Chances are you'd have enough disk space. You don't necessarily need a whole lot of disk space. You do need disk space for video editing storage, um, which, which is fine. I guess that's something to consider. So you do need it in that sense. Uh, but in my opinion, for video editing software, you need a lot of CPU cores and RAM. But let's see if they'll even talk about that. Maybe we'll have to come back to this, and maybe that will be the answer. We'll see. You definitely need desk space, but again, not for processing necessarily, but for storage. Because WMA files can be really large. Any video files can be large, but WMAs are, you know, particularly large. And then B, got network connection. See, this is where we get into a point where I could argue that you can set up 
um, network connection that shares processing bandwidth between two different computers that will process heavy video editing, um, heavy video editing um, software. So, okay, let me give you an example here. If you are, for example, doing special effects for a company, right? Let's say these people are doing special effects. Let's say they're making a new Marvel movie or something. Let me tell you, like even 10 seconds of that movie that has all those special effects and all those 3D things can take days to process on a regular computer. You can set up a network connection between two different computers that will distribute the load amongst them. Um, this is also what's it called uh, when you have multiple servers um uh man i'll, I'll have to come anyways uh basically you're distributing the load between two 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 or more servers or computers and for that you need network connection okay but in this case they're probably not talking about that we're talking about a end user just end user but then again you know we can get really into detail this uh, the reason i'm not talking about it about it so much is because i want you to know there are these things that exist um, not necessarily the correct answer here. Aspect ratio, you know what the aspect ratio? For example, this like a square box. If you're looking at the square box video, that's four by three. If you're looking at the widescreen uh, video, like this video here, it's widescreen. That's sixteen by nine. We, what we don't we don't necessarily have to worry about this. The user is going to deal with this on their own. You know, it's not something we have to worry about. And then we got power supply. Uh, eh. You know, power supply. Your your computer's gonna work. You 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 have the correct power supply. That's nothing to worry about. So I guess in the end we're gonna have to, since we have no other choice. I wish we had CPU and RAM on here, or maybe even a GPU uh, on top of that, uh, like a workstation type of setup. Uh, I guess the only thing that applies here is disk space. So in this case we're gonna pick this space simply because. We need a lot of space to store these WMA files. That's the only reason, to be honest. Okay. All right, moving on to number four. <clears throat> okay, so number four. Oh, uh, I just remembered. So distributing uh, workload between multiple uh, computers on a network is called um, clustering. That's what it's called. Okay. You can have a server set up in a clustering mode where they are distributing the, the workload equally. Okay, question number four. A new security requirement for logging onto a company network has been put in place for all users. So it's a security thing and all the users will be, uh, you know, we're gonna be, they're going to be affected by it. This new security requirement uh, for logging onto a computer network, okay? So the, the, the security is stricter now. Which of the following should a system admin enforce to be the best to to best meet the requirements select two so this work of implementing new security requirements for everybody that logs in to computer or to, to their computers i guess essentially to a network uh, has been in place for all users so in this case this is applying to everybody that logs into their computer. Whether they realize it or not, they're logging into computer a company's network. So that's what they mean. They're just logging into their computers. And because all the computers are connected to the network, they're logging into the network, right? Which of the following should a system administrator, in this case you, let's say you're the system administrator, you got the full control of what's going on. You're going to implement this. Enforce to best meet the requirements. So what, what are two things here that we have to change as a system admin to make sure that the system requirements are met. Okay, number one, or I should say A. I keep always saying number one. I'm used to seeing one, two, three, four, or whatever for answers, but I guess it's um, letters here. A, strong passwords. Okay, not bad. We got folder redirection. Uh, C, we got C, email filtering. We got D, multi-factor authentication. E, we got remote desktop, and then F, we got anti-malware. All right, so we can talk about all these things without necessarily Googling anything. Um, I, I may have to do it on some of them, but I'll, I should be able to just, um, I think it'll be simpler just for me to uh, just kind of talk about it. So A, strong passwords. We know this is a good idea, right? We're going to have to change the requirement as a system administrator. What we're going to do, we're going to make it so that you're 
password is going to be have to be more complex. That's always a good thing. So that's one of the things we should probably pick. We got folder redirection. What's folder redirection? Folder redirection is every time a user logs in to their computer, all of these users, whenever they log into their computer, their desktop, um, usually, just for example, to keep it simple, your desktop um, receives certain amount of data or certain files automatically automatically to their desktop. So that's, what, that's what's called folder redirection. Uh, they will basically get specific folder pushed to them every time they log into their computer. Okay, that's what folder redirection is in a nutshell. And then we got email filtering. Um, what this does, uh, it emails, it filters emails. So it's like a spam filter. Man, you know how you have spam in your email? That's what this is. So we can implement spam filtering. That's not that's not bad either, you know. Uh, but we're talking about logging into the computer co company's network or their computers, right? And then we got multi-factor authentication. Aha! We know what multi-factor authentication is. You surely probably registered for an account somewhere that's like a bank account, for example, or anything that requires, for example, your phone to, for example, be a secondary um, authenticator. So let's say you have a password, you log in your bank account, you type in your password, right? Your, your login ID and your password, and the bank is like, well, we got to make sure that you are you. So we're going to make you uh, type in our, our code that we send to your phone. To your phone. That's a multi-factor authentication, right? There are more, more than one factors uh, in order to actually log into something, not just password. And that's just an example. It could be an email. Um, it could be a some kind of token, uh, meaning as in uh, what they use in VPN. It's a randomly generated code that you have to type in. Uh, anyways, that's what multi-factor authentication is. Just multiple ways. Uh, you have to type in multiple things in order to log into something. Um, in this case, comp company network or their computers. And that's definitely a good thing. And we got remote desktop. Remote desktop is simply a way to access a remote desktop, a remote computer. This is irrelevant to this. Technically speaking, you can set up a some kind of weird security thing uh, where they want you to use a remote desktop, um, especially if it's like a dummy terminal, meaning it's just a basic computer that you'll log in and to actually access anything on the company's network you have to initiate remote desktop to get to it chances are they're not talking about this here they're talking about specifically logging to company network it, it, again it technically you can set up something like this where your main computer is actually a remote desktop but chances are that's not going to be a setup like this in, in majority of businesses. And then we got anti-malware. We know this, what this is, anti-malware. You know, like SpyBot or, um, you know, like what's what's some popular, like McAfee, ImmuNet, uh, whatever, your Windows antivirus, anti-malware, whatever. You guys know what that is, right? So what's the most likely two things that you, could, uh, you should do as a system administrator to... Um, justify or not justify to basically implement new security requirements for logging into computer network and uh, yeah so we're going to pick strong passwords and we're going to type in multi we're going to type in we're going to use multi-factor authentication because we're strictly talking about logging here logging in on to company network and those are two things that are most related to this okay moving on Question number five. Let me take a sip of water. Sorry. Mm. Oh, okay. My, my throat was getting dry. Question number five. Which of the following password choices increases chance that a brute force attack will succeed? So brute force attack. Okay. Well, let's, we're going to see what brute, brute force attack is here in a moment, but let's see what options we have. So we got a dictionary words. We got B, special characters. We got C, long passwords. And D, we got capital letters. Now, I know most of you already know what the answer is, but look at look at what the brute, brute force attack is. Brute force attack, I'm going to Google it. Okay, so brute force 
attack, brute force attack. So basically what it is, it's a computer that strictly tries to use many combinations of words or letters to basically crack a password. So let's say you go to a website and you try to log in and your password is something simple. Let's say a banana, one, two, three. <laughs> the brute force attack, the first thing they're going to do is go through most common words and banana is definitely one of them so they're gonna try to one of those words at uh, first and they're gonna try to brute force their way into your account by trying to type in banana one two three but first they're gonna start with banana banana one banana two banana three banana four banana five okay that's what brute force attack is a <laughs> really <laughs> simple answer <laughs> Anyways, uh, let me talk about this here just a little bit more. Yeah, that's what brute force attack is. They try basically all kinds of different passwords to log in. But first thing they're going to do, they're going to try to use some simple passwords, okay? They're going to simple words, simple uh, numbers, combinations, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, stuff like that. But for that, they use computers that are very, very fast. Sometimes they can set up virtual machines that are very, very fast, because when you go to cloud computing, you can, you can get a hold of a lot of processing power. And that's what that is. Okay, knowing that, knowing that, that now, now that we know what brute force attack is, let's look at this again. Number A or number A? Uh, answer A, dictionary words, right? We just talked about this. They're going to definitely try to use dictionary words first because they're the, you know, these are the words that people use normally. Special characters. We all know what special character is, like asterisks, uh, you know, um, commas, all these things, um, uh, whatever, umlaut. Uh, those are all special characters. Uh, those are a lot harder to guess, you know. Instead of being banana, one, two, three, you can type in uh, banana, and instead of a, type in at sign, right? That's a special character. That's a lot harder to guess than, well, okay. It, it will try at some point to use that, but if you do banana, banana at sign, and then instead of one, you type in umlaut or you type in, you know, comma, question mark, uh, exclamation mark, then it's going to be a lot harder to guess instead of just banana. Okay, and then we got long passwords. The long passwords are definitely always good. They take to crack because brute force attack is going to start from very beginning. It's going to start with one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And after it goes through all the numbers, it's going to go through the dictionary. It's going to start the dictionary. You know, they're going to do banana, banana, one, two. But then they're going to try also apple, apple, one. You know, so long passwords are definitely going to make it take a lot longer because brute force attacks are, uh, they're just going to keep trying until they can get through. And then we got capital letters. Once you add uh, capital letters into a password, it complicates things. So by the time it gets to the capital letters, so let's say you do banana, one, two, three, but you make N a capital, for it to actually get to that point, it's going to take a lot longer. So it's going to go first through banana, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then go through, you know, so they're going to try to first B as a capital, and then they're going to try A, and they're going to try, you know, N as a capital, but then they don't know which combination of those things. So, uh... <laughs> this will reduce the chance of a brute force, brute force attack to succeed. So the question again is, which of the following password choices increases, increases the chance that the brute force attack will succeed? Dictionary words. Don't use dictionary words. Okay? Combination of letters, numbers, and special characters, and try to make it long is also good. But even if it's like a five-character uh, password, or let's say, I think usually requirements are eight minimum. Um, as long as you have a combination of letters, capital letters, and just make a complex password, guys. <laughs> Brute first will, you know, figure out that you typed in banana one two three. That's that's the moral of the of the of the question there. Question number six. A user connects a printer to a workstation. All right. As the printer drivers are installed, an error message appears okay that's not good the default drivers appear to be incompatible 
with the OS. Okay, so the drivers are not working. Which of the following should a technician use first to troubleshoot the problem? What is the first thing you should do when you have a default driver that appears to be incompatible with the OS? It's not working. The driver is not working for this printer. Okay? A, services. Should we look at the services when a technician uses the first uh, what's the first thing you should do is look at the services you guys know what services are here are the services look this is services specifically for my login these are not system services but these are services for my login should we look at this to fix the printer that, I, that wouldn't be my first thing to look at just personally then we got a device manager okay we're going to type in device manager here we go this is a device manager would a printer be showing up here? Yeah, possibly. We got programs and features. We know what programs and features. All it does, it has programs installed on it and features of the Windows. Is that related to the printer? No. And we got task manager. We got task manager. Here we go. This is the task manager. All right, this is the task manager. And I'm assuming they mean task manager as in, you know, like the first thing that you see processes. So let's look at it again. A user connects to your print, connects the printer to workstation. As the printer drivers are installed, an error message appears. It says the default driver appears to be incompatible with the OS. Which of the following should the technician use first to troubleshoot the problem? So we cannot install the driver to begin with. What should we do here? What's the main problem here? Here's a task manager, then what? Here are the services, then what? What am I what am I looking for? Okay? One thing that can be a possibility, but in our case it's not happening, is that the service for the printer, also known as print spooler, is not enabled. And yes, that would be in services, but not in this services. It would be in the system services. I'll show you. In system services here, if you go to print spooler down here, here it is, print spooler, it's running. If this was disabled like this, then no printers would even attempt to install whatsoever. Okay? So I'm going to bring it back because I don't want it to disabled. Okay? That's the only reason you would look at services. Task manager, for what? Why would we be looking at task manager? What's here? This is just things that are processing in the background. There's no printer running in the background. Okay? That's, that's out of the question. Progress and features, these are programs. It's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the printer. And then again, we just looked at task manager again. Anyways, let's go back to the device manager, right? What can you find in a device manager? Well, you can find the list of all the things that are installed, all the devices that are installed on your computer, including a printer. Unfortunately, I don't have a printer installed here, but you can see there is this thing, print queues. These are just basic, uh, like, these are not real printers. Uh, this is just a converter, but it shows up like a printer. But you can go in here and just update driver properties, install, uninstall. So that's the only thing that's relevant here, and that's what we're going to pick. So be device manager. We're going to go through it and see if we can reinstall and install printer properly. Because that's the first thing as a technician should do. Look at the device because we're installing a device. All right, guys. Let's move on to question number seven. Joe. I know it, Joe. A user forgets his password and was unable to log in into workstation. Oh, no, Joe. Joe remembers the password later, but he's still unable to log in. Aha. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the issue? So, Joe remembered his password later, but he still can't log in. What's going on, guys? <laughs> oh, okay. All right, we got A, reset account. We got B, uh, delete, deleted account. We got C, locked account. We got D, limited user account. And we got E, unprovisioned account. Okay? So we got Joe again, a user. He's somebody who's using a computer, forgets his password, and is unable to log into workstation. And then he remembers it later, but then he still can't log in. What's going on, man? 
Like, imagine you're talking to him. He's like, Joe, okay, you can't log in. You don't remember your password. He's like, no. And then, like, 10 minutes, he keeps trying it, right? He keeps trying his, the, the, whatever he thinks the password is. He keeps typing it. He keeps typing it. Type it, 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 type it. Type, 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 type. He tries like 10 different times. And then he's like, oh, I remember it now. And he types it in, still not at all log in. What, what's going on? <laughs> he, he remembered the password. That's the correct password. Uh, <laughs> so the correct answer is I'm going to tell you it's a locked account because there's a limit of how many times you can try it. How many times you can try is usually like three to five times. It's usually three, but I've seen it up to five times. Depends on what the system administrator sets it up to. But I think it's three times by default for everybody. So three times is fourth time. It's going to lock your account for trying too many times. Usually when you wait like 15 minutes, it will unlock itself. So the account is locked. You have to go to Active Directory and unlock his account. Let's go back to the uh, answer number A, which is reset account. We don't need to reset the account. That's, this is irrelevant. There's nothing to reset. Uh, that we got deleted account. No. Chances are, this is somebody who's been using the computer. They work for the company. Why would anybody delete their account? That's very unlikely. And then we got the limited user account. What? No, this is ridiculous. Even if it was a limited user account, uh, you'd still have, you'd still be able to log in, right? That doesn't make any sense. And then we got unprovisioned account. Meaning that an account that hasn't been set up properly in Active Directory, all right? Because if you want to know what Active Directory is, I'm not going to Google it, but I do have videos on that. So if you want to check those out, they're good videos and shows you how to do this exactly, all of this stuff. Okay, so the answer is locked account because he tried way too many times. So if you go in into Active Directory, you can unlock him so he doesn't have to wait 15 minutes. Done. Okay. Question number eight. We've got another user guy. Report, reports a phone battery does not last the entire day. And the phone's navigation is slow. Which of the following should technician do first to troubleshoot the device? So it's a, he runs out of battery and then it's slow. Okay. First option is under A. Examine the running apps. That's the first that they that they're asking. Is this the first thing you should do? Second, update firmware. C. Reinstall the most used applications, and then D. Turn off all network services. Okay, so didn't say what kind of phone it is, but we do know basic stuff. We're going to use some logic here. It's a phone battery, and it doesn't last the entire day. We know that if I use my phone all day whether it's just normally or on a toilet or whatever, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run out quickly. And why does it run out quickly? Because we're using it. So we know that either user is using it or something else is using the phone battery. Uh-huh. Okay. And then phone navigation is slow. Hmm, what does that mean? Doesn't that sound like there's something, something using processing power? There's something going on that's causing it to go slow. That usually indicates that there's something else using the processing power. Because remember, whenever you're using a computer or a phone in this case, which is a smartphone, hopefully not a rotary phone. I God, I hope this is not a rotary phone or just like a regular digital phone, that home phone. <laughs> Can you imagine if they actually meant that? We're assuming it's a smartphone. And uh, <laughs> this is so silly. Anyways, so phone's navigation is slow. That means that for anything that you do on a computer, you for it to be fast, you want to make sure you have free resources, meaning processing power to do it. Otherwise, it's going to feel slow. Okay. So the first thing we're going to look at is examine the running apps. That's what I would do, right? This first thing I would do, it says examine the running apps. We're going to look what's going on, what's running in the background, and if, see if they're all like taking up all the RAM or CPU power, you know. And then update firmware. Why would we do that? Usually you'd update firmware on anything, uh, meaning the, the, for the reason you would do that, it's like for the same reason you would update operating system Windows 10, and that is for security issues, like security patches, you know, updates, little changes to the operating system. Uh, no. It's super rare. It's so rare that you would fix this with updating firmware. 
unless a really bad version of the operating system or firmware is already installed that's the only reason you might want to do this but no not in this case reinstall the most used application why like why would this reset the settings for it that's it that this wouldn't you know whatever that's not it turn off all network services why it's not like so basically turn off all network services why would i want to do that first we're not talking about a pc if this was a pc if this was a pc then you would want to turn off all network services if you see something like this going on all right if it's a pc uh and the reason for that, if you happen to get a virus that's communicating outside of your computer, and that virus sometimes likes to gather a lot of information at once and send it over the network, that's the only time you'd want to turn off network services. In this case, I would just look at the examiner running apps. I mean, it's a phone. To get a virus on a phone, I haven't heard it yet. I'm not saying it's not possible, but to get a you know virus on on your phone is super rare. So in this case, I would just throw examine and running apps and close the ones that are just not being used. I would just close them. Chances are you guys know there are a bunch of things running in the background. Just go through and close them real quick. That's all there is to it, right? All right, let's go to the next question. Question number nine, right? Yeah, question number nine. Which of the following is the proper way to dispose of batteries? Oh, okay. Not many people actually know this. Uh, A, shred. Definitely do not shred. Okay? Do not shred the batteries. Please do not shred the batteries. B, recycle. C, dispose in trash. And D, incinerate. Do not. Please do not incinerate. This... Uh, it, it, okay. Do I even have to talk about this, guys? We know that we should recycle batteries. It says on each... On each battery, that we should recycle them, okay? Question number 10. To prevent electrical damage to PC while working on it, which of the following should be disconnected before work begins? Oh, to prevent electrical damage to PC while working on it, while working on it, which of the following should be disconnected before work begins? Huh, I wonder. A, power cable. B, video cable. C, USB cable. D, serial cable. Now, guys, I don't mean to be mean when I say this, uh, but you should know what all these things are. I'm just saying. And <laughs> I don't have to Google it. But again, if you really have to look up things like serial cable, I can see some people not knowing what serial cable is. Uh, but everybody should know what USB cable is. Again, feel free to Google it. I know I, I apologize if I offended anybody, but we all should know what this is. All of these things are video cables and all this stuff. And we know that power uh, runs through the electricity runs through power cable. So we're going to run. So we're going to disconnect the power cable every time you work on a PC. You know, to prevent electrical damage to PC uh, or, or to yourself. You don't want to get shocked and all that stuff all right guys let me know if you like this the last video i said the same thing uh, i uh, i said that i would make a second one if enough people were interested i only heard back from a handful of you uh which is kind of disappointing because i really want to make more if we go back there are a lot more practice tests i can talk about look at all this stuff but you need to let me know if not enough people are interested, I just feel like it's a waste of time if nobody's going to watch it. You know what I mean? So I'd really appreciate it if you take time and let me know or, you know, leave a like or something, you know, or share it with your friends. That's the one way to know. If I see that there are enough views, that means there are enough people interested, right? Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I wish you best of luck. I hope you get this. Uh, I hope you get the A-plus certification. This is awesome. This is awesome stuff. And yeah, you can check this out. It's free on CompTIA. Uh, yeah, free practice tests. Good luck. Take care. Bye-bye.
Welcome, my name is Koboman, and in this video I will go through 20 sample questions and answers from CompTIA A plus 220-801 version exam. These questions do not represent the full extent of the exam and only serve an example of what is to be expected during certification exam. All questions and answers are written and voiced. Question number one. Beep codes are generated by which of the following? A. CMOS B. RTC C. POST D. WINDOWS The correct answer is C. POST Question number two. What is the main advantage of selecting a 64 operating system over a 32-bit operating system? A. The ability to use software-based data execution prevention, also known as DEP. B. The ability to use unassigned drivers. C. The ability to access more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. Or D. The ability to run multiple 16-bit programs in separate memory spaces? The correct answer is C, the ability to access more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. Question number three. You just turned off a printer to maintenance it. What should you be careful of when removing the fuser? A, the fuser being hot. B, the fuser being wet. C. The fuser being fragile. D. The fuser releasing the toner. The correct answer is A. The fuser being hot. Question number four. 80 millimeter and 120 millimeter are common sizes of what type of PC component? A. Case fans. B. CPUs. C. Heat sinks. D. Memory modules. The correct answer is A. Case fans. Question number five. On a laptop, which of the following would most likely be a pointing device? A. Serial mouse, B, PS2 mouse, C, USB mouse, D, touchpad. The correct answer is D, touchpad. Question number six. What is the maximum distance at which class A Class 2 Bluetooth device can receive signal from a Bluetooth access point. A. 100 meters. B. 10 meters. C. 5 meters. D. 1 meter. The correct answer is D. 10 meters. Question number seven. Which type of cable has only two twisted pairs? A. UTP. B. POTS line. C. Fiber. D. Coaxial. The correct answer is B. POTS line. Question number eight. Which of the following power connectors might be used by hard drives? Select the two best answers. A, eight pin. B, seven pin. C, Molex. D, 15 pin. E, Berg. The correct answers are C, Molex, and D, 15 pin. Question number nine. 
Which of the following tools could be person used to test an AC outlet? Select the two best answers. A. Multimeter B. PSU tester C. Receptacle tester D. Loopback plug The correct answer is multimeter and receptacle tester. Question number 10. Which of the following devices is the least likely to be replaced on a laptop? A. CPU B. RAM C. PC card D. Keyboard Correct answer is A. CPU Question number 11. Why would the display on a laptop get dimmer when the power supply from the AC outlet is disconnected? A. The laptop cannot use full brightness when on battery power. B. Power management settings on the laptop. C. To operate properly, laptop displays require an alternating current power source. C. Security settings on the laptop. The correct answer is B. Power management settings on the laptop. Question number 12. Which of the following form factors does a VGA connector comply with? A. 8P8C B. 15-pin D-shell C. Micro ATX D. RG6 The correct answer is B. 15-pin D-shell Question number 13. How many pins would you see in a high quality print head on a dot matrix printer? A. 24 B. 15 C. 8 D. 35 Correct answer is A. 24 Question number 14. You want to upgrade memory in your computer. Which of the following is user replaceable memory in a PC? A. CMOS B. BIOS C. DRAM B. SRAM or E. ROM The correct answer is C. DRAM Question number 15. In current motherboards, which memory bus width can be accomplished by using the dual channel technology? A. 64 bit. B. 128 bit. C. 256 bit. C. 448 bit. The correct answer is B. 128 bit. Question number 16. Moving your CPU speed beyond its normal operating range is called what? A. Overclocking B. Overdriving C. Overpowering D. Overspeeding The correct answer is A. Overclocking Question number 17. What is the PC equivalent of FireWire? A. IEEE-1284 B. USB C. IEEE-1394 D. ISA The correct answer is C. IEEE-1394 Question number 18. Which device limits network broadcasting, segments IP address ranges, and intercorrects different physical media? A. Switch B. WAP C. 
firewall, D, router. The correct answer is D, router. Question number 19. A customer reports that an optical drive in a PC is no longer responding. What questions should you be asking first? A. What has changed since the optical drive worked properly? B. Did you log in with your administrator account? C. What did you modify since the optical drive worked? Or D. Have you been to any inappropriate websites? The answer is A. What has changed since the optical drive worked properly? Question number 20. Which device can store a maximum of 1.44 megabytes on a removable disk? A. Floppy drive. B. CD-ROM. C. ROM. D. Compact flash. The correct answer is A. Floppy drive. Thank you so much for watching this video. Keep in mind that there are many more questions that you will have to study for in order to pass a plus certification exam. I hope this will give you the confidence you need in order to make the first step towards your new career in IT. If you find this video helpful, please share it with friends or visit facebook.com forward slash Koboman and like my page. Best of luck to you, my friends. So there will be a time when you come into work, suddenly there's a lot of work that needs to be done. How would you deal with that? Hello, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a situation in which you would have to think fast, think fast, think fast to resolve computer issues. So this video is good for help desk tier one, tier two, or desktop support or tech support, or if you're the guy that just simply works at a location as tech support for a company. So in this case, we have four different uh, trouble tickets that came through the system, but they are something that was left over from the previous shift or from the previous group that was in charge of that. So I'm going to show you how I would quickly resolve these issue. So this kind of uh, give you, will give you an idea of how I'm thinking and I will actually give you a kind of uh, uh, an idea of my level of knowledge or level of expertise, a level of experience. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It makes a big difference for me. And without any further delay, let's get into it. Okay, so here we go, guys. Uh, we've got some tickets we're going to work on. What is this? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys watched my previous video um, on Active Directory. Uh, I do uh, suggest you check it out. Uh, we worked on some of these people. We created some user accounts, put them in their different groups, and we got, you know, def different people that we created on there, like Mary Pipkins, Mike Bobson, and Larry Buffett, and we put them all in there if you want to check that out. I do have a video on that. It's, uh, uh, I think it's Active Directory for beginners or something like that. Yeah, check that out. It's a good video. All right. So I made some of these tickets during uh, testing of the live stream that I made, I want to say a couple of weeks ago. So they are uh, quite expired. So as you can see here, time to do is negative 85 hours. So that's many, many days past due and you, you don't want to see this in a ticketing system at all. Uh, you want them to be fresh. You don't want them to have that. Well, you know, okay, let, let me just create that, uh, just a fake ticket. Just so you guys can see, fake ticket, how it uh, looks like whenever uh, you have a freshly ticket that comes through. Of course, this is going to be a different uh, looking for different uh, ticketing systems, but for this one, we're just going to, it's going to, yeah, there it is, pops up. And it, it, when it just creates it for Jira ticketing system, it's eight hours um to do it to fix it that's the deadline eight hours all right so let's see we have my desktop icons are missing and uh it says here i am missing desktop icons please help me so what can cause this now 
there are many things that can actually cause this from user deleting the files from uh, some kind of a change on domain. So let's say somebody uh, gets transferred to a different department, they get moved into a different group within a domain or within Active Directory, if you will, and um, suddenly now they are missing different icons because uh, this can be due to the like different redirects that different groups may have. And again, if you don't know what I'm talking about at this point, you might want to check out my Active Directory video that I mentioned previously. And uh, when it comes to this uh, video, I'm just going to kind of give you quick answers and show you quick answers on some of these tickets that how I would go about resolving them. If you want to know exactly how to do these tickets, you know, in, in the sense on how to contact the customer, how to add internal notes like this, how to reply to the customer, how to talk to them in general, and customer service just in general, how to work actual system. I have many, many examples of videos on that, and do check that out. There are literally, so if you go to my channel, youtube.com forward slash Coleman, and go to the search box within my channel, and just type in ticket, and you'll see all of those individual examples that literally go into super detail on how to do all of this stuff. And it's very, very good, especially for somebody who has never done it. Anyways, I'm sorry, I had to get that out of the way so you guys, uh, you know, have more resources to actually check out in case you haven't watched my previous videos. So again, I'm going to go through all these tickets that are in the system, and I'm going to give you quick answers of what I would do in order to resolve them. So this one is, I'm missing desktop icons, please help me. So it could be just something that, you know, user went through like this and just like deleted, or went through like this and just kind of drag things into the recycle bin or anywhere else. And then again, it could be somebody who moved to a different department. You kind of have to ask them all this stuff. Did you move to a different department? Uh, why are you, you know, it's kind of unusual to have missing desktop icons. So when somebody moves to a different department, they're moved to a different group within Active Directory, which can have different desktop redirects. Uh, these desktop redirects is something that is set up for individual departments that allow for certain desktop icons, uh, files, even files like this, or anything else within that you can put literally in a folder. And um, those people within that group will get desktop redirect, meaning that they will get all of those uh, redirected files pushed to them. So let's say somebody logged into this computer and they belong to a certain group. And let's say that certain group is going to always have, for example, these files in it, and their desktop will always have these files. They will get automatically redirected. Uh, they will they will automatically get these files redirected to their desktop like this. You know, so if they've been moved to a different group, chances are they may no longer have these. You know, so that's another thing you can do. Obviously, you can look through a recycle bin to see if there's something in the recycle bin if they've deleted it, and uh, it depends what it is. They may be asking about. Uh, specific software that it's missing you know software could have multiple icons because you know there are some software that has more than one function and they have more than uh, one app within that one software so they could be missing those uh, is it all icons if it's just some you know all these things we have to um, kind of ask them first in order to kind of help them and kind of trace back the steps and help them figure out where what happened to them so that's how I would approach this ticket here. Here's another one here where it says, I can't hear people through Zoom meeting. So if we look at this and it says today I had a meeting, but I can no longer hear people. So what is this? I mean, Zoom meeting, we all know what Zoom meeting is. And that is just a software or an application that's used for communication, right? So, you know, if they can't hear people through Zoom meeting, that means there's some kind of an audio issue going on. And of course, for that, I would go through the uh, sound control panel. What I usually like to do is I would right click this uh, volume icon and of course make sure that it's, you know, normal stuff that it's not muted and this and that. So what I like to do is go open, you know, open sound settings and go to uh, well, first like right away, right away, you can, you know, make sure that their output is set to whatever it is. So in this case, we got Realtek set to Realtek high definition audio. If we know Realtek high definition audio is just a built-in audio for the computer. That's not their headphones that they might be using. So you might want to drop down and select the headphones that they're using. You know, so that's just one place where you can look at it. I mean, they haven't mentioned anything about people not being able to hear them, but if that's the case, obviously you want to go to input and make sure that the microphone is selected. Or if you see an issue like this where it says no input device found, then we have another issue. Then for that, I would go to sound control panel, which is over here, and then 
uh, for you know, but since the issue is they can't, he I can't hear people through Zoom meeting. Um, chances are that the, their headset is not selected. In this case, we, there is no headset. The only thing that's selected is just the real tech, which is the onboard sound. So we want to make sure that their headset, whatever it is, um, might be selected. As a matter of fact, I'm going to plug in a headset over there so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so there it is. I plugged it in over there and it automatically selected it, which is good. Uh, so yeah, of course, uh, the issue might be simply that their headset is not plugged in, but chances are pretty low, you know. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that it has that uh, green circle with the white check mark that it's selected. So if you have it uh, set like this, so you can, you know, this automatically actually selected it to be a default the communication device, which is fine. That could work too. Uh, but let's say it's set up like this and you, you know, it's not set up as default. You might want to do this and set it up as a default. And you can do this, make sure it's set as, uh, you know, uh, automatically communication device. But, uh, and here is the part of it now where the microphone comes up. Now we can see that it's selected and you can see that there's nothing plugged in. It's a recording part of uh, just the real tech part of it. Uh, that being said, uh, make sure that you go inside of the application, whether it's Zoom, uh, WebEx, or whatever it is that they're using for meeting, make sure that you go inside and make sure their headset is selected just like so. I have many videos on this, so I'm just going to move on from this. But this is typically what the issue is when it comes to audio issues. We want to make sure that everything is selected, volume raised, tested, whether it's uh, them not being able to hear somebody or whether they're, people are not able, able to hear them. So just go through those settings and uh, yeah, it should be able to get you on the in the in the right direction. Here's another one that says, I am missing a program on my desktop. So they usually, uh, users usually realize this when there's an icon missing, when there's an icon missing on their desktop. So you can start from there. Let's say they're, say, they're saying, I don't have my Google Chrome. You know, chances are maybe it's just a shortcut that's been deleted. So you want to go to the programs and actually look for it to see if it's installed there. That's your first step. If indeed is a missing, and you know how they they say in this example, they're saying my program on my desktop, chances are it's just the icon. So if it's just the icon, go to Recycle Bin and see if it's been accidentally deleted and bring it back. But if, if the software is indeed missing, uh, you would have to basically go inside, uh, usually within the start menu somewhere here or within... Uh, the programs themselves, you would know, you know, the company that you're working for, you would know what kind of uh, distribution software that they're using to push different programs. So, for example, you see all of these things that are installed on here. Chances are, aside from Microsoft stuff, but like, let's say there's other stuff installed in here. For example, uh, we got OpenOffice, we got Oracle, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Chances are that this type of software will be controlled by another software that does the distribution, meaning installation of the software for all the computers within a company. So it's a program that controls installation of all of these things. So you would go in here and search for that program and look it up either here or the root of C, depends how it's all set up. But you would make sure that indeed that program that they're missing is listed in there. So all you have to do is just make sure that it, it, see if it's in see if it allows you to reinstall it and there should be a way to do it. A lot of times you would select that and just select install, you know, and they have different options like uninstall, this is the repair, maybe this and that. That's how I'll go about it. But if they are uh, no longer have the, the software that they need, this might be some kind of a licensing issue. You have to kind of figure out what happened to their program. So Sometimes, sometimes people that control what they call subscriptions, uh, software subscriptions for the company, for each computer, for each individual within the company, sometimes um, they will remove uh, licenses, licenses, uh, program licenses from the computers, and they would sometimes automatically remove them, or meaning that the, they would remove the program automatically. So. The way you can check this is basically by finding out what the uh, host name is for the computer typically. So you would find out what, so the name of the computer host name or computer name is the same thing. Host name is generally used in a uh, business type of environment. So host name, computer name is the same thing. So you would n take this name, tech support, uh, as the computer name, as the host name, and look it up in the system that uh, allows you to look up different subscriptions that are 
uh, added to this computer named tech support. So, and then you will look for that specific subscription for that program that they're missing. And if they're missing that subscription, they may have to, or you may have to assist them in order to get that software again, you know? So, all right, that's how I would go about approaching this one. So let's move on. And for that, we have a ticket here. It says, I think I may have a virus on my computer from Mike Moser. It says here, this morning I received a weird message that said my computer is infected. I can't click away or use a computer at all. So this is a really good uh, example of something that you may encounter um, in a help desk, but also desktop support. If you're in a help desk, you may have limited tools, but if you're doing desktop support and you happen to be a guy that's like on site, then there is something you can do about it. Depending on the help desk, you may be able to do something about it as well. But generally speaking, if, if it's a message like this, you definitely want to take care of it right away. So if you are just a text, if, okay, well, let me, let me start from the beginning. I apologize. If you're help desk, all you can do here is kind of uh, go with your feeling on this. You know, the, the, the ticket literally says, this morning I received a weird message that my computer is infected. That, you might as well assume that there is a virus on there right off the bat. So the best thing you can do to them, or, or to them, not to them, but with the user is ask them to disconnect the computer from the network and turn it off. So that way, or, or just, you know, unplug it from the power. You know, that's what I would do. Just let them, tell them to shut down, turn it off. Especially if they can't click on anything, you want them to turn it off. And... When you're tier that's when you're tier one help desk, that's pretty much all you can do. And then from there, you may have to refer them to their local uh, tech support people. You know, they could they may have somebody at the office in their building. So let's say there it's some kind of a large building. There's you know I don't know 500 employees. They gotta have somebody there who is that their tech guy who deals with this type of stuff. Now, if you are that guy that deals with this type of stuff, uh, there are steps that you have to take in order to remove this virus. Generally speaking, in a business environment, the best thing to do is just, you know, re-image the computer, meaning that you would delete everything from the computer. But sometimes you have to recover data that's on there. Let's say user saved a bunch of important stuff on the computer. Then you got to take certain steps in order to uh, retrieve this because you can't just pull them off. So typically you would, what you would do is take a hard drive uh, from this infected computer. You would physically take it, put it into another computer, and set it as a slave drive. But make sure that other computer is updated, meaning Windows updated. Make sure that their virus definition is updated and make sure it's completely updated uh, to make sure so it doesn't get infected as well. Make sure that the computer is off the network, meaning that it's not connected to the, the company's network or anything like that, because if you don't know what kind of virus this is, this could be something that could spread. You know what I mean? So this is all in case you have to recover data from it. All right. From there, um, you, you know, the, the, the this drive is slaved. Whenever you slave a drive into a computer, meaning you add a second hard drive to the computer, in this case, this infected drive, you take it, you put it inside the computer, and you just plug it into the power and the SATA connection, chances are. And then what it's going to look like is just going to show up as a second drive like this, you know. So as long as it's like that and it's not the system drive and you don't execute anything, meaning you go inside of this drive and you don't click on any executables or anything. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even go in, into it right away at all. I wouldn't even open it up. Um, you know, the chances are that as long as you don't run anything, your computer is completely safe because you are running things off your C drive and everything that's running in the background like this. See, these are all background processes. They're all running from your local C drive and not from the slave drive uh, like in this example. So as long as you don't execute anything, you, there's no way for a virus to actually execute itself. You know? Uh, that would be have to, that would have to be some highly sophisticated virus. It's 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 I want to say ninety nine point nine percent impossible for that to happen. So the reason you want to have it slaved like this is so that way you can actually scan it. So if you right click it and then you can just scan it. For example, with you know Windows Defender or whatever the installed antivirus software is it or and is is on on your computer. That way you will find the 
uh, the in infection, you would remove it, and at that point, you can go inside and recover anything that might be on there that they need, you know? So that way, it's perfectly safe to go in and ask them or just kind of look around to see where they might have data that you want to recover. Of course, the drive itself, when you slave it, might have a BitLocker encryption on it. For that, it's going to ask you for a key. You see how this one has a little locket on it? That means it's unlocked. But, you know, if you... Uh, if you do get a prompt, like you would double click it and it would ask you, I made a video on this, on how to actually unlock it. So I do have a video on how to deal with a BitLocker encryption. You double click it and it would say, nope, you need a password or you need the BitLocker uh, key. And then you would get that and then, you know, go from there. That's another layer of security, which is good. So that's how you would go about it. And of course, after you're done with it, remove the drive and I would just, you know, uh, wipe it. I would wipe it clean. I hope I'm not going too fast because this is a video and which I'm trying to make uh, just in my spare time. I really don't have that much spare time, so I apologize if I'm going too fast for people that are used to me going slower. And I think that's it. This is the last thing. One, the last one here is the fake ticket one. And again, I have a lot of examples of this type of stuff. How to do everything from from the beginning to an end. All right, guys, I'm gonna go to my uh, face cam outro, I guess. Well, there you go. I hope you find this video insightful. Sometimes you got to think fast in order to resolve all these issues quickly. In this case, we had few tickets that were left over and we took care of them. Uh, there are many, many things you can do with that. But with experience, you will become faster and more knowledgeable and will be able to resolve these issues quickly. It's not a big deal once you know how to do all of this stuff. So never shy away from trying to learn things on your own. It's incredibly important because that's how you learn new things and that's how you become smart. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Take care, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to a help desk ticketing crash course. If you have friends that are interested in this type of stuff too, please let them know as this is premiering right now. All right, guys, we have a lot to cover. This is going to be about an hour and a half. So sit back, relax. If you want to get some coffee or something to drink, now is a good time. And while you're getting a snack or a drink, please take one second out of your time to like this video. I really appreciate it. And with that being said, let's get right into it. So first ticket is based off my feedback that I got from Eddie. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, you know who you are. Thank you so much uh, for giving me an idea for this ticket. So let's have a look. And says, I can't log in to my computer. And the error is domain not available. So the reporter name is Mike Moser. And Mike here says, please help me. I only get an error domain not available when attempting to log in. So I'll log into his computer, right? I am able to log in using my phone app to contact help desk. So I don't think it's my password. So here's what's going on. Uh, this user, whenever they try to log into their computer, they simply just get this message. It says domain not available. And there are a couple of different reasons for this to happen. And the first one is the computer simply needs to be joined the D domain that it belongs to. So that way it doesn't get this error. And the second uh, reason for it is that computer is simply not connected to the network of any sort, you know, physically. Um, if it's a computer that is like work from home type of computer where it simply needs a network or internet connection, chances are this would not happen, although it may. I've seen that happen as well. But generally speaking, when it's work from home, uh, this would not necessarily happen. Uh, but the, the reason you would, the second reason you would get this is when you're not physically connected to the network that the computer belongs to uh, when it comes to the domain itself. Okay, now I digress. Let me tell you what domain is. There are a couple of different domains, right? There is a first domain that you can think of, right? Here's, for example, cosmicnova.com. That's one example of a domain. 
CosmicNova.com is literally name of the domain. It's also known as the website, right? So that's that. However, it's different from a business environment. Business environment has its own domain, which all the computers on that network are joined to specifically. And that is found on their computer properties. So this is just one way of getting to it. It doesn't matter which way you get to it as long as you get to it. But if you right-click this PC, for example, or just go to system settings, you can just type in system settings or something like that, and it will get to this point. And the, the part where you want to look at is here, where it says computer name, domain, and work group settings. This computer is on a local home network, and it's joined this work group here, where it says new server zero. In a business environment, it would literally say domain here instead of work group, and it would give you the name of the domain which looks like this here. This computer here, so this computer here, if we look at the same settings, you can see that it literally says here domain instead of work group, and it gives you the name of the domain. You, have, you see how it says here tech support dot dot com. It's kind of similar to what we saw as a website, for example, cosmicnova.com that I showed you, but it's different. This is just for the business. That's the name of the business. And that's what is going on with this ticket. Again, let me show you here comparison real quick. This is what my local computer looks like. You see it says work group instead of domain. But then this one here, here it says domain. So if the issue here is, I'm just going to minimize this here. If the issue here is that this user's computer needs to be added to the domain, this is how you would do it. You would go back to system and you would go to advanced system settings and then under computer name here the very first tab you will get an option to change computer name and then if you look down here where it says to rename this computer or change its domain or work group click change and then you would select literally change select domain and then type in what it was it tech support dot coboman dot com is that what we had here? I know we did. I just want to show you that it is in that. TechSupport.Coboman.com. Minimize this real quick. And then we're going to click OK. And after that, you have to reboot the computer. See? It's not going to do it now because this is a local computer and the other one is just a virtual machine. But you would get a notification that says, do you want to join this computer to this domain? If you do, Something like that. It's been a while since I actually manually had to do this. It's super rare. But I digress, it would say, it, you would have to reboot afterwards, and then it would be added, and it would here would say, it would say domain instead of work group, and it would be tech support .com. Now there is a, there are other reasons why this might happen. It could be just an error in the in the system itself, the operating system. But another reason also could be is that this computer is not physically connected to the network where the domain is located. So if it's like a business environment, let's say it's a large building and the computer gets this error, um, you know, it's either what I said before is that either it's not added to the domain or it doesn't exist on the domain or it's not physically connected. So you might want to check the cable. Just adding a quick note while editing this video. This can also happen whenever user receives a new computer and they don't log into it before taking it home, meaning that you have to be connected to the domain for your first login so it can create a domain-based login or local profile for that user. This is why this error happens. Otherwise, at home, they can just use their password and log in locally, even though it's not connected to the network or domain of any sort. Uh, th these are the only things I can think of right now when it comes to this error, and that is how I would deal with this specific issue. So, if this user is at an office, I would physically go there and um, you know make sure that the computer is you know plugged in if 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 it's if it's a guy that's literally within the same building i know some people do tech support or you know desktop support or whatever in a building where there's like i don't know 100 users 200 500 doesn't matter they can physically go to their computer and check all these settings make sure they are added i can't think of any other way to do this instead of having physical access because you can't log in so you can't really take 
uh, control remotely if this is somebody who's working from home, for example. And this really shouldn't be happening when somebody's working from home. And the reason I'm uh, mentioning working from home is because obviously a lot of people are going to working from home, especially in the current situation. But I've seen it happen a couple of times, and for each one of those times, user had to bring the computer back uh, to the office or you know location where you can actually make these changes. The reason being is so you can physically connect it to the network, so that way you can re-add it in there um, using a local admin. So, by the way, in order to make those changes where, where that I showed you in there, when you go to advanced settings to add the computer, uh, in this case, you might have to do it using local administrator privileges. And uh, it, depending on the business setup, business environment, you may be able to because here's what happened in order to for you to do it remotely to add the computer back to the domain which still may not work properly because they're working from home but let's say you are somehow doing it you would have to get local admin uh, login so that you can actually log into the computer to begin with and then make the changes here right you'd go in and make the changes otherwise you have no other way of doing it and you would have to literally have the user type in all the information and you would literally have to guide them to do it and you know whether your company allows this type of thing realistically it's best to just have them bring it to the tech guy at their office and just have him deal with it but hey every company has different rules maybe you are allowed to do this maybe you are allowed to share this information uh, local admin uh, password uh, with with the <laughs> with the user i don't know uh, but this is how you would go about resolving this. Okay, so I'm just going to reply to him and say, uh, well, first of all, I would talk to him. I would talk to him on the phone and uh, make sure that this indeed is the error and that he can't log in any other way. And uh, I'm just going to say, in this case, just to be safe, okay, uh, can you please bring back the computer to the office so we can fix it and you can provide details typically on a ticket when you're adding um, internal notes or any notes you want to be specific uh, in this case I don't necessarily want to be specific if I'm just talking to them but since I'm talking to them on the phone I highly suggest that you do talk to them on the phone uh, if you can't you know if it's again if it's not at the local office make sure that uh, they're already aware why you want men, why you want them to bring it back. At, at least give them that. Doesn't matter whether I understand it or not. Uh, this just tell them this is what you have to do, and this is how we can fix it. You know, and then I'm just gonna say computer needs to be added to domain. And again, this is all with the assumption that I'm talking to the customer. I already talked to them and ensured them uh, that this is going to get fixed. And how I'm going to go about it. So I'm just putting down basic information. And instead of just, you know, this is just a formality at this point. Okay. So we're going to wait for the customer to um, come back. By the way, I forgot to assign this ticket to myself. I've really got into it. It's been a while since I, I made some of these help desk ticket-based videos. So yeah, make sure you assign the you know, ticket to yourself. And uh, we're going to get back to it and possibly route it to the local IT tech support people, depending on how your computer or, or how your tech support is set up. You may have to route this ticket to them, but in this case, he's just going to bring it to me, and I'm going to just resolve it. All right. Next ticket, it's thanks to uh, feedback from this gentleman on Discord. Uh, let me show you here. Well, first of all, let's uh, let's read the ticket. It's the ticket that I created based off of uh, his feedback and idea. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, is I forgot to change my password and now I can't log in. And it's kind of specific here in description. It says, "Hi, I forgot to change my password last Friday, and over the weekend my password expired. I can't log in to change." So it's kind of specific to the way why he can't log in. It says, I forgot to change my password last Friday, and over the weekend my password expired, and I can't log in to change it. Usually, usually customers or users would get notifications on 
when the password is about to expire. And I've also seen where, you know, user either forgets or just kind of ignores it because sometimes you just get one notification. I've seen that too. It's only one notification like 14 days before it expires or something like that. Uh, and uh, and that would be pretty much it and then they forget about it. But the reason I made this specific ticket is in a scenario that this gentleman on Discord described to me. Again, I appreciate your help and here it is what he says. Mr. RTM, thank you. And it says, if I catch a help desk call and user wanting to reset their password, uh, I'm sorry, if I catch a help desk call and a user wanting to reset their password uh, to easily guess passwords such as password or password123, I advise them that their desired password is not very secure to coach them and how to make the password more without driving them crazy or resort to writing it down somewhere. So he's giving an example of how he's handling um, password resets whenever he uh, works basically a help desk uh, call. Or I'm assuming, at, from what I gathered, he works at a location where he probably takes turn, and he can correct me if I'm wrong here, he probably takes turn on basically on answering a help desk call that probably comes through their central line for the tech support guys at, at the, locally probably there. And then he says, off-site users do not get system notifications of when their password will expire. You see, this is something I kind of touched on. I've seen it, usually Windows will just say your password, and you get a pop-up notification, and it kind of goes away to the side, and a lot of people don't see it. But in this case, they don't get any notifications, which is something wrong with the system. To help with this, I let them know when the new password will expire, expire, and we built expiration date into the new password. Uh, so he has to let them know. Uh, but see, I'm not sure if he means that he set the system to do this, but I don't, I don't think so, because uh, from when I talked to him l l further down, it didn't, didn't seem to be the case. And then it says here, for example, if the new password expire on 12.16, we might use something like this password without quotation marks. So he's given me a really good example of a short but a secure password. This is a really good uh, password. It has a combination of, with the asterisk as a symbol, and then combination of uh, numbers. And then it says, I tell them with, I tell them about one of the passwords checking, checking sites, and on one of the sites, the password check results are that that would be take computer 23 years. Okay, so he's basically giving an example of, hey, this is a secure password. It's really simple to remember. But if you want to test your password on how long it would take to crack, you know, he's basically uh, saying that uh, to the user that the password is very secure. They don't necessarily have to worry about it. And uh, it says our password lasts 90 days, which is normal before the account gets disabled. So the new password is strong enough and it's not... Uh, so complex that they would struggle with it. The password also checks all the requirements for the password complexity. So, yeah, this is a really good password. Um, the, what I find interesting about this is that he is given him permanent passwords. Typically, in a business environment, uh, what you want to do is give him a temporary password. It, it, again, it, this, this highly depends on the environment on what business prefers. Uh, but when it comes to security, you you realistically, you realistically want to give them a temporary password in Active Directory. So if we go to Active Directory here again, and uh, again, I'm sorry. Well, again, well, yeah, again, because I made a lot more videos about Active Directory. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's again. And uh, it's just kind of finicky here. I had to send them. Send that alt control delete so I can get to the login part of it. Anyway, so when you typically go in and let's find Mike Moser here. Mike Moser. And you know, somebody says my password is expired. You would just basically change their password and give them a temporary password. 
meaning that whatever I type in here for the new password, I confirm password, and then leave this checked, which is checked by default, it says user must change password and next log on, it's a temporary password. So whenever they log in, they will create their own, hopefully in a perfect world, a secure password like this gentleman suggested. But since in his uh, situation, in his business, the notifications for the password expiration have been expired and probably for some other reasons too, uh, probably because they can't log in. Uh, he has to give them a permanent. This is, I'm assuming these are remote. Well, he, it is, say, off-site users. These are all remote users. So they can't uh, type in the new temporary password in at all uh, because their current computer will only take their old password. So chances are they can log into the computer but they can't uh, change their password at all. So the computer wouldn't even register because it's not connected to the VPN, all, uh, VPN at all, and it's not connected to the domain. It doesn't have access to the, to, to the business network. I'm sorry, one more note. Man, this goes to show that there are so many things that can go wrong that to think about when it comes to resolving these type of issues. But another reason person cannot log in to VPN to change their password is because when your password expires, your account is locked. So your VPN will not allow you to log in at all. This is why he is giving them permanent passwords, which enables their account once more. So he doesn't realize that the password has been reset or changed at all. So he has to give him a permanent password, which is something I've done and still do occasionally because this is the only way. And then later on, I offered him... Uh, an option to actually change their password again. Uh, but once they're connected to the VPN, then they can set it to whatever they want. So this is the setup that they have over there. And which is fine. This is how his business runs things, you know. However, technically speaking, it's a security risk to for him um, also to know the password for all the users, you know. And again, I mean, this is technically speaking, you know what I mean? If the user is fine with that, um, you know, that's fine. This is a very secure password. And if the business uh, gives 100% trust to the tech support guys there, that's perfectly fine too. Who am I to judge? But technically speaking, uh, it's more secure to uh, give them, for them to have their own password. I, I mean, you can argue this back and forth. Uh, I can see, uh, I, I can argue for both sides, either way, as you can tell. But, you know, in this case, this is what's uh, this is the situation for this gentleman, and then it says here users. And then I asked him uh, because I wanted to clarify: uh, Does this user not get password notification with VPN? And then, and then I realized that they were off-site, so chances are they wouldn't even get it. Uh, but because the, the the notifications are not working to begin with for some reason, so even before it expired, they didn't get it. But of course, if they're not on VPN at all. It's not going to, you know what I mean? It's what is there to send if there is no connection? What is there to send a notification if there is no connection? Just like you get notifications for YouTube or any other website, you have to have network connection. In, in that case, would be outside internet. So and it says here, users uh, used to get notifications at the login prompt, but that quit a few years ago and our company, uh, our company went to a password page uh, page off of our internet site. So, I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about here, but I suspect it's some kind of website where you can just use a single sign-on. There are some websites that are set up to be reached uh, just over the internet company website that you can use your domain login. And uh, like that, you can uh, access basically, you know, company resources without actually having a some company's resources, not necessarily the network itself, but through the website, which is kind of a proxy in this sense here, a proxy way of getting to something on the, uh, for the, on, on the company. Um, there is usually a website that's set up that you can access just using your credentials. A lot of times they're just SSO credentials, meaning single sign-on. The other issue we found was that the users get got confused in the Windows login and it was prompting for a change. So we pretty much advised them if they get a notification to get to go to the internet site for now. So yeah, it looks like they have some kind of a website set up for that to help them deal with these password issues 
and to check probably to check let them check uh, when their password is going to expire we are implementing a ping SSO system that should complete later this year um, and uh, but the awareness training of a secure password doesn't drive you crazy like sticks with them and, and crazy sticks with them um, so yeah so he basically goes around and trains and he mentions this uh, users that you can have a secure password without actually having it be too complicated and it says I actually teach this in a security awareness training in the new employee orientations so he's a really good guy he's going above and beyond when it comes to teaching passwords past security basically I also plan on taking a laptop um, on a rolling cart throughout the hospital and spend a few hours just letting users come up and check their complexity of their current passwords so he also plans uh, to go around he you know th this is really cool actually I work uh, right now I'm working from home because of the whole situation but I also work in a building it's kind of a campus type of building with three built buildings connect together and that's pretty cool when you can actually you know grab a cart put your laptop on and just go around and just help people you know that's really cool and fun and then he's going to do that he's going to go around and have people check the complexity and I have a feeling that what he's talking about here is that he has a password uh, testing website that he they can go in and type in their password and it will take their it will test the complexity or security of their password which is pretty cool and um, and then he says if it's not very complex I show them how to improve and still be easy to remember yeah this is really cool I I really like his feedback and just different way on how he's dealing with things uh, when it comes to tech support it's very interesting and a bit different from the things uh, that are done the way things are done in in, in, the, in my particular business environment but nonetheless still valid in my opinion and then he goes to talk about we have outside clinics that are not part of a hospital or have remote access to our patient records and have stress uh, have stress password security for with everyone and I stress password security with everyone that's cool I like that and then their help desk um, is aware of this uh, probably practices the same type of thing and that was pretty much it I kind of uh, it tried to get more understanding of what's going on but then and and then why the basically issue wasn't addressed to begin with which in this case is the fact that they're not getting notifications for the password resets in his environment but it's something that he can't help a lot of times we are limited even if we want to help we are limited in a company that um that doesn't necessarily want you to mess with things that are and talk to them especially if they're a remote user and set up this password just like he did it I would give him a permanent password I, I made actually a video about this and which I dealt it with the same way um, it was a I think the video is called VPN password or something like that I highly suggest the uh, for you to actually watch this if you're interested in this specifically as I expand on that um, in that video as well and how you would uh, deal with that but yeah if you know if the password has expired and they can't change it I would do the same thing as this gentleman I would give them a, a permanent password and uh, offer them to uh, basically reset their password again so that they can get to change it again you know give him a temporary pass but this is after they log into the computer with the permanent password that I've given him just like that gentleman explained and then assuming that I'm talking to them on the phone I'm just gonna call this uh, I'm gonna give it an internal note for my boss I've reset users password and just call it that I'm not gonna leave anything else there because it's it's uh, redundant um, that's all I've done that's all there is to it if management is completely aware in these type of situations that uh, if you somebody's on a VPN and they can't change their password this is how you would do it you know there's no other way unless there's some kind of weird system setup and uh, yeah I mean that's all there is to it for this particular ticket 
We have a couple of tickets. We're going to work. But before we do that, please take one second out of your time to click the like button. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. The first one we're going to actually work is this one here where it says my printer is not working. Typically, you want to work tickets that are in order. For example, this one says ISD 34 and this one says ISD 35. But the reason I'm going to work the ISD 35 first is because it's in relation to suggestion or something that somebody from my Discord actually asked and I kind of made it into my own idea, I guess. All right, let's see who said this. So a couple of days ago, I asked for suggestions on my help desk training videos, basically ideas for tickets or issues that I can work on or talk about because I really need more ideas, guys. I have over 420 videos or something like that. So chances are I've covered majority of topics. So I'm always open for those. And please don't forget to let me know if you have any ideas or anything that you want me to talk about, whether it's in the comments section below this video or on discord if you want to join my discord there is a link in the description so the idea i got for the other one for the printer ticket is from mr rookie bob so bob said is there a way to tell if device device if device drivers are installed correctly short of a device manager and he said an old machine that i restalled uh, that i reinstalled and is network uh, wouldn't connect via Ethernet, and the device manager said the driver was up to date. Had to manually download from the site and install before it started working. So basically what's going on here, he's saying that uh, everything looked fine in the device manager uh, when it comes to the Ethernet adapter that he had installed. And let me show you how that looks like. So if I go to the device manager and a look at the device manager, and in this case, what was happening under the Ethernet. Uh, everything looked fine, but yet Ethernet did not work. By the way, thank you very much, Bob, uh, for uh, basically giving me that suggestion, which I kind of made into a printer issue. But I will talk about specifically what you mentioned. So he said network adapter looked fine. So in this case, for example, we have Intel R Ethernet connection adapter. And that's the physical one. The other ones here is for the virtual box and one for Hyper-V. So they're virtual adapters that are tunneled, uh, that tunnel to the Intel R Ethernet, which is the physical one. So what he's talking about, that it looked normal. Everything looked normal. There are no um, issues in device manager. What usually happens is when you have an error, uh, in, when, when driver didn't install properly or something doesn't install at all, in device manager, usually on the bottom here, there would be a list of things with exclamation marks on them. In his case, it looked fine, but it still didn't work. So if you look at it, the properties, uh, you know, everything looked fine. It says device started working properly, this and that. But it didn't start working until he actually went to the website for the specific hardware that he has and install that specific driver. And this can happen uh, when uh, Windows operating system installs generic drivers. And uh, it used to be worse before. And uh, you can see here, he mentioned it's an older machine. So chances are it's an older operating system as well. It has gotten better with Windows 10 with Windows 10 operating system uh, because of the whole plug and play thing gotten better. Although they started suggesting that I think in Windows XP times, maybe even earlier, maybe Windows 2000 or something like that. Basically uh, what I had to tell him is there's no way, there's no easy way to tell aside. There's no easy way to tell aside from assuming that the wrong driver is installed. So yeah, if it doesn't work and it looks normal in the device manager, then chances are you have to go and actually download or update that driver specifically for that specific piece of hardware, whether it's Ethernet adapter, a graphics card, sound card, or anything like that. And then I said, I've noticed Windows OS likes to install generic drivers that sometimes do not work, even though looks normal in device manager. So that goes back to me saying, or talking about generic drivers or basic drivers that they use. Uh, I guess generic would be more a technical term. And this usually uh, is especially true with older hardware, but it has gotten way better with Windows 10. Okay, now let's segue into this. So yeah, basically to just kind of wrap this up, you would update your driver or install this driver package specifically for your computer, for your computer model or this and that. Okay, now let's hit the printer 
ticket because it's kind of in relation to that. Again, make sure you assign to this to yourself when you're working these tickets. This is a Jira ticketing system. And if you want to know or learn how to use this ticketing system, I have a specific video on how to use a ticketing system. In this case, we are just troubleshooting things. This ticket says here, my printer is not working. And it says, I've installed, I've in, I'm trying to highlight it from the beginning. I've installed, whatever, I'm just going to highlight the whole thing. I've installed the printer this morning and there are no driver errors, but still not working. Please help me. Debbie. So Debbie says here she installed the printer and there are no driver errors. So just like we looked at it before, she would install it and let's go to... I almost went back to the device manager, but we actually need printers and scanners, which shows our printers that are installed. And this is how it looks like in Windows 10. It looks different, and there is a way to actually see them listed differently in older operating systems. But in this tutorial, we're actually just going to do it the way Windows 10 wants us to do it, right? So here we are, printers and scanners, and here's a printer that's installed here. So we're going to look at it as in like, okay, well, it looks fine. looks like it's installed. There are no exclamation marks, or I should say there are no errors. There are no big red X's or anything like that. It looks normal. And this is exactly what it's going on with a user's computer as well. She installed the printer and it looks fine. However, sometimes printers can also be set to use generic drivers. So let's look at how we can actually adjust this. So she, chances are, just installed the software package on her computer somehow or through the means of whatever the company allows and uh, it looks fine, but yet it's still not installed. This can happen with printers that are, for example, uh, printers that allow multiple drivers to be used. So including generic and the one specific to the printer itself. So a generic printer should work, printer driver should work, but then it also gives you an option to change it to the specific to that printer that you have. So I know this sounds confusing, but what happens is, for example, a large printer maker, what they would do uh, they would create a global print driver, for example, Xerox. And that global print driver will work, a uh, printer driver will work for a majority of the Xerox printers that are out there, or at least a group of them. Maybe not all of them, but at least a group of them. Aside from that, they have specific and different drivers, including drivers that support different functions of the printers, including secure print, meaning that you are, let's say you're working in an office, and there are hundreds of people working there and you decide to print something and everybody is printing on the same large Xerox printer, one of those big ones, big boxed ones that are like ten or $20,000 printers, but you have to walk across the entire office floor to get to it. And then, of course, if it's a secure document, it's like some kind of sensitive information, let's say a contract of some sort, you don't want everybody just to see it. So you set up secure print and then you, once you go there to the printer, you type in your code and you get your print out when you get there. Not, doesn't print out and then you go over there and searching through the, all the other printouts or maybe somebody takes it. You know what I mean? That's the point of having multiple drivers available uh, for specific, for, for printers, right? So you can choose between different ones. In this case, we're just going to look at the basic thing that we can with this Canon one. Again, this is a Canon MP250. It's just a basic, uh, fairly affordable printer that you can use at home. I don't have access, since I'm working from home at the moment, I don't have access to the large Xerox one to show you different uh, drivers that are available. But maybe if we're in luck, we're, we can find something here uh, that's similar. So you would usually go to something like Advanced and select a printer driver like so. You can see here that under printer properties, it gives me an option if available to select a different driver or even install a new one. In this case, it's grayed out, unfortunately, because this printer is literally has a specific printer. It, it's not a Xerox $20,000 printer, guys, you know what I mean? But at least I am able to show you where you can do so. So unlike example of the inter-ethernet adapter 
um, that uh, Bob, is it Bob? Yes, Bob, that Bob mentioned. Uh, in his case, he literally has to use a specific one, and the generic printer in that case, it looked like he was normal, but it wasn't. However, it, when it comes to printers, you can have and expect to see different printer drivers that you literally select. And it's very simple. Uh, once you install it, if it's not available there, you simply use this drop down and select the one that you know that might work. And sometimes you may have to actually experiment experiment with that. So uh, you know, make sure that you select the one and the select the one that is literally what customer wants. So if Debbie here wants to use a secure printer. Uh, features she may have to select a specific driver that allows for that if she Debbie wants to print in color she may have to use a specific driver for that very important to know when it comes to dealing with printer stuff like this okay so I guess I'm going to reply to her and you know what? In this case, I would actually call her and ask her all this information because it's, again, it's not very simple and I hope it's simple to understand. I hope it came across as simple to understand to you guys uh, because there really isn't necessarily a simple way of explaining it. But I would talk to her on the phone and ask her, Debbie, uh, what kind of printer, well, what are you going to use the printer for, basically? And then she would tell me and then based off of that, I would set up her printer drivers and then we would call it that. So I guess since I'm talking to her, I don't have to reply to her. So for that, I'm just going to add internal note and say configured printer as requested by user slash customer. Irvin. Save. And then I'm going to complete it. All right. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Please take one moment to like it. I appreciate it. I know I already said it, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. All right. Let's look at one more. And uh, that should make a for a nice, nice uh, session, nice training session for us, guys. Here we are again. If you watch my other videos, we have again Mike Moser. Mike Moser's got a lot of problems with his computers. He's always <laughs> opening tickets. Anyways, here we go. I am getting computer errors and PC reboots. And it says, this morning I am unable to use programs and computer restarts. I had to reboot four times. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And it says, I work from home, so please call me. So in this case, I would call Mike. And of course, just a touch on this, Debbie, I would ask Debbie if, if she was like on instant messenger, I would ask her, hey, can I call you? You know, but you know, in this case, Mike specifically said that I can just call him. So I'm going to call Mike. So I'm going to call Mike and ask him exactly what is going on. So chances are that everything is okay. He says here, I had to uh, reboot four times. So chances are that everything is okay at this time. But of course, we would double check this with customer slash user. But the fact that he's working from home and that he had to reboot four times, and then he said that I am, he says I am unable to use programs and computer restarts. To me, right away, my intuition, my experience tells me that one, uh, he's unable to use programs uh, because chances are maybe he not connected to the VPN first and then he's trying to open these programs that require external connection or external access um, from his from his home from his home connection and then we got computer restart so maybe he is turning off his computer whenever he's done using it so it's not able to uh, install updates or anything like that so I would make sure that he indeed is keeping the computer turned on while after he uses it because updates come overnight usually and then i would see which programs are unable to connect and if he's telling me that he is trying to use these programs before he connects to vpn then chances are he's not doing it right so this may be a training issue of course get on the computer and see if there are any issues. But chances are, if he says everything is fine, then what can you do? I specifically created this ticket um, so that way I can show you an example of 
something that you have to do as PC support, and that is training. Sometimes you have to train people on how to use computers properly. So what I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm talking to the customer, but I'm just going to type here what I'm going to tell him. I'm going to say, okay, good morning. And then I'm going to ask him, do you turn off your computer at the end of shift or meaning at the end of day, learn once he's done working, or do you keep it on? And then if he says, I turn it off or shut down, then I would say, please, scroll up a little bit, please ensure, please, I'm going to say this, I'm going to be nice, because I don't want to be, you know, I don't know who Mike is, if Mike is a manager, I don't want to talk to him like he's lesser than me, so if I say please ensure that, then he may not take this as in like, he may not actually do it, you know what I mean, uh, please leave computer on after work so that it can get updates. Uh, this will minimize reboots. Let's say restarts because he said restarts. And will allow for faster login. Okay, so especially true when you're working from home, you want to make sure that user knows that it's best to leave the computer on. And if they're like, well, yeah, it's using too much power and this and that, I'm just going to say, well, it actually uses very little power when it's not being used. And we're going to say that as well. But But the point is, we want to make sure that the computer gets all of its updates first. So if he rebooted four times, chances are that at least two of those times, or let's say at least one or two times, that the computer was just wanting to reboot, no matter what, he, whether he did it manually or not, whether he rebooted on his own to resolve issues or anything like that, it doesn't matter. We want to make sure that the computer reboots during after business hours when he's not using it. And then if he says, well, when I rebooted, it, it took forever and this, that. Well, that's because maybe it was getting updates, you know. Or the computer is slow, but chances are it was just getting updates. And then I would also say, uh, just to make him feel better off, because, you know, some people are, um, for the lack of better words, anal. They really want to do things their own way because this or that. They, and if, if some people think that the computer is using a lot of electricity, they may not want to keep the computer, you know, turned on when they're not using it. And I'm going to say, computer uses very little power when not in use. It, it's kind of wordy what I said there, but it gets the point across. And then I'm going to say, it uses around 8 watts compared to a light bulb, uh, which is around 60 Ws. So this kind of puts them at ease. They leave the computer on because 8 watts is just very, very little, and I compare it to something they can understand, because people, a lot of people don't understand what watts are, what are watts, and what is that, you know, but if I compare it to a light bulb, a standard light bulb, um, they're going to say, well, 8 watts is really nothing, which is completely true, I actually have a power a meter that's plugged into my wall, and my custom-made computer has a lot more stuff than uh, these, uh, you know, computers that are from company, like these basic small form factor computers, uh, it still only used around 8 to 10 watts on just idle, you know, with with 
monitor turned off. Monitor itself can use some power as well. Okay. And then I'm going to say, so let's assume Mike said, okay, no problem. You know what I mean? And then I can say to kind of minimize what he was talking about here where it says, I am unable to use programs. Chances are that, uh, you know, he didn't log into VPN first and then things happened or things didn't work. So I'm going to say a good a good way to ensure programs work properly when working from home is to is to log in in this order so i'm going to give him a basic instructions on the safe way to log in when working from home. So I would say log in to VPN first, then your IP phone, because you know he's working from home, so chances are he's using IP phone, and then everything else. This will ensure, uh, well, it's, I don't want to say safe, but I'm going to say, you know, let's, let's make it a little fancy, pro, active, uh, blah, 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 let's see, <laughs> this will ensure proactive workday, how is that, a proactive, this will ensure a proactive workday. So that should help and give basic instructions because we always want to log into VPN first. Everything else that requires connections like an IP phone or anything else uh, will depend heavily on VPN being logged in first. Because chances are when people log into a computer, they start to log into everything at once. Companies even have like automatic, have software that automatically logs you into like 20 different systems. And sometimes that stuff even starts to execute upon login to computer because it's set up to do so while you're at the office, while you're physically connected to the network, and it can do that. You know, you would imagine you log into your computer, you know, you lock your computer, you log into it, and then suddenly things start to execute. <laughs> That's the automatic login system that they have in place. And when you're on VPN, none of that stuff is going to work. Or, I'm sorry, when you're working from home, none of that stuff is going to work. You have to get on VPN first, and then it's going to work. So, you know, it, it's kind of a touchy type of thing that you have to kind of be nice about when it comes to explaining. Otherwise, Mike is going to come back to me and say, things are not working again the next day. So we have to make sure that that's minimized and that that's not happening. But if we provide training, especially if it's somebody let's say Mike already had an issue yesterday and then you already helped them and here is Mike contacting you again. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, that, you know, he knows how to do things properly so that he can minimize issues that are happening there. All right, guys, if you got one second, please click the like button and if possible, share the video as well. I really appreciate it. It really means a lot to me. All right, let's get right into it. And we're going to work the first sticky here that says can't, cannot add a printer and it just says error dot 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 and this issue is coming from our friend Mike Moser if you're familiar with my video series you know that Mike Moser has a lot of computer issues so we're going to work that work his uh, take it again uh, and he says here when I tried to add a printer I get attached error so let's see what this error is and here we go it's a big error it says windows can't open add the printer the local print spooler service is not running please restart the spooler or restart the machine so i know that a lot of you who are watching this who already know a lot of things about help desk you probably learn about print spooler service what that means usually is that you can't add a printer because the service has been stopped and yes, you can simply enable the service. But why does this error come up to begin with? 
The reason for it usually is if a company decides to put restrictions on using the printer or adding the printer to certain users, to certain groups within the company. The reason for that is security. They don't want you to just necessarily add a printer and start to print secure stuff that belongs to the company. For example, account numbers, uh, personal information, all of that stuff is a security risk unless you have a type of job within that company that requires you to do this. So printing is usually very restricted in a lot of organizations and this is the error that you would get when you try to add a printer. So let's see what that looks like. Devices printers and scanners devices man they have so many different ways of getting to this point within windows 10 before it used to be simple you just go to add a new device or something like that so here is our printers and scanners in windows 10 so if we click add a printer and um, it's gonna what it does right now it just kind of looks for a available printer that's available on the network or locally if there is nothing there and if you're installing it for the first time, chances are nothing will come up. You may get a list of network printers that are available, but the chances are it may not be something that's right next to you. So let's say you work for a company that has, you know, two large buildings. Let's say it's just one building and there are three different floors and all of those floors have all together have 10 different printers. You will get a list of 10 different printers. And if they're not labeled correctly, you won't necessarily be able to add a correct printer. You don't want to add a printer when you work on first floor, uh, but you add a printer that's on a third floor. You know, it doesn't make sense. So what usually happens, and this time nothing came up because there, there are no network printers added or visible, at least. Uh, we have to click uh, the printer that I wasn't that I want isn't listed. And this is what happens. Otherwise, you would get a classic Windows uh, pop-up where it lets you add a printer and this is what Mike is getting Windows can't open add printer so we know it's the print services or print spooler service that is not running so we know that we have to go in and enable it and that's perfectly fine but there is something that I really want you to keep in mind there are two different types of services if you go to your task manager the very last tab is services, right? These are the services. But there is another section here where it says open services. And this one is different from the services in Task Manager. It's completely different. So you're wondering, well, why? What do you mean? They're both named services. What's the difference? First difference that you visually see is you can see that there are things listed on the left side here and that are not listed on the right side and vice versa. For example, on the task manager services, you can see there is AARSVC and it's agent activation runtime. And you can see that as a first thing that comes up here, it's not that, it's ActiveX installer and it's completely different. And you can see that I have it sorted by name, so that way you can see it here in an alphabetical order. So what's the difference here? So if I go into the services of the task manager, and I just look for a print spooler, right? It's called print spooler. It's not there. But why is that? Look at this. If I, there's print workflow, there's another print workflow, and there are no other print things. You can see clearly that we are sorted alphabetically and there's no way we we are missing um, when it comes to uh, there's no way that, that we're not finding it in here uh, unless it's just completely gone however if we go to this other services which is is the system services and we just type in print spooler it comes up right away and then again if you compare here you can see that there are missing things there it's not it's not there. But why is that? Well, the task manager print services is print services specifically for the user that's logged into this computer. It's not system services at all. And these services do not require administrator privileges for you to start them or stop them or do whatever you want with them. This is all for the user that specifically log into this not the administrator services. 
the administrator services is this one here and that's the one you want to activate the print spooler system and then of course you can just simply right click it and start it you see how i was explaining to you uh this in a specific way to make sure that you don't waste your time looking for certain things or for example in this case services in the wrong place we have two different things completely two different things that are named exactly the same thing that's very confusing in in my in in my point of view especially for somebody who is new to computers so keep that in mind all of this stuff that's in task manager it's only for the user that's logged in currently that has the privileges to do so meaning people that don't have admin privileges you can do whatever you want but the system services you need to have administrative privileges to do anything with that all right so if we go in here and then we click the printer that i wasn't listed you will get normal pop-up where you can any printer whether it's tcp ip local or this and that but the error was specific to service being stopped like this not necessarily disabled so in an environment where they really want you to uh, make sure they when they really want to make sure that the user is not allowed to print period unless specifically given the right to do so or for example it goes to higher ups and they say you can it's going to be like this it's no it won't be just stopped in this case we can just start it because we don't know why it stopped to begin with so we can just simply start it no big deal right but in a business environment where it's disabled you will go to properties for the print spooler like this and it will be like this it will be disabled permanently it will not be able to start up on on windows startup at all it would just simply be disabled and they wouldn't be able to get anywhere with that and for that you have to be very careful whether you are allowed to um, enable or not in our case it was just stopped so all we did was just right click and start it and by the way you can start these services remotely let me show you something real quick if we open services and we can ask mike uh mike hey can you give me your computer name or your computer ip address we can open services on our computer on our own computer and select action connect to another computer type in mike's computer name and then click ok it's going to connect to it and then you will basically get a same pop-up like this and then you just go in and remotely start his service of course he can try to reboot and that might start it as well because keep in mind it's just stopped it's not disabled but if it's disabled he can reboot thousand times it's not going to do anything so now since we are uh, since we've uh, enabled his service, we can say, Hello, Mike. I have enabled printing on your computer. Please try again and let me know if any issues, Irvin. Okay, so we're gonna click save now he can try again he can he'll let us know if there are any issues and that should resolve it hopefully we hear back from him sometimes you don't want to necessarily leave it open-ended like this uh, if you know that this guy is really good at getting back to you on things that's fine but you can reach out to him and say hey can you try again right now and if he says it's okay then we can just go to add internal note printing now works fine and then we're going to close ticket afterwards but notice how i said enabled printing on your computer i'm not going to tell him hey i have enabled print spooler system on your computer users don't necessarily need to know any of this stuff unless they specifically ask because sometimes they're curious maybe know a little bit about computers so they want to know how how you did it you know uh, but otherwise you can just say i've enabled printing on your computer please try again and then we're going to mark it as completed. All right. We have one other ticket that we're going to work in our queue. And this one is says computer crashed. And it's very descriptive, actually. It says here, this morning, my computer crashed and I smell burning plastic. Uh-oh. And then it says, it appears to be working now, but not sure if this needs to be looked at. 
So I get this comment a lot, or a question, I should say, but it's a comment on my YouTube video, specifically this one here, where I was testing a bad power supply after burning smell and unexpected shutdown. And this is the reason why I created this ticket, because I got this idea. And also, I had somebody else on Discord uh, share their experience as well, and I'll show you some images of that. But I get this question on this specific video, and... Um, what happens is usually power supply, usually capacitor kind of blows or, you know, something overheats within the power supply. And that happens sometimes due to the uh, fact that power supply was overexerted, meaning that you, for example, added uh, more stuff to it, for example, a GPU or you overclocked your computer or something like that. And it just wasn't capable of handling that type of a draw, type of a wattage draw, and things start to blow. Another reason for that is that um, these capacitors, for example, this gentleman here shared his um, picture of his open uh, power supply. These capacitors in here uh, will basically, or not just the capacitors, but the everything, the electronics, over time when they're exposed to air and just environment, humidity, all of this stuff, they start to erode. Um, or corrode, I should say, not erode necessarily, corrode. Uh, and these capacitors can start to blow, which is the most common thing. Capacitors are kind of like batteries. They hold a charge in them. And if they can't hold charge properly uh, over time because of the corrosion or, or whatever else there might be a reason, uh, they will start to bulge and they would uh, start to leak. The example we are looking at here from this gentleman's... Um, or, these are perfectly fine capacitors. When well, you see the white stuff here, this goop, the goopy stuff, that's normal. That's just um, adhesive. It's glue that's used for capacitors. Capacitors. Uh, they use this glue around the capacitors and underneath them to prevent them from um, moving, uh, from expansion, from basically uh, disconnecting. Because, you know, they are... Uh, when you put something under that much, when you put something under the voltage and stuff like that, it tends to move, heat, and expand. They don't want. They want to make sure they don't disconnect from the circuit board. That's the way I understand it. I'm not um, electrical engineer in any ways, but I know some of the basic stuff. These are perfectly normal capacitors. You can see they're not bulging. What you usually see bulging is on top of the capacitor, and they would bulge out. They would also bulge down too, uh, but this it would bulge up and it would basically be like sort of like an X over here. And of course, if they start to leak, they would leak from the top. There would be a leak on the top, be like a, usually like a circle of it. Anyways, these are normal, normal capacitors. His issue was um, not power supply necessarily, but if you do get a power supply that that it smells from it smells like burning plastic look at the you can if you feel okay with this you can open it up and and see um see if there are any obvious issues but generally speaking if you smell something burning you want to usually replace the power supply in this case it's actually very interesting he had a wire that was actually burning up maybe it's some kind of a short or something that's just bad wiring it to me it looks like just bad wiring um, that was done here, some kind of a rigged thing that was burning and causing issues. And in the end, he just basically decided to see this is how he had it. He was wondering if he should just, you know, try to solder it or, or, or whatnot. Uh, but in the end, he just decided to get a, you know, replacement power supply, although it's cheap. I usually recommend the name brands. But in his case, this is what he can get. And I said in the end, well, might as well, it will be safer than trying to solder you some kind of electrical tape like this or anything like that. So going back to our take it, in this case, it's most likely just bad power supply. We would have it replaced. And then I'm going to reply to customer and say, if I am help desk, uh, but if I am desktop support locally or, you know, just a tech guy, I would look at it. And myself, I would, you know, take it and look at it and see if the power supply is bad and replace it. Otherwise, I would say, um, well, you know, I would talk to them, you know. It sounds like you have a bad power supply. Please 
take your computer to local PC tech to take a look. Now, I'm only saying this because I don't know the exact situation of this person. They might be working from home or right not. So, I, you know, I got to give them an option. Uh, but otherwise, I would look at it myself and replace it, replace the power supply. Or if it's under warranty, I would contact the vendor and have them come out and have, it, have them replace the power supply. You know, if it's a computer under warranty, uh, this is what usually happens. You just call them and they do it. You know, it's really easy to replace the power supply. Your computer may still work even if it blows up something. And that's the point of my video here is that what happens is the power supply that I'm testing here is actually, the, the, so it's the same thing that happened, but it actually still works. So I am testing it to check the voltage. And it's been two years since I made this, but I'm pretty sure I actually found that some of the voltage is not right on some of those pins. And that's exactly what happens. You still may have a working power supply, even if a capacitor goes bad or something like that, but you may be getting wrong voltage, uh, wrong voltage to the motherboard or any of your computer components, which can cause even more damage. So this is why it's better to might as well just go ahead and just get a replacement power supply, even if it's just something, you know, fairly cheap like this, no name. Um, you know, that's better than trying to risk it and cause more damage to your computer. All right, moving on. So, in this video, we have a couple of different issues. The first one is RDP sound issue, and then we have another ticket for a local admin account that is not working. By the way, if you have one second, please click the like button. That also makes a big difference for my video. Other people see this video because they can see that there is an interaction on the video itself. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so let's look at the first ticket we have here, and that's RDP sound issues. It says here, Hi, I use remote desktop to access my second PC, but audio coming from that computer is not working. So there are a couple of reasons why somebody would want to have a second PC and use a remote desktop. And the first one is... They literally have a second PC which has specific software, specific documents, specific files, this and that, and they have a second PC that they want to access, and the only way for them to do it, especially in a business type of environment, is using regular Microsoft built-in remote desktop. The other reason is that somebody literally has a second computer as part of their job to process um, certain files, maybe databases, or do certain processes that require extra CPU power, you know, this and that. You know, maybe there are other reasons as well, but those are just a couple of examples of somebody using a second PC and using it via remote desktop. So he's using remote desktop to access this second PC, but he can't hear any audio coming from that. So it's kind of like this. You see in this computer here where I'm basically recording this, you can see that the name of my computer here is Tech Support. This Tech Support computer is a remote desktop session. So if I play any audio on here, for example, I go to YouTube and I play a video, um, I'm not able to hear any audio. And that's his problem here. So we can fix that. So first thing we have to do is open up remote desktop session on user's computer, on his computers, on Mike's computer, we open up a remote desktop session, and then we click here, show options. We're going to expand options, and uh, we're going to go to the third tab where it says here, local resources, and the first thing that comes up is remote audio. So we're going to click on settings where it says here, configure remote audio settings. So this is exactly where we need to go, so we're going to click on settings. So this computer here is, uh, well, this remote desktop session is set up to play audio on this computer. So by default, it's set like this. If I was to use a remote desktop session on this computer to connect to a second computer over there, um, it will play audio from that computer on my computer, okay? I don't want this to sound too confusing, but let me just show you. So if I go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. It's going to, okay, 
my first time going to my own channel on this computer. Anyways, any audio that you see here right now is actually being played on the remote computer itself. That's exactly what his problem is. So in order to fix that, we have to make sure that its settings are set to this, play on this computer. Otherwise, we can't hear this voice at all, as you can saw. Right now, on my computer, which is here, where it says tech support, I'm using remote desktop. Right now, it's set to play audio on the other computer, which is this setting. So on the second PC, wherever it may be, this is what it's set like right now on my computer that I'm using right now. It's playing on remote computer right now. So to fix this, we have to make sure that it's set to play on this computer. It's set by default. And, uh, and, and that's fine. This is how we would fix that. But I also want to show you something else. So let me complete that ticket. And we're going to come back to this because I really want to talk about something here that's going to be also related to troubleshooting. Very important. And let's wrap this up. So we're just going to add internal note and say change remote desktop settings to play audio audio on a local computer okay and then we're gonna of course have them test it you know this and that that's fine this should be easy ticket and then we're going to close it of course of course don't forget to assign ticket to yourself as well very important so you can get credit before you close it and since we know mike mike moser we've worked with him many many times uh, we're going to just close it. We're going to let him know, hey, it should be fine now. So we're done with Mike. But I do want to go back to that remote desktop connection to show you something very, very important. So let me explain what I mean. If you get a ticket that a user cannot use their local headset, for example, they have a headset somewhere, their user is somewhere else, and you need to troubleshoot their headset sound issues, and you can't because... If you use remote desktop session, let's say you're limited to only using remote desktop session, it's going to look just like this. You remote into their computer, just like I am connected to this tech support computer right now, and it's going to look like this. It's just going to say remote audio. There is no headset to select. There is no audio to troubleshoot. Here, let me show you. If I go to sound settings here, it just says remote audio. There is nothing else. There is no headset to select. So you would assume that something is wrong, right? Well, that's, that's not right. The, the problem is, is actually this. You have to go to local resources before you connect to that computer. You have to go to local resources on your remote desktop session, click settings, and select play on remote computer, just like we had it previously. And then you go in, and then you type in user's computer name. You click connect, and then... And then we can make changes to the local. See, now it's looking looking like it's different. Uh, it made <laughs> it made different settings here. You see, now we can select speakers that are Realtek, which is the typical. Uh, you see how I got confused because I made the change right away. It took a little bit to configure, but yeah, now we can actually see that there is Realtek uh, definition audio. Same thing. If I go over there and plug in a headset you will see it come up as well. All right. So you probably saw you probably saw that I plugged it in. Now we can troubleshoot that headset on that remote computer. So you would just say to the user or ask them to plug in their headset if it's not showing up like that and then you'll be able to do it. Otherwise, if you don't change it to play on the local computer like I showed you, you won't be able to troubleshoot it and you will just assume that there is something wrong with the audio. You know, you have to make sure that it's set play on remote computer. You know, otherwise it's, you won't be able to troubleshoot it. So that's something to keep in mind if you only have remote desktop connection as the available resource of taking control of somebody's computer and troubleshooting these type of issues. All right. I hope that comes off as something that you can easily follow because it is kind of confused. This is how you have to kind of go about it. 
and to, to troubleshoot some of these weird issues that might come up. Okie dokie. All right, so let's look at this other ticket. It says, my local admin account is not working. And it specifically says here, hello, I have a local admin account to make changes on my PC, but it's not working. Thanks, Larry. So this guy was given specific local admin account to use for some reason. And of course, uh, don't ever... If you have if you have the ability, don't ever give somebody a local admin account password uh, because of the security reasons. You we have to you know double and triple check to make sure that this person is actually allowed. So we're going to go with that assumption. All right, let's assign the ticket to ourselves. We're going to work that. We're going to contact him and ask him, hey, what is the name of the local admin account that you're trying to use? So and then he tells you what the name is, and then we're going to search for it in on our computer. Now, this is not to be confused with the main admin accounts. Those are different. They will not be listed under local admin users. So we're going to just type in users here to get to the point where we can add or edit and see which users or which accounts are available there to begin with. This is just one way of looking at this. This shows you some administrator accounts. And the other way is if you go to the system settings or system properties, and then we look at advanced system settings, and then we click on user profiles, we're going to see all the accounts that are listed here. However, there is a big difference here, what we're looking at. We're looking at two very different things. And I want to kind of emphasize this. This is why I created this uh, fictitious ticket, is that what we're looking at here is local accounts that are on the computer. When it comes to this window here, this is where you would add them. These are all the actual account login information that's available on this computer. Now, what we're looking at here is actually user profiles that are stored. So this is location or this is how much space is taken up by creating a local profile on the C drive. This is not a this is not information for this person's for any of these accounts. This is just what's stored locally. And the thing is though although that describes this, if you were to click and delete this profile, it would delete it, everything that's in, stored on this computer, meaning all of these things are located on the C drive. So if you go to local users on the C drive, so C users, you can see that they are here. Here is the BUCO, which is the first one. Here is the Cobalman test account, which is this one. And here is the YT login, is this one. So if I click delete on any of these, which I can't delete this one. This one never shows up uh, if you're using it. Uh, it's kind of bizarre, but this one is actually on here as well. It's not showing up. I don't know if that's some kind of a feature of Windows, but this YT login actually does exist on this computer as well because I'm using it right now, but yet it's not listed, and I know it's an admin account. It doesn't matter. Getting back to the point of what I'm talking about here, if I select, for example, this one, BUCO, and then I select Delete, it will delete everything that's inside of this folder. So anything that's inside of here, desktop, documents, everything, everything will be deleted. Okay, now that we understand what that is, we're going to cancel out of this. I'm going to leave this window open here because we're going to get back to it. What we're going to do, what I actually wanted you to learn from this fictional ticket um, is what happens when you can create, when you create a local admin account or try to use another account on a computer um, to troubleshoot issues. For example, let's say you need to use an admin account to fix something or to run specific application. This is what happens when you do that. So what we're going to do here, we're going to create a local uh, Microsoft account and we're going to name it local admin not a very secure name but it doesn't matter because you know this is just for practice and it's forcing me to do all this stuff now okay so now we have another local admin we're going to change type to administrator 
So this is just the standard user. We're going to change it to administrator. Now we have a local uh, local account that's administrator account. However, if you go to the settings here in user profile, you can see that it's not there. There's nothing there. And then if we go to the root of C again, we know we have the local profile. We go to root of C, we go to users. It's not there. Well, why is that? Because I want you to know that this completely separates this account from the stored data on the computer in the sense that there is no local profile created, only a local admin account. So it's only local admin account until you log in to this computer for the first time or, or if you use, for example, your own local admin account, whether it's domain or local, it doesn't matter. Let's say you're troubleshooting something. Let's say you're troubleshooting something and you want to run, for example, this Google Chrome as administrator in order to troubleshoot some things. You can literally right-click this icon and click run as administrator and on a business restricted computer, um, you will get a pop-up to log in to use your local credentials. But since I'm already logged in as admin on their another account, it's not going to give me that. So what I'm going to do is hold shift, right-click this Google Chrome icon. So I'm holding shift key on the keyboard. And now we have an option to run it as different user. Otherwise, it doesn't show up. Run as different user doesn't show up. Here, let me show you. Right-click. It's just run as administrator. But if I shift, right-click, run as different user. So that's where we're going to select. I apologize, this is, this is just a glitch here. Run as different user. This is just a scaling issue with my, uh, with my monitor. But it's basically asking me here to put in my login credentials. So we're going to do, we're going to use this, local admin. So it's same thing, if you have a domain admin, you would type in the same login ID. So we're going to use your own local ID or your, your domain admin ID, I'm sorry. So, But in this case, we're going to use this one. So we're going to type in local admin. So if I tab over, it's actually in the password space. I'm sorry, you can't see it. It's because of the scaling on this 4K monitor and using remote desktop session specifically. So if I click OK, I've typed in local admin and the password below. You just can't see it. And I'm just going to click OK. And now it's going to run Chrome under that specific account, under that specific local administrator account. So this is useful if you're trying to update the computer and you need to use your own administrator login. So right now, this specific window and only this window is running under that local admin and separately from this other ticket window. It's run separately. To prove it to you, we're gonna go back to our folder and we can see now that there is a local admin <clears throat> profile created because we use that local admin to run as, as admin on this computer. So it actually, actually had to create settings folder inside of that, you can see. So this is how these things work. And let me show you this here. We don't need this here anymore. But I want to go back to here, user profiles. Now when we click on user profiles, we can see that local admin show up and it's right there. And you can see it's only 78 megabytes. That's very, very tiny. And usually when a user logs in for the first time into the computer, it's going to create a much larger local profile. But the reason this one here is only 78 megabytes is because it only created a basic sort of like a template information for this local admin profile on this computer just so we can run and store settings for Chrome. Okay? And then we're going to... Let me see if I can open it here. And we're going to... And here it is. You can see that there's some basic documents here and then there's app data. And then if we go to, for example, local... Google Chrome folder is there along with Microsoft. It's just the basic Microsoft stuff that comes with default um, default settings for the Microsoft operating system. But it has that Google Chrome that we just opened. You see that? And it says 98 megabytes. 
But that's because, you know, it, by the time we opened it up, Google Chrome itself had actually, you know, stored some data on its own, this and that. And uh, <laughs> so that's how that works. But the great thing about this, if you have somebody, a remote user, who's never logged in to a computer before, let's say somebody takes their computer home and they can't log into it for some reason, but you have remote desktop access to it, uh, you can uh, basically do the same thing to get it going. So uh, it, it's kind of a workaround, but uh, it, and it's kind of confusing, I know. But as long as you can get this local at local profile uh, created and get it going, that way when somebody locks their computer, they can literally type in the same thing and just get access to this without having to be connected to the network in order to log into this computer for the first time. Okay, that was quite a bit, and I hope this wasn't too confusing. Hopefully, it gives you an idea of what's going on with these profiles. And again, whether it's a local profile or domain profile, it's going to act the same way if you run it as admin or run as different user. But this is what happens in the background while you're doing all of this stuff. Okay, so I'm just going to reply to customer and say, hello, Larry. I've created a local admin profile named local admin. And the password is you know, XXXXX, whatever. This is not necessarily what you want to do because then everybody will see it. Matter of fact, I would just tell them what it is. But we're, I'm just going to pretend like we're doing this, which you shouldn't necessarily do at all because, you know, whoever looks at your ticket and God knows how many people, they'll know what the local admin uh, login ID is and password. So you might want to just, you know, tell him, or I don't know, whatever the, 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 the settings are or whatever the setup or requirements are for the company uh, when it comes to dealing with, you know, giving out passwords like this and login IDs as well. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Please take a moment to like, share, and leave a comment. Let me know if you have any ideas for future videos, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's video is all about tickets, 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 help desk tickets. We're going to work on some of the most common ones that come through the system. So if you're into help desk, by the end of this video, you will know how to work help desk pretty much. I mean, there are going to be some of the most common things that will come across, I promise you that. So it's going to be a longer video, this is why it's going to be a premiere video. So if you want to interact with me on the right side where the chat is, you can too. But if not, well, sorry to have missed you, but if you have comments or questions, feel free to leave them below as well. I'll gladly help you out with whatever you need. One thing to keep in mind, the way I teach IT is very particular, very proactive, and very easy to follow. This is what kind of separates me from other people, which is perfectly fine. People have different ways of teaching things, but the way I do it is in a very proactive way. Not only do I talk about on how to fix a computer problem, but also how to deal with the customer at the same time while you're doing so. So I hope you like that type of style. All right, that being said, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much, and let's get into this uh, awesome video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that there is a lot to do here. We have what looks to be 12 tickets that we're going to work in this entire session. So keep in mind, if you're watching this while it's premiering, while this video is premiering, I am in the chat box as well, so if you want to interact with me, ask me any questions while we are watching this video together, feel free to do so. I am available to answer any of the questions that you might have, or if you just want to say hi, that's perfectly fine too. I more than welcome that. I love to hear from you guys. Okay, so we have a lot of tickets, guys, and now we have to prioritize. Of course, we have to use common sense here, and we're going to go for the tickets that came in first. The way we can tell is by looking at the date and time, but we can also look at the uh, ticket number. So 
that being said we're going to select this one which is ISD 15 we're going to work that one first of course if you see a ticket that says big system outage make sure you prioritize that because it's affecting more people it's more it's going to impact more people so you make sure you prioritize that otherwise you just work tickets in the uh, order received all right first ticket we have here it's called PDF files don't open of course make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it so you can get credit for it the title of this one says PDF, PDF files do not open or don't open and in the description it says for some reason PDF files do not work so what do you guys think the issue is here I'm gonna allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer but I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this while you guys do that I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first first I'm going to introduce myself hello my name is Irvin with why I can't spell today with help desk support I have your ticket about PDF files not working can you please send me your computer name or IP address so when I reply to this customer and I click save here it's going to send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about and the reason for that is because in this situation we're going to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it but it's preferable if possible for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it if you have to that's fine of course this is going to depend on the company that you work for you know depends on the what the requirements are but chances are if you're help desk you're going to take control of their computer take a look at the problem and resolve it as quickly as possible so for that to happen for us to use remote desktop we're going to need their computer name or IP address both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely so in this case PDF files do not work so number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed so so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files a lot of times that's the main thing or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files but chances are this is what's happening second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing you may have Adobe installed on the computer but if if it's still not or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens that means we need to change the uh, file association we're going to change that right now now keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted in this case all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email however they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via, um, via you know via phone or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message uh, some you know most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system or they just want email reply whatever their preferences are make sure you file make sure you follow that to the T very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with in this case we send them an email and once we get a reply and let's say you're uh, since this is a fictional customer uh, let's say we do get a reply and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them maybe the customer said that the PC name is C-O-B-U-M-A-N-1 so what I'm going to do in that case I'm going to add an internal note for us um, as in tech support people to have on file so I'm going to say 
user's PC name is Cobbleman1. So I'm going to use that to access this Cobbleman1 PC and then see what's going on. All right, now let's look at that system. All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe. Adobe Reader shows up right there, so that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed, which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up File Association, which is also known as Default Apps in Windows. Um, there is also a file association different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down, and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension. So if, if we scroll down, it should be here. Here we go. O, and then we're coming. Uh, we're approaching P. So should be here shortly, PDF. There it is, PDF. We can now see that PDF, in this case, is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge. We simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader. There you go, problem solved. Uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser, which is fine too. You just ask them what they want. All right. All right, that ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note, changed file association. Sorry, guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly, but good thing we have that red underline thing. I can just right click, change file association to allow PDF to change file association to resolve PDF issues. That's fine. We know what we did. So if anybody else looks at that, whether it's your boss or, you know, somebody has to refer to it, to that ticket and see what you did, they'll know what you did. So issue resolved. We're going to close this ticket as such. So yeah, keep in mind, follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be talked to. Very important. Stay very professional when you're working tickets uh, for any company and always be polite. All right, moving on. So we're going to work on this number 16. We worked 15, so we're going to work this one. It says website is super slow. And then... In the description, it says every website I open is super slow. So what could that be, guys? Tell me if you're watching this in a uh, when it, in, if you're watching this while it's premiering. See, most of the time, when we think of websites running slow, we think of internet, right? We think of internet, and yeah, that's that's one of the most logical things we can you know, consider as causing the problem, which would be slow internet, right? But internet may not necessarily be slow. Maybe there's something going on on the computer that could be causing this. Again, this is one of those things we can uh, resolve. In my opinion, the best way to resolve it is to actually take a look at the system again. So we're going to go in here again to say, hello, my name is... Irving, we're contacting the customer again with tech support. I can help you with slow website issue. Can you please provide PC name or IP address so that I can take a look? We're going to do it like this, guys. So, as I said, the main thing to kind of consider as a website running slow, and in this case, 
every website is running slow. It's not just a specific website. So it's not an issue with just one website. It's all websites. Yes, internet could be running slow, and that could be the main reason. But there could be also something in the background that's taking up this uh, this uh, bandwidth for the internet, or not just the early internet. Because in this case, user or customer might be considering internet as in every website that they access, while a lot of websites might be internal. So, even even if it's just um, even if they say that every website is is running slow, that may not necessarily be the case. To that you might want to consider checking is that you could be just internal websites. So let's say they have five different websites that are only for them for that business. So that's the first thing I would check and ask as well uh, when I'm as as a follow up after I get their PSA name. Is it all website really? Or is it just the internal ones that you use most of the time? Because sometimes users don't know the difference between internet and intranet. While the uh, intranet is uh, being, you know, the internal websites. Anyways, there are other things that could be causing it. So if it's just a local network that's causing the issue, that's something to consider. So let's again pretend that we got a same PC name, Cobbleman1 is user's PC name. We got an internal note. And the way you put these notes in, it's going to be up to you. As long as you make sure that everything you do is listed in there uh, professionally and, and in, in, a, in, in a descriptive manner so that when somebody looks at it, they can tell exactly what you did. I know I keep repeating myself on these things, but it's very important, guys. So... We're going to pretend that that's the that's the PC name. Uh, it's simply because I I don't want to show everything on this main PC because this is your main PC that you're working with. So in this case, we're role playing. Okay, here we are at user's computer. Again, the same PC name that we're going to use. So I I made videos on this too before, but yeah, make sure that. You know, check and, and you know double check to see which websites are slow. If it's an internal network, um, if, if it's internal websites, then there's an issue with your network. You may have to contact the network team. That's another issue. But a lot of times, it's just the updates that are coming down for some reason. And it could be related to the fact that maybe user hasn't uh, turned, hasn't uh, left the computer on or didn't or turned the computer off when it's not being in use. So whenever they turn it on, it tries to install all these updates. And as you can see, there is an update here waiting to happen. And then of course, you can also open up their task manager and just look at their performance, see if there's anything taken up bandwidth. And here we are, just kind of looks like by default, we have selected ethernet um, adapter. And then we can see what kind of activity we have going on right now. Right now it looks to be, you know, just normal usage because I'm using RDP, remote desktop, so you will expect to see this type of usage, but nothing crazy. We know that this is not even one megabit per second speed. So, you know, this seems normal. And then you can test the websites, see what's going on, and to kind of go about it in that way, look at the processes, see if there's anything working in the background that's taking up a lot of CPU power. They can also make it seem like the websites are running slow. If the CPU utilization is really high, that could be the problem. If you see that, look at what is causing the, what is using the CPU bandwidth or CPU power in that case, and then um, resolve that issue in, in that manner. But, you know, again, internet is running slow. Check their bandwidth speed. You can do a bandwidth test to see what's going on. I don't want to do it right now because it will re reveal my current IP address, but you can go to Google and just type in bandwidth test. You can do a bandwidth test. If that looks sketchy, you can look into that. There are many other things uh, that, that can cause this, but the ones I've mentioned here are the main reason for this to happen. So just kind of look at these things, see if there is anything actually on the computer causing the problem. If everything looks fine on the on the computer itself like this, this is perfectly normal, that could mean that there is some kind of a network issue. In which case, I would 
possibly uh, I would possibly route this ticket to tier two, so that way they can reach out to the network people. So network team, they would reach out to the network team and say, eh, you know, there's something going on. But the chances are you would have multiple users reporting the same issue. That's, you know, but you can also look if you have a setup in the in, in the in the system for your company, there might be a place or just like a web page that keeps track of critical issues that are happening right now. You can check that page to see if there are any network issues, this and that. This is a really good start to get you going in the right direction to make sure that there's nothing going on with the computer first because that's your job. Your help desk, tier one, and maybe tier two, but this is your job to make sure there's nothing going on on the PC that could be causing the problem and move on from there. All right, in this case, we're going to role play and just assume that there are no issues. There are no issues at the moment. This also happens. Uh, you know, a lot of times where somebody reports slowdowns with the websites, but then there's some kind of a background process like updates or, you know, something in the background that required extra bandwidth or even CPU bandwidth. And it may seem like, you know, website issue, but it could, by the time you get to it, it might be just fine. So yeah, again, I can't stress this enough. Check all these things first before you put a note down like this at the moment. Um, and then... Depending on your environment, what I do, which I'm allowed to do at my current employer, I can say I will keep the ticket open for 24 hours to monitor. So I'm allowed to do this um, at my level. Uh, some help desk places, they don't want you to keep the tickets open at all, in which case you may have to close the ticket right away. So I'm going to leave this ticket open for the time being. I'm going to change its status to waiting for support. Waiting for support. Well, that's us. We can't do that. So I'm trying to think here. You know what? Since I don't want to see an appropriate status here. I'm just going to leave it in waiting for support. Uh, the, the ticketing system I use at my work has something a lot more specific things that you can actually select. But since we're limited with this current ticketing system for demonstration, I'm going to leave it waiting for support and just kind of keep track of it. It's assigned to me. I'm going to keep track of it. That's what matters. So we're going to move on from this ticket here. Okay. Let's see here. The next one is ISD 17 it says my documents are missing. All right, let's have a look. And again, we're going to make sure that it's assigned to us. Very important. And uh, it says here, my documents are missing. I found that my documents are missing. Very simple. So this person or this reporter is saying that their documents are missing. We're going to have to figure out which documents are they talking about. The customer Again, follow the instructions given to you by the customer on how they prefer to be contacted. I'm going to say, hello, this is Erwin with PC Support. I have your ticket about missing files. Can you please provide your PC name. So, I actually done a video on this already, and for that, I'm going to actually cut into that, so you guys can, it, it, it's the same deal as this, I just want to kind of use it, because it's going to be a very long video, as you guys already know, so I'm going to use my previously made video that's literally dealing with this same issue, so I'm going to just kind of plug it in there, and then we're going to continue after that but for now I'm just going to leave it at this and I'm going to close the ticket but yeah again I'm going to show you the video of, of something that I've done exactly like this so you guys can know how to deal with that so I'm going to close it completed and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket all right let's click on this ticket this ticket is called I am missing internet shortcuts folder and then if you look in the descriptions 
we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that, you know, it was deleted or just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin? Go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there, you know, this and that. And yeah, definitely do all of that stuff. But if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of, you know, let's say you can't find it. And then, but you can find a copy of, you can ask them, hey, does anybody else have a copy of it? Maybe I can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts. We can certainly do that. Again, we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further. But we're going to role play. And then first thing, of course, we're going to do a sign our ticket, assign a ticket to ourselves. And then we're going to reply to customer. Hello, this is Irvin with US, or you can say tech support, doesn't matter. You know, let's, let's do tech support. With tech support, or, you know, you can say help desk, you know, whatever your situation might be. Can you please provide your PC name so that I can restore your folder? Thank you. Thanks, you. <laughs> Thanks, Irvin. Okay. So now user has been asked, or you can call them, you can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user and we, you know we're going to get that pc name and in this case we're going to pretend that the same pc name is Cobbleman. so we're going to keep doing that the pc let's do this users pc name is Cobbleman one all right so kind of same thing and i'll i'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop, and then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that uh, actually let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called Internet Shortcuts, or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop. Okay, now let's go to his computer. Now we're at his computer, and we can say. Hey, can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back? And sure enough, there it is. I, uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets. Whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home. So they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just going to finish our my ticket here. You know, made a copy of internet folder to desktop. Whatever you want to put in there as long as it's in detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did. And I'm going to resolve this and mark it complete. Okay, now that we're done with that type of ticket, let's move on to this 18 here. It says, I need to have Oracle DB, Oracle Database, installed. On my computer, I'm going to assign it to myself, and we're going to work it. We're going to keep it going, guys. We're just going to keep it going. All right, it says, I need to have Oracle DB installed on my computer. And same thing repeated in the description. And it's this guy named Mike Moser. All right, Mike. So you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third-party software, and this guy, is, in this case, Oracle Database is a third-party software, no matter how you look at it, we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them. So what we're actually going to do, and preferably you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone. This is how I prefer it. You can do it any way you like. You can send an email 
a reply to them. You can send them an instant message and see uh, see if you can get more information. But what would you guys do? How would you guys handle this? You got to be very, very careful because we can't, we can't just install Oracle database on their computer without permission. So here's here are a couple of different things that could be happening here. Mike here, Mike Moser, he may already have a license to install Oracle DB. And he already maybe has requested it over requested it through proper channels. And maybe he just doesn't know how to install it and he already has all of this all of these permissions. So we're going to ask him this. We're going to start with this. Hello. You guessed it. My name is Irvin. You're going to be doing this a lot, except you're going to be using your own name, of course. <laughs> with PC support, I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB. Do you have, or let's just do this. There are many ways of doing this. Did you request a license for this software? Software? Or, and you know, we can send this, or depends how, how it is on your in your business, in your setup in your business. You can also say before I install this software, I have to check to see if it's on approved software list. So if you send a message to him like this, it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say, Hey, I already have it. I already have it. I just need it installed, meaning that I already have it approved. Of course, you have to check that real quick. And then sometimes you may have to install it manually. But also, he, Mike, might actually already have it installed. Might, might, might even have it installed already on his computer, in which case he may need help with configuration, which is not necessarily something that you as help desk uh, tier 1 would be able to do but if you're doing desktop support or tier 2 help desk you should be able to configure software in this case Oracle database uh, you may need like things like uh, database driver installed or something like that and I'll show you that as soon as I uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I you know kind of talk about this part of it but when it comes to help desk tier 1 you have to make sure, number one, that it's approved, and number two, that you install it for them, whatever that might be. You may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers, and you may help them, you may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software. Subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name and remember, we use Kobelman1 as a computer name a lot. That it has that computer, Kobelman1, subscribed to Oracle DB. So what in, in, in that case, it should automatically install itself. But it also, what he might mean is actually configuration. So I have to check that. But if when it comes to just simple installation, you should be able to handle this as help desk tier 1. Now let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle DB database I'm just gonna it's, it's a little bit slightly off topic but I do want to show you if when it comes to configuration this is done through administrative tools here on the computer itself and it's done here under one of these so let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver it would be somewhere in here and what happens is is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here you know for example in here you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there 
and then you configure it whatever the system that you want so you would just click add and then you would select which one you want to use and then you go in through the configuration set up the ports IP addresses uh, server names or whatever it needs to be so if you're not comfortable with that that's fine you don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it it just depends on the level and the requirements for the company again this is possibly help desk tier 2 definitely desktop support uh, person would actually deal with this okay I'm gonna go back to that system all right but in this case we're gonna assume that he just wanted it installed so we went ahead and installed it I'm gonna add internal node install well let's do this let's do this subscribe PC to Oracle DB means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed and then I'm going to do this installed software as requested okay and now we're going to close the ticket as complete all right easy peasy moving on to numero number 19 my computer is freezing twice a day oh that's an interesting one okay and my computer is freezing twice a day so this kind of related to our to our uh, websites are kind of running slow websites are running slow excuse me uh, take it in the sense that chances are that this is just Windows updates causing the problem so I believe I have a video on this I will show you uh, kind of a clip from that on how to check for issues like this where the computer is causing problems so I'm just gonna plug that in in here uh, and uh, because it talks about the exact same thing what you should uh, check in order to see why computer is running slow and why it's happening in this case twice a day so I'm gonna cut the clip into that then we're going to continue with our ticket number 20 in the meantime I'm just going to go ahead and close this ticket but then again don't worry I'll show you how to do this and how to check on this ticket and how to resolve it Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video, we take a look at a call handling for help desk tier one, in which case user has a slow computer. I will show you the call handling and I will show you what I did to resolve the issue as well. Friends, if you have a one second, please click the like button. I really appreciate it this way. I'm not going to bother you with any ads at this point. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get to it. I'm going to play the call and at certain times I will pause the call itself and show you what I'm doing on the back end in order to help this user. This was going to be a fun video guys. Let's get into it right away. Thank you for calling Help Desk Tier 1 Support. Uh, my name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hi, my computer is running really slow. Is there something that's just so slow today that I can't do anything? No matter what I do, everything, everything is really slow. Sure thing. Uh, what, what's going on? When did you start having this issue? It started happening this morning. It was fine yesterday and then today for some reason it's just very very sluggish. I can't do anything. I really need this uh, to be fixed so I can do my job. All right, no problem. I can have a look uh, to see what's going on. Can you give me your PC name? My PC name? Uh... Yeah, it should be it should be under your PC information, or even there might be a sticker uh, on your computer or something like that. That it'll be either combinations of numbers or letters. If you can give me that, please, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I think I see it here. Um, it says T M C three five six five eight three zero. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, sir, do you mind if I uh, take control over your computer just for a moment? I want to see what is going on and see if we can uh, uh, figure out what's causing this issue for you. Sure, go ahead. All right, let's pause the phone call just for a second here. So the user is talking about a slow computer. So it's a slow computer situation. So what is the major reason for a slow computer? In a business environment, 
most of the time when the computer is slow, it's because of an update. So let's get a look at the updates that we can look up here. And we're going to just type in updates and check for Windows updates. And sure enough, guys, we have some pending restarts for an update for a Windows 10 update. So what typically happens is that Windows tries to update or the computer itself tries to update overnight but for some reason it's not able to do so when the computer is not being used meaning that it tries to do this in after hours when the computer is not being used but chances are if the computer was turned off shut down asleep or any of those reasons it probably couldn't install these updates so now we got to get back to the user and let them know that this is what was the cause of this and explain to them what we can do to resolve this issue of course, if your company has a specific tool that pushes updates to your computer, you would also check that to see if anything failed, because it's not just Windows updates that could be causing this, but updates for other software, and chances are uh, there is a different way to control that within the company that you work for. You would, it would be company-specific, so you would have to check that as well. Other reasons for a slow computer is highly unlikely in a business environment. You know, for example, like not enough RAM, this and that. That that's not usually what happens in a business. That's something that home computers may have issues with. For a business type of computer, they're going to be up to spec, and the main reason for it to be in slow is updates. Of course, there is another reason, you know, being a virus, but getting a virus in a business environment is so unlikely, it's unbelievable. So, updates, main thing. Let's get back to the customer and tell them about that. All right, sir. So, what I found is that uh, you were, your computer was trying to get updates, but it's not able to. So at this time, we need to reboot your computer so you can finish uh, Windows updates. This typically happens whenever uh, your computer is either asleep and it can't get a chance to get its updates overnight. Usually, computers get updates overnight when people are not working during, um, you know, after hours where you know it's not a you know peak business hours or anything like that. So, but sometimes when the computer is asleep or turned off or if it's shut down, uh, it may not be able to get its updates. So what we got to do is just kind of wait for it to finish its updates. And I have a feeling once we reboot it should be done it'll probably be much faster but yeah that's what usually happens uh, that should resolve your issue so go ahead and reboot and if that uh, if that doesn't work then uh, we can help you further see if that works all right i'll give it a shot um all right i'll go ahead and reboot now and then see what happens all right great thank you so much for doing that i appreciate that Okay, looks like I'm uh, looks like I can log in now. All right, great. Go ahead and, and log in, and we'll see how it goes. Now, keep in mind, we just rebooted the computer, so it may be a little bit slow in the beginning, but it should be fine afterwards. Uh, you know, usually when we're rebooting the computer, it kind of clears the memory. So in that case, it may take a little bit just to log in, but afterwards, it should be fine. Okay. All right, I'm logged in. Great. All right. Let's see. See if see if uh, see if it's running any better for you here. All right. I'm checking. All right. So far, so good. Tell you what, it's definitely faster than it was uh, this morning. I don't. Okay. Yeah. It, it it seems to be fine now. So uh, let me see if I can pull up my email and uh, a couple of other systems that I use just to make sure before I let you go. Sure thing. No problem, sir. Take your time here. Okay. Okay. I I think I'm good now. Thank you so much. It it's uh I appreciate your help on this. Hey, no problem, sir. Again, you know, sometimes this just happens whenever a computer shut down. Uh, the best thing, the best advice I can give you uh is that whenever you're at the end of the day, whenever you're done using the computer, just go ahead and like reboot it or sign off. Because sometimes the computer wouldn't even update properly, even if you're signed into the computer for some reason. But the best thing to do is just to reboot the computer, and uh, that you know that should uh, kind of be a, a proactive thing we can do here to kind of prevent this type of thing from happening. All right, will do. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. All right, no problem. Have a good day. Thank you for calling uh, Tech Support. Bye bye. Well, there you have it, guys. That's how you handle this type of call. I hope you find this very useful. This is a real-world example, guys, so I hope you really do find this useful because this is exactly what's going to happen whenever you do start doing your help desk tier one tech support. 
All right, guys. So let's take a, a, a brief break. This is a good opportunity uh, for us to take a, uh, I suppose, couple of minute break. If you guys uh, want to, you know, run somewhere real quick and come back. Uh, if you're watching this as a premiere along with me. And uh, I hope you guys are liking this stuff so far. I believe it's very valuable because I'm showing you real life stuff that actually happens. I, uh, I've said this before and I know you guys that, that are watching me uh, on a regular know that I normally work as a business systems analyst. and But right now, in this current situation we're in, working from home, I'm mostly doing tier tier one, tier two, and tier three or whatever help desk, but tech support in general for whoever might need issues. So this is a real world experience. And um, if you like it, please click the like button and, and share this video with your friends if you have time. If you don't have time, for me, if you just click the like button, is also very, very, uh, uh, very helpful, and I really appreciate that so much. What do you guys think so far? If you if you're watching this in a premiere, uh, during the premiere of the video, please uh, say you know please you don't have to, but if if you want to say something in the chat, I more than welcome it. Otherwise, feel free to leave me a comment uh, in the comment sections um, below. And uh, if you check out my channel, there's going to be a lot more stuff. Not just how to teach you, not just teaching you the help desk uh, job, but also how to get these type of jobs. They could be help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, uh, project management, uh, I, I, there's so much. I think I have almost like 400 videos and they're all longer format similar to this. I do have hardware videos if you're into computer hardware and stuff like that. I do have those. Um, they're pretty popular as well. Okay, that's it for our break. Let's go ahead and continue and uh, just kind of power through these tickets, guys. We got to make sure we work these tickets. All right, moving on to... Uh, ISD 20 and this one says here I close my documents without saving oh boy you love to see these type of tickets because there is there is not a whole lot you can do with this the problem is you guys know this if you haven't saved something it chances are it's gone there are a few exceptions. Some programs automatically create a save file and it creates a copy of it, in which case you would go through and, and, and um, see if you can recover it like that. Another thing is, and these are things we have to think about before we even, before we even reach out to Mike, you know, before we even reach out to this user. We have to think like this proactively think very proactively because we're going to have to try to see if we can recover any of its any of this stuff the biggest issue here is that we're going to have to confirm this is that they close the document without saving and if there is no automatic save feature in that program there's nothing we can do however sometimes people will actually do the opposite. They would save the document and overwrite what's in there already. So I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe there is a backup of that same file somewhere that they can look at and compare and see which one is more valuable to them. Because this is a really awkward situation. you got to be very careful with this. So we're going to reply to customer because in reality, there's really not a whole lot we can do to help this customer unfortunately hello my name is Irvin with help desk let's do tier one like this and you guys can do um, whatever you like you know as long as it's appropriate I have your ticket about closing a document 
document without saving it. Did you happen to save it somewhere else? Or or did you just close the window? See, this is, you, you can't, I'm going to put a smiley face there. Because chances are we're going to have to tell him here that we can't help him. So sometimes it's okay to use these emoticons to kind of let prepare prepare the user that once you give him the bad news is that it's not your fault per se. So I'm going to send this. It would be different if they just deleted an entire document, which, you know, we, we touched on previously. And that there will be places where you can, you know, restore it, whether it's just from Windows Restore Point. Because what happens is when you create a re Windows Restore Point on a computer, it also creates copies. And if you set it up to do it regularly, it'll create copies and backups of every file that you've uh, created. And edit it at some point. So you can go back and pick an older one and you know this and that. But in this case, they literally just close the window as far as we can tell. So when they come back and say, Yes, I closed it without saving my work that I typed in all day, then we, we may have to say, unfortunately. We don't sorry about that guys. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to recover that file. Once you close the window like that it is gone forever not smiley face so and to make him feel better you can say however I can take a look at your PC to see if I can find a time-based backup, saved backup, but I am not 100% sure there is something there. So you got to give him something. You can word it any way you want. Just make sure you're very understanding and polite about this because chances are, again, that, that there's nothing you can do about this. So do all you can to help them out. See if you can find it. And if not, then, you know, it's just tough luck. You know, what can you say? Don't, don't tell this to the customer. Just be polite, but do the best you can and, to, to you know to help them out that's all you can do in this take it and then once once you do it you just close it I mean this is one of those situations you will come across that that happen that simply happen you know part of working help desk is to actually be in these awkward situations occasionally not all the time but occasionally all right guys let's move on number 21 here ISD Number 21, computer shuts down multiple times a day. Now, I'm going to have to refer this one to uh, being related to either, well, okay, L let me ask you guys, what do you guys think this might be? To give you a little moment to, or, you know, to give some people a chance to actually answer this if you're watching this as a premiere video. Uh, while you guys give me a reply, 
I'm going to assign it to myself and I'm going to reply to customer and I'm going to ask them hello well I'm gonna say who I am first with PC support when your computer shuts down does it give you any error or does screen simply go dark or 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 nothing happens you know what let's leave this this is way more descriptive and it's to a point so all right um, going to have to refer you to uh, my video here or part of the video where I talked about updates because this can happen when if it's just a regular update you get update and it wants to reboot multiple times this happens usually when computer has been turned off overnight and now it's getting updates that's number one reason number two reason bad hardware if they come back and say it it just goes dark you know screen goes black nothing happens it's just it shuts down multiple times then chances are that this is hardware issue in this case we would have to say this um, it sounds like it could be a hardware issue uh, we will need to perform a let's, let's be very descriptive hardware diagnostic on this computer so we're gonna have to say this and we're gonna have to run hardware diagnostic there are different ways of doing this on for example some computers I want to say HP's maybe some Dell's when you reboot the computer and when you hear the boop the boop <laughs> the beep when it's posting you can press for example I don't know F8 F9 F11 I forget exactly which key it is but it gives you to kind of a boot menu but it also gives you an ability to perform hardware diagnostic in this case if the computer just shuts down like this randomly no warning nothing it just goes dark it's a hardware issue to me there's no doubt about that there's nothing else that it could be but it could be overheating so the computer could be just dust dusty inside dirty maybe uh, what's his face needs to be uh, changed like the the uh, heat sink and um, the fan maybe they need to be taken off cleaned out the thermal paste that connects to the CPU needs to be changed and uh, yeah stuff like that when it comes to heat the second thing is that happens mostly and causes this shutdown is hard drive. Hard drive simply starts going bad and it just shuts, randomly shuts down. So it's either either one of those things at random. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you have to do some kind of a hardware diagnostic. And then that's going to depend on what kind of tools you have available to you as help desk. There might be something else you have to do when it comes to resolving this issue. These, this user may have to actually take their computer to a designated office or place where they would physically bring their laptop to. If this is a person that is working from home, for example. If they're not, if they're working in an office environment, their local IT support, um, their local IP support I, 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 IT, not IP, uh, information technology support or tech support will have to do a diagnostic and figure out what is going on with their hardware. Every office will have one of these guys, maybe not there, but maybe a guy that travels between locations that will deal with this. Chances are if it's hardware, if, it, if their computer is under warranty, maybe even a technician from, for example, HP, or Dell would uh, check on this and see what's going on when it comes to possible hardware issues 
So that's how I would go about it. There's really nothing for me to show you here uh, because you would literally just do a diagnostic. For example, you open up a menu and you select test hardware. If it's one of those type of diagnostic software or if it's pre-boot software or you can specifically tell it test hard drive, test RAM, test motherboard. It's as simple as that. And it will tell you if there are any issues with that. And you can also look at device manager and look at um, at there. This is what you could also do. I'm sorry, I'll have to actually tell you what to do. I'm going to go to the computer and um, and let's let's do this here. Let's do this here because I don't want to leave this one just without actually showing you something and not just you know I don't want to just explain it. I'm going to say this users PC name is Cobbleman one. All right, let's go to it. All right, here we are at Cobbleman One. We're going to go to the device manager. I'm sorry, we're going to go to event viewer. Uh, we can also do this in the event viewer. What we're actually looking for is Windows logs, Windows system logs, and we're going to look for errors that come up. And these are typical errors that show up when there's a hard drive going bad. So we're going to just, I'm going to find something here that kind of looks similar to it. I forget, I forget the exact, um, when, uh, the event ID, but it will be blatantly obvious to you when it comes up. See, this computer doesn't have any errors as far as I can tell. See, it will be related to something like this. You see, it says NTFS file system is healthy, no action is needed when there is something wrong there would be a red icon here that tells you that there are some issues going on here you can also go to a reliability monitor I talked about that in my previous video see here are some warnings here something like this but it will be red there it is errors here we go there are always errors guys see these are all talking about different things uh, some most of these are actually a normal but what you're looking for is a source, as in, and then look at the source here, and then look at the file system. Anyways, this is stuff you would be looking for specifically when it comes to file issues. See, this one doesn't have that. Um, obviously, there's nothing wrong with this PC when it comes to NTFS file system. But when it comes to source, this is what you would kind of look for and see if there are any errors coming up like that. And they'll be very descriptive, just like the, the one I showed you earlier here where it talks about NTFS file system. It would say there is an issue with, you know, some kind of NTFS uh, file system issue. So it's very... It's going to be very apparent. And then in the description, you can see, just like every time you click on something here, you can see the description of what's going on here. So this is what you're going to have to look for. And there will be a lot of them. If Trust me, if there are... If there's an issue with hard drive, there's going to be a lot of them here. And then you can just go to a reliability monitor. Reliability monitor. Ah, it's being stupid. Control panel. Reliability monitor is inside of... Where is our... I think it's security maintenance. And... Where is it? Security. Network. Man, I recently did. I'm getting tired, guys. This video is getting long. <laughs> I'm getting tired. I think it's probably been an hour. Maintenance. It's here somewhere. Reliability monitor. Here we go. Security and maintenance. View reliability history. There it is. Reliability monitor. So I was in the right place. I just didn't see this reliability uh, button. And you may have seen like, stuff like this. You see this hardware error right here, actually. You see that? There's a red X. And that's how it's going to look in the uh, event viewer as well. Hardware error. Let's see what this one talks about. See? There's an error, and it's going to be something similar to this. Anyways, guys, I don't want to beat the dead horse, as they say, on this, on this issue. So... What we're going to do is simply um, run the diagnostic or have somebody else at local level to actually do the hardware 
diagnostic. So I'm going to add internal note here and I'm going to say a routed issue to local PC support to trouble shoot hardware issues. <clears throat> save and I would route it from here but I don't see that option in this system unfortunately anyways I would route the ticket to, to the other uh, support people to troubleshoot it so in this case I'm just going to close it as completed so it, so it leaves the system but yeah make sure you route it to the proper people all right, so what's next? ISD 22, I believe, is the next one. And it says, USB drive not working. Let's have a look. <clears throat> okay. We're going to assign it to ourselves, of course. It says, USB drive not working. And it says, nothing happens with the USB stick inserted. And um, the way we're going to handle this is going to be based off whether uh, the business that uh, customers is working for allows for external media to be plugged in, uh, whether it's headsets or USB drives or any type of external storage. So that's going to be a factor here, um, most likely. So what do you guys think the issue is here? It says nothing happens when USB stick is when USB stick is inserted. So what do you think might be the case? I mean, maybe the USB drive is not working, but there might be something else. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's another one that we may have to handle in a particular way. And depending on the situation that we're actually dealing with, we know that it's a USB drive and that they're trying to insert it into the computer and nothing happens. So here's what's going on. Either the USB drive is not working, simply it's broken, or USB drive needs a driver, which is kind of unlikely because most of the USB drives uh, that I've encountered, it's simple plug and play. You guys seen this. You plug it in. Computer says, wait while we configure your drive. And then it configures it and then it asks you, what do you want to do now with this drive? How do you want it to open? And then you can tell it, okay, just open it up as a folder or something like that. Or a third thing where the company uh, or company that this user works for simply does not allow any external media to be plugged into USBs, meaning that the USB port is disabled. So it could be one of those things. And uh, if that's the case, there is nothing we can do about it. We can inform the customer that their company doesn't allow for USB sticks to be used. But the way I would say it, first, I would... Uh, if if it's a case, this is this is assuming that this is the case that it's not allowed for this company, uh, for for company. Um, if it's not allowed by the company to use USB uh, ports, this is what I would say. Hello, my name is Irvin with Tech Support. Unfortunately. Our company has USB ports disabled as part of company company security policy, which is perfectly fine. We can say that, uh, but you know. I have to assume that there are situations in which it is allowed. Let's say this is somebody high, somebody high up. For example, this is some kind of manager or director level, and for some reason it's okay for them 
to uh, have or to have access to USB ports and use anything that they want, then that will be different, you know. But in most large companies, it's set up to detect whether it's a USB port or uh, I should say whether it's not USB port, but whether it's a USB drive versus a USB headset or something like that. And in, in which case, it would know. You plug in a headset and it would just work. But still, once you plug in a USB drive, it would not work. So that's certainly possible. But sometimes you would also get a warning once you plug in a USB drive that says, hey, just so you know, we you can use a USB drive, but we're going to scan everything that's on it. And once you plug it in, it starts to scan that's everything that's on it, which is which is fair. You know, you're using a company's computer, and then you plug it in a USB drive. So that's simply that's what's going to happen. But in this case, we're going to say this to um, our user, and we're going to say if you need further assistance, please let me know, which I don't necessarily like to leave it open-ended like this because I'm going to close the ticket, but if we're trying to be nice about it and kind of trying to let them, let them down easy because it's not our fault, we already told them, we, you know, port is disabled as part of security policy. I wouldn't necessarily leave this open-ended like this because that implies that you possibly could help them if they say, well, can you enable it for me? Uh, but we're going to say this. But when it comes to USB ports, this is something controlled by security team. We want to put it on them because they're, they're the ones um, that, that are uh, placing these restrictions on the USB ports. We can assume, again, that they're okay and then we can go inside of their computer. You know, the typical thing we've been doing so far you know, ask them what their computer name is, and then we go inside of their computer, like so, and go to this PC and see what's what's inside of it, what's plugged in and what's not. So, and then if, if there is no USB drive visually that comes up, we can go to our device manager. Let's see, right-click the desktop, uh, the uh, Windows icon, go to device manager, then we're going to we can check for USB storage. We can see there is an unknown USB device there. So, and this could be what you know customer is talking about. This is could this could be what user is talking about. Nothing happens when they plug it in, and we can see that when it comes to visually seeing uh, what's going on, we can see that there is indeed nothing happens. But inside of the system, inside of the system, we can see that there is an issue. Windows has stopped this device because it has reported uh, a problem and it's a code 43. Now I know exactly what the problem is here and we can certainly fix it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to fix it as I'm talking to you right now. Um, this is actually on my next computer. So what I'm going to do is actually again, and I want you to pay attention to what happens here. I'm going to plug in because the USB thing stick that's actually plugged in over there is one of those that allows you to use different kinds of uh, storage uh, SD cards or s storage devices so you can put in like a SD card of certain size like a micro SD or whatnot so I'm going to take one of those and plug it in over here as I am talking and I hope you guys can hear me and I'm going to plug it in hopefully And I should something should be happening right now. And there it is. You see how it switched over? I actually plugged that storage device into this USB stick. And um, now it came up, as you can see here, as a USB drive right there. So, yeah, I mean, you basically go through the troubleshooting. And if I had to, yeah, I could have just gone in 
and just like updated this, you know, the uh, whatever it needs to be updated, the the uh, device um, uh, driver if needed be, and you know, just go basic through the basic troubleshooting of fixing the USB. But chances are really high that it's simply disabled by the computer, by the computer's uh, local security policy, by the company's policy. So keep that in mind. All right. So as you can see, guys, I am actually trying my best to uh, recreate the problem as much as I can. It's not easy uh, because I have to literally recreate the problem for each thing that we talk about here. But it's my pleasure. This is I, I really want to make sure that you guys can learn as much as possible when it comes to dealing with these actual issues that happen. All right, so I'm going to add internal note, and I'm going to say notified. I'm going to say notified user of company security policy in regards in regards to USB ports they are disabled by default we're going to say that it's not by default on the computer but by default when it comes to security policy for this company and I'm gonna close it like that and of course if you just ended up fixing the USB drive then that's what you're going to have to do, whether it's fixing it to show up like that or whether you need to go inside of the disk management and create a partition on it, format it to FAT32, this and that. You guys know how to do this. That's one of those things that uh, uh, should be self-explanatory. But the biggest issue here is whether it's allowed uh, to use a USB external storage. Because when you think about it, guys, imagine if you worked for some company and there's some sensitive data on the computer, and you take your own personal USB stick, you plug it in, and you just copy everything over. Of course, it's going to be um, a big no-no. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> we got four more to work. Remember, this one in the middle here is something that we're waiting on uh, when it comes to, uh, to see what's going on. And the next one is ISD23. I'm going to click on this here. It says, I can't hear people on my headset. And it says here specifically, people can hear me in meetings, but I can't hear them. So this is issue not with the microphone, but with their speaker on their headset specifically. So again, typical thing that, we're, that we kept doing, that we are doing so far. This is Irvin with help desk. I can help you with headset issue. May I take control of your computer to fix it? Or to resolve the issue, or whatever you want to, um, however you want to say it. If so, please send me your PC name or IP address. Now, something, something that I haven't mentioned before. Customer may need help with finding what their PC name is or IP address. Uh, I'm going to mention that real quickly here as I go and uh, as we go into the computer, into user's computer and check settings for their headset. But we're going to do this. User's PC name is Kobuman1. We're going to stick to that. Okay, so here we are inside of the user's computer, we know that he can't hear them. They can hear him. So it's not a mic issue. It's just a speaker issue. So it's very simple. You go in here, and if you click on the icon here 
of the audio icon next to the clock, you can simply make sure that it, that it is selected. In this case, we can see that speakers is selected Plantronics 610, which is good. If we right-click it, we can go to Sound Settings. Inside of Sound Settings, we have to make sure that the output is selected as speakers Plantronics 610. Uh, six, in this case, six, uh, C610, I'm sorry, and then that the input is indeed selected for the same headset. We can definitely double check that with the user to see if that's the correct one because they may have multiple things. What I like to do is go to actual sound control panel, which is right here, open it here, make sure there's nothing else installed. The way I check that is by right clicking in the blank space and click show disabled devices. There are no other devices on this computer enabled so that's good if there are uh, consider right clicking and disabling it like this so that way it doesn't conflict with the other one but of course make sure that the headset is enabled like this make sure that the microphone is enabled you see how there is another thing here we can ignore that because it's disabled check the microphone levels just to be sure if that's if everything else checks out here and you obviously saw that something else was selected as the output, which is the speakers, then you switch it to the headset and then it should work fine. If still not working, you may have to go inside of the app that they're using for, uh, for, their, uh, for, uh, for their meetings. So whether it's Zoom meeting, WebEx meeting, Google meeting, or Skype or whatever it is, go inside of that and check to make sure that the proper audio equipment is selected, in this case, Plantronics C160. So whatever their headset is, we're going to make sure that that's selected for input and output, microphone and speakers. Very, very self-explanatory. If you want to see a more detailed with an example, with a different example of actual software going inside a software and changing it, recently I made one about Zoom and I have one about WebEx as well. If you want to check that out, I do have that on my channel. But I don't want to go into that too much in this part of it because we are just working on the ticketing systems. So what we're going to do here, we're going to add internal note and say, I have configured the headset and tested. Make sure it's tested before you let the customer go. That's it. This is a very simple one, but very common one. We're going to close the ticket. Okay. Very simple one. Oldie but goodie. Oh, that doesn't make sense. I don't know why I said that. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, ISD 24. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Uh-oh. We all know what that means. We all know what that means. Let me know if you know what that means. I know what that means. <laughs> so, here we go. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Computer stops working randomly and shows me a blue screen with a smiley face. Blue screen with a smiley face. Let's see what that is, guys. Blue screen with smiley face. I'm just stalling here to give you guys uh, with with sad, smiley face, sad face, I guess. I'm stalling to give you guys a chance to tell me in the comments if you're watching this as a premiere to what the issue is. So, all right, I'm just going to play. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, guys. This is a blue screen of death blue screen of death so we're gonna go back and we're just gonna make sure uh, we're gonna talk to the customer what I would do is actually try to reach out to them um, kind of more uh, more personally in a sense that I would, well, would either probably call them and and uh, talk to them and to make sure that it is indeed a blue screen of death and I'm going to add internal note I'm gonna say talked to user and to confirm 
that the issue is blue screen of death. And then I'm going to recommend to user to recommend it to user. Sorry, guys, I'm getting tired. <laughs> so I'm misspelling quite a bit. To user to take computer for hardware. Diagnostic um, to her local PC support. So, again, similar to what we had earlier, where computer just shuts down randomly, nothing happens, and where we talked about sending user to local PC support that will check on their, on their hardware. They're going to do hardware diagnostic because that's what it is. A blue screen of death, I found that 90% of the time is hardware related. And a lot of times it's RAM or hard drive. It, it can be other things as well, but it, nonetheless, it's hardware. We're going to want to test the hardware. As help desk, we really can't do a really good job when it comes to you know handling this type of stuff because help desk is just like go, 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 go. Let's resolve these issues, you know, as quickly as possible. If we can't resolve it um, quickly, and in this case, we don't, we can't necessarily test your hardware properly unless we have specific tools given to us, uh, there's nothing else we can do but to tell them that uh, somebody at their local office will have to take it. Their, her local PC support is going to have to handle it or if the computer is under warranty, uh, their technician, HP technician, Dell technician, Lenovo technician will have to test it. She may have to take it to their store or whatever it is. It depends on how it is set up for the business that you're working for. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And then I'm going to say routed ticket to local PC support may not be the case. Maybe it, you know, if, if if we referred her to the vendor, then we we want to specify that whatever the case might whatever the case might be, it's definitely um, hardware issue, and we need to do a hardware diagnostic on it. Okay, moving on. I'm going to close this ticket. <clears throat> And go back. We got a couple of more to do. Next one is my email is not working. By Mr. Mike Moser again. Oh, okay. This is an interesting one. You will get this quite a bit. And um, if you guys want to guess, I'll pause briefly by talking about it. And you guys can get a chance to actually guess what the issue might be. This is the pop-up the user gets. But but first, uh, email's not working. I gotta assign it. Assign it to myself, so I can get credit for it. So that way I can get paid when my boss looks at looks at the statistics of how many tickets I've done. So it is my email is not working, and then it says Outlook is asking for my login and password. Why do you why do you guys think that happens? If you're watching this in my premiere video, why do you think this happens? So they open up Outlook and the first thing they see is this. You know, they see this pop up. This is what happens. And it looks to be I'm trying to open it here in a bigger there it is. And it looks to be asking for their login ID and password, right? And it talks about credentials here. So that's what we're going to kind of concentrate on because chances are what happened is, and we're going to ask the customer this. Hello, my name is Irvin with PC Support. And by, you know, chances are uh, the Mike, Mike Moser here uh, already knows us, knows who we are, so... Maybe we don't have to introduce ourselves in this case. But, you know, if you don't know them, keep doing it. It's part of the job. 
I have your sorry guys ticket about email not working did you by chance change your password recently so guys this is exactly what I'm suspecting here is that either his his password Mike's password expired and he changed it while he was already inside the Windows some companies provide a provide you with a a way to reset your password especially if it's a single sign-on meaning that company can have a single sign-on credentials set up for every system that they use which can be for which you can change the password on just a website. Like one of the websites will use that single sign-on. That single sign-on is going to be your domain login or your computer login. So when you go to a website that requires that single sign-on, also known as SSO, it's going to ask for your domain login. If your domain login's password expired that day, it's going to ask you to change that password. When you change your password on the website, your computer is not going to reflect that password necessarily right away. What do I mean by that? Your computer that you're logged in, you're still logged in with your old password. So what you have to do is actually do a Windows L and lock the computer and then type in your new password before you open up other programs. If you don't, you get this pop-up. This is what happens. And maybe... Also, maybe he locked himself out out of the computer. So we're going to concentrate on that, and it's going to be 99% chance that this is the issue. What we're going to do is actually go in and reset their password just to kind of get it going for them in case they forgot the password, because maybe they forgot the password, typed it in 10 times, and then now they're locked out, and their Outlook doesn't have their current password, you know? But this mostly happens when they change the password and they don't know their new password or it hasn't, again, replicated on their local computer. The websites that use the password are fine, but the system itself hasn't received the new password. And that's the issue here, most likely. So we're going to go inside of Active Directory. And this is my virtual server here. And I'm just going to log in real quick here. I'm going to open up Active Directory, Windows Admin Tools, and Active Directory Users and Computers. The company you work for doing help desk may have a web, just like a website or a tool that basically what it allows you to do is the same thing as I'm doing right now. It may not give you direct access to Active Directory at all, which is normal, which is unfortunate, but it's normal. So you may have different means, but you are basically doing exactly what I'm doing, and that is changing their password and unlocking their account just in case. So what I like to do is, you see the uh, users folder on the right hand? So instead of searching through here to see where Mike Moser is, and uh, I know I can see him there, but th this could be populated with thousands of users. We don't know. So what I'm going to do is right-click the folder. I'm going to click Find. And then in, in search here, I'm going to type in Mike Moser. We can also ask him for his login ID, what he uses to log into the computer. And here he is. We found them right away. We don't have to search through thousands of different names. We found them right away. We're going to right-click him. Right-click him. And then we're going to click Reset Password. So we're going to change the password. We're going to give him a new password. What I like to do is give him a simple password. Like, what is today? Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a, going to be a temporary password. This is why it's so simple. I want to give a user a simple password to change because he's going to change it right away. And you can see here that there's a check mark already. It says user must change the password at next login. The user must log off and then log on again for a change to take effect. So they're going to change it. As soon as I tell them, okay, your new password is Tuesday, one, two, three, four, five, six with capital T, they're going to be forced to change it right away and hopefully to something way more secure. 
Uh, but this is what I like to do. Uh, it's up to you. Some places don't allow this to according to the group policy, but this is what I do typically. Um, if my company requires me to do something else or disables my ability to change this, then, then I'm going to use that. But this is what I like to do as, as it is. And I'm going to do a check mark here where it says unlock the user's account. So in case he is locked out, it's going to unlock him. I'm going to click OK. It says the password has been changed for Mike Moser. And I'm going to tell Mike, hello, Mike, I have changed your password. Go ahead and type it in again. Or what I would actually say, go ahead and lock your computer like this. Lock your computer, Mike, and then do control alt delete. And then type in your new password. And then it's going to force him to change the password at that point. And that should be good enough and should fix that issue with the, uh, whatchamacallit, with Outlook. He should no longer get this Outlook pop up at all. Because now, Outlook, since it's part of Windows operating system, once you install it, once you have it installed, it becomes part of Windows operating system. It will detect the new password. And even if it doesn't, even if it comes up again, he'll know what the new password is and he can just type it in and you can guide him through this. What I also like to do is tell him to go ahead and reboot the computer afterwards. That way, it's going to ensure that everything in the background running whether he has email open in the background or any other Microsoft products, including Office. If you, you may, keep in mind, Outlook is part of Office. So if you have anything else running, you may have to close all of it in order to, for it to take effect. So I tell him, just reboot the computer. It's going to flush everything, you know. And that's the simple way of dealing with this. And I'm going to add an external node here and say, resolve issue by password reset I'm going to keep it simple like this and this will resolve this issue I guarantee it I'm going to close the ticket as completed alright excellent <clears throat> by the way if you're still with me thank you so much I appreciate you guys so much one more ticket guys this one here it says I need help installing a printer very common one very good one we're going to work on this one I need help installing printer <laughs> sorry guys I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired uh, but we're gonna you know I'm, I'm gonna fight through we're almost almost done here I'm trying to install a printer but it's not working we're going to reply to the customer Say hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. What kind of printer are you trying to add? Local printer or network printer? Now, this can be confusing to, to the user, to the customer. Because what I'm actually trying to figure out is actually, are they at home? Are they working for a local printer? Or are they trying to add a network printer, which is actually in an, in an office? But to them, network printer could also be a local printer. Sometimes they don't know. You know but that's okay. We're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on. But we can also say, also, can you please send me your PC name with, and you know what, let's, let's, let's hold off on this part of it, because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial. So if they first reply and say, and usually I, I like to be more proactive, but I don't want to be I don't want it to be too much for the user because sometimes users can't and this is not their fault, this is just how human mind works. They can't multitask. 
If I'm asking you too many things at once, it may be confusing. So I'm going to wait for them to reply to this. And they may say, well, it's my local printer at home. Or it's printer at the office. Scenario number one, local printer. Question number two, are you allowed to install a printer, local printer for somebody that works from home? This is another security issue. This has to be approved and allowed by your company. You should know this, or if you don't, ask a coworker, ask your manager whether they're allowed, whether you are allowed to install local printer for them. And I'll show you how you can do that. If it's a network printer, then that should be no problem. You know, they some people are not allowed to print either, depending who they are. But chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office. You know, there's a, a there there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins. Chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff. Companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues. So we got to be careful about this. We got to find this out. Um, if possible, I would call them and talk to them. Uh, if not, I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over IM and not necessarily over email. I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we, we need to find out. But in this case, let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply, say, okay, in that case, can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add? Let's do this. I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control remotely. So you got to word this the best way you can because we you know we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them and we're going to do this so let's kind of go over it again okay i can add the printer for you however i need your pc name to take control of scroll remotely and can you please send me the ip address of the printer you're trying to add so of your PC remotely. So we need to know their PC name and I didn't want to say can you send me your PC name or IP address because I'm already asking for IP address for their printer and I don't want there to be any confusion on the customer's part. I want them to give me PC name and the IP addresses of the printer. IP address of the printer trying to add. You see what I'm saying? Keep it as simple as possible, but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a easy to understand manner. Once we get this information, we're going to go to their computer. And here we are at their computer again. Uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson. And the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed, we're going to go to the search bar. And you can get to this through the control panel as well. But I'm going to say devices and printers. Here we go. Printers and scanners, devices and printers. We want to get to here, guys. This is, this is where you can see device number and I'll show you a different version of it which is was the typical one but this is the what I call Mickey Mouse version of Windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already and they would all be here all right and then if it's not here which we don't see one we can simply click add a new one so now it's looking for what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network and if it doesn't find one, we can simply click here, the printer uh, here I'm looking for, the, pl the printer that I want isn't listed. Other way of going to this here is 
control panel, devices and printers here, and we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before. This is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here. It's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers. So every device, you know, whether it's a USB or, or whatnot, or monitor or, you know, the headset that we talked about earlier. And, of course, if there are any printers, they will be listed here. But, of course, there is a button. Guess where we need to go? We're going to click on the Add Printer. And this is the same thing we looked at earlier, but this is just how it looks like. That's how it used to look like before. Before Windows 10, Mickey Mouse looking stuff, you know. And uh, <laughs> they, they try to make everything look so pretty. And that just created multiple places for the same thing, which doesn't make sense to me. Why not just keep it the way it is, where it's just one place for one thing? You know, anyways, that's a different video. Okay, so it's not going to find anything. What I'm going to do is click uh, the printer that I want isn't listed. So same thing we did earlier. And then here you can add the printer multiple ways. Where it's a Bluetooth wireless local printer, blah, blah, blah. Select anything that you want. But in this case, we're going to select a network printer, which is going to be added using TCP IP address or host name or an IP address that we got from the customer. And here we're just going to type it in, for example, 168.2.1, whatever. It's whatever the static IP address is for that printer. It's going to have to be a static IP address because, you know, it's a printer. It doesn't, we got to have a static IP address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time. And then we're going to leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use. What that does, it pings the printer and says, hey, I'm trying to add you, but do you have a driver? And then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer, it's going to have that driver. It's going to automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it. You know, Same thing when you're adding a local printer, you may have to download the driver, install the driver, but then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer. You know, once you click next, it may, if it doesn't find, if it doesn't find the driver and it's going to bring you to, uh, nothing's going to happen here. So I can't really show you this at this time, but what happens, it's, it's going to say, okay, I found this IP address. I know it's a printer there, but which one is it? And then you go through a list that's available there and you select which model, like for example, Xerox, blah, blah, blah. And you select and you tell it which printer there is. That, that which type of printer that you're trying to connect. So if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically, you're going to have to ask the user, can you tell me the name and model of that printer? So that way you can get those drivers and install them properly. Once you do that, it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default, kind of like this. So if you see one like that, just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants, he or she wants. And then make sure it's set as default. You have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle. Okay. And now we're going to add an external or internal note, I should say. Added printer as requested. Irvin. And I'm going to close the ticket. And the last one we have there, remember, is the one that we're waiting to see if anything else is going on with that. So remember, this is the one we worked on earlier about, and there were there are no issues at the moment. And I will keep the ticket open for 24 hours um, in case it goes down again. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm suspecting about two hours. I appreciate you stopping by, watching, and I appreciate your nice comments. I appreciate your uh, support, clicking the like button, sharing the video, telling your friends about me and all that. I, I, I can't express how much I appreciate that and how much I enjoy making these videos um, this particular one was extra long a bit it was this one is a little bit exhausting I don't usually make videos this long just from one 
one usually I make uh, from like one uh, one sitting I usually make videos about half hour long each tops and uh, but it's okay I don't mind doing this because it's a special video and I really wanted to make this particular video for you guys if I didn't answer any of your questions feel free to leave a comment I'll get to you as much take care and you have a wonderful day thank you for watching bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, it's all about help desk. We're going to learn how to use an example ticketing system. And then I'm going to also show you four different examples of a phone call that you might get as a help desk employee. These phone calls will show you how to handle the calls and also how to troubleshoot the call. It's a very good video for those trying to get into help desk as a starting point in their IT career. Guys, Please take a one second to click the like button. This way I'm not going to play ad at this point at all. But you clicking the like button really makes a difference for my video. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Let's get into it. This video is designed for new people to help desk tier 1 or tier 2. What we will learn in this video is how to create a ticket and how to work a ticket in a ticketing system. Keep in mind there are many many different ticketing systems out there available and uh, a lot of them are proprietary meaning the company that you work for will have their own ticketing system but lately or uh, most recently they've all been web-based just like this third-party ticketing system that I'm about to show you and when it comes to navigation working the tickets and this and that it should be very uh, very much the same as you would do when you work for somebody else. So this is going to be very educational for people who are uh, about to start working on a help desk or just tech support where they use a ticketing system. So let's get back to the first thing we need to do. We're going to create a ticket in this ticketing system but we have to familiarize yourself keep in mind you are new at the company and you've never experienced this before chances are you don't know what to do you don't know what to uh, look for well this is typically what it looks like you have a system that's open like this uh, typically web-based and then on the left hand side you got few different tabs that you can select first one is the main queue what you're looking at here and when i click on all open and what shows in the middle is all tickets that are open currently these are tickets that come through and then next one is assigned to me and if we click on you can see that you haven't been assigned any tickets whatsoever and then if we click on unassigned issues you can also see there however if you keep if you go back to the all open that means they are all there that means that there haven't been worked yet even if it's been assigned so and then of course we have incidents down here and it's going to be based off a type of ticket and then we got service requests changes and problems so these are all different categories for these tickets that are there now not to confuse you or to lose you let's go ahead and create a ticket because this will show you what the ticketing system is about so let's say uh, this reporter here, which is Kobuman1, he is the user of all three of these issues. These are all issues that he has. So let's see how he did that. So he went to a system, and he's got a probably similar system uh, that, he, that we see here, and then he clicked on create a ticket or submit a new ticket. And the first thing that they're going to do is select an issue type, which is right here. Don't ignore this part where it says project this is just because I'm an admin to this so ignore this what they're going to look at first is issue type this is what's going to ask you and they're going to either have a drop down here or they're going to be able to type in the type of issue that they have so they can just type in report an incident and if they select that for example that's what was going to be selected so whatever it is that they have chances are there's either a an article on how to fix it themselves if it's like some kind of a minor software issue but they in general they will have a way to search for their problem and once they do they will come across their problem they would select it so for example if they would just type in get see help it's going to show up and then they can select that at the same time if they type in like for example name of the website or a program it's going to find that as well and then they can select that and that way it's going to be routed to the support 
theme for that specific application, website, system, or software. You see, that it's very self-explanatory. So, and the next thing, once they figure out what the problem is, I select the correct issue type here, they can type in the title of it. And it's kind of confusing here that where it says summary, but it's actually just uh, a title. So let's go ahead and pretend that this is a test ticket, and we're just going to type in test, so that way we have... Uh, a good so we can track it so we can see how it shows up in the system and then we're going to type in test again because we're just learning how to create a ticket right here and it's going to be very simple if we scroll down there will be other uh, things you can put in there for example a user can attach a, a screenshot and if they click here they can just add it you know browse it this and that typical they would upload a screenshot of the error if they have and then they can select the component, and then if they're savvy enough, they'll be able to figure out, okay, well, what is the issue about, and they would select that. So let's say they, you know, some kind of actor directory issue, they can just select that. And then assignment here, you can see that it's automatic. We can leave that. This is some of those, one of those admin uh, issues, and this is not uh, what uh, a user would see. And then you can also uh, create a ticket on behalf of somebody else. So I'm going to create a ticket on behalf of Koboman1, which is the same person that reported the previous issues. That way, um, if, uh, if a user is not able to create a ticket for themselves, you can do it on their behalf as well. Another reason to create a ticket is to also keep track of internal things that you do, and you need a record of it. So, you know, doing tickets just as an internal part of uh, what you do is a good way to uh, uh, just have a record of uh, some kind of change that you've done on a computer or PC or whatever. And then next thing we have is priority. Um, uh, well, actually, we do have approvers, but this is related to whether somebody needs to be approved, for example, to have an access to a specific server, uh, whether they're approved to have email or instant messenger, or even if they're approved to uh, get new software or if they're approved to get new hardware, right? So, and then we have priority here. And priority is kind of self-explanatory. If a big website is down, chances are they're going to select the highest priority or, you know, it's, if it's affecting a lot of people, they can just select highest priority. But if it's nothing big, they can just select lowest priority or whatever, you know? And then, of course, urgency is uh, also kind of similar to that, which would, I don't know why they have it twice, but... You know, if it's a website down, it's going to be, of course, critical. And then it's going to impact a lot of people. Impact, very uh, important. If it's a lot of uh, people, it's critical and it's the highest priority. It's going to be expensive, widespread. If it's just one user requesting something, it's going to be minor. So, and then pending reason. This is um, if you're working on a ticket and then you need a pending reason why it needs to be approved, this and that. Like, for example, somebody's requesting something. Um, uh, that they would deal with that. Product categorization and this and that, this is usually automatically populated by uh, the system itself. Users wouldn't typically deal with any of this. They would just put in a basic you know, ticket and then you would have to figure this out if it needs to be uh, you know, if it needs to be um, uh, dealt with or categorized. Uh, there is a category here, optional categorization. We can just select connectivity in case we are working with, you know, a big system downage. And then, of course, there are labels, and you can create your own labels, you know. Okay, and then we're going to click Create Ticket. Now we can see on the right side that there's a notification that came up that's typical in a ticketing system. If you're working the system, if you have it open, you would get a notification that the ticket came through. So if we refresh this, if I click on all open, it's going to refresh it. It may take a second here, but it's going to populate with the new ticket we just uh, submitted. It depends on how fast the cloud is or the storage uh, where the, uh, the ticketing system is at. It may take a moment to come up. Uh, let, me, let me hit the refresh button here. And uh, there it is. There's our test email. And at the same time, you and your group, including the user as well, will get an email notification that I think it came through. And uh, and that would look some that would look something uh, like this. Here's our three other tickets that are already in the system. The other one just came through as you saw. So you can see that there is a new ticket that came, so you get a, a desktop notification, and then you get email notification.
All right. Now, we learned how to create a ticket. That's very simple. Now, let's go ahead and uh, work a ticket. Here's a really good one we can uh, pick. So, once you're in the main uh, queue, is what they call here, uh, you can just pick any of the tickets and assign it to yourself if you're allowed to do so. Typically, that's what happens. You can pick up tickets, work them, or sometimes the manager assigns a ticket to you. But this time, we have the permission to assign tickets to ourselves, so we're going ahead and do that. We're going to select this middle one, and then we're going to assign it to ourselves. This is going to be slightly different, uh, you know, depending on the type of software you use. But typically, what you want to look for is something like this, where it says assignee. I want to click on that, and then I'm going to assign it to me. I'm going to click on that, and sometimes there's a save button or this and that. This particular system doesn't, and it's just going to assign it automatically. So let's go ahead and go back to our queue, which is click on all open here, and we can see now that it's assigned to me. And uh, I'm going to go back to it, and then we're going to now work it. So how would you do this? There are a few ways of, of working a ticket. Uh, this is going to depend on a preferred contact method that the user has. If we look at this ticket, uh, it's not very detailed, right? And if we click on here, view request in portal, uh, you know, a lot of times it would open it up and there will be more information here, but it kind of looks the same as the other one. So we're just going to go back here. The thing is, though, a lot of systems would specify what type of preferred contact method they would have. For example, I prefer to be contacted with email or uh, there would be their email address there or something like that. I prefer to be contacted with IM or, or do I prefer to be contacted by the phone. So user would typically specify that and you know there would be more stuff, uh, detailed information about them. This system unfortunately doesn't have that information. The only thing we have is ability to reply to customer directly here. So this is what we're going to do. It says here the issue is I have two monitors, both have the same picture. So that means that it's a configuration issue and we can help them deal with that. Uh, if, if they are outside of your company, let's say you're doing tech support you know, for somebody else in a different state, you're not on site, you're not there to help them, you can simply say, if you've never worked with this uh, person before, you can say, hello, my name is Irvin. At, with tech support tech support at STL Missouri so you know you want to tell them hey my name is Irvin uh, I'm with tech support or whatever your name may be and I am at this location so that way they know that you are uh, you know that person it's, it's an introduction it's a simple introduction and then you can say I have your ticket about a monitor right? and it's simple you tell them who you are where you at and that you have their ticket about a monitor this is what you typically do if you're contacting them first time through email or through like for example instant messenger or even if you call them this is something you, you have to let them know who you are and why you're calling them or why you're contacting them since this is a message through the system, through the ticketing system, you don't necessarily have to introduce yourself because they know that the system that they submitted a ticket through, uh, somebody is reaching out to them because of that, right? And then, you know, if you can help, I mean, this is a remote type of thing. If you can take control of their uh, PC and resolve this issue for them, that would be ideal. But if you don't, well, I mean, what can you do? Um, well, you can just at least suggest... Uh, have you tried, you know, what is it, expanding your desktop onto second monitor? That's usually the problem when it comes to this, right? And this is one of those things that you can ask the customer. If you can take control of their computer, that would be ideal. However, if you happen to be on site, if you happen to be on site, that would be even better. So, um, you can say, may I stop by to take, take a look, when would be good for you? So that way you can go there directly and just resolve the issue. And then now we're going to just click save. This should send an email to the customer 
and uh, you know that should reach out to the customer in some way, whether it's they having to have the system up and they get a notification or they would get an email uh, from the system saying, hey, uh, this tech guy, Kobo Man, is trying to reach out to you. This guy named Irvin, actually, is trying to reach out to you or both. Usually it would be both. So they would get a communication from you. So the next thing you would do is add an internal note. means uh, that's a, a note for you and the people that work for you or the, not the work for you or with you if they want to know what's going on with that ticket. They can look up your ticket and see that you have reached out to user and awaiting feedback. All right. So you can be more detailed about this. This is just the basic navigation and notage of a ticket. So what we have done here is reached out to the customer. We have created an internal note so that everybody can see that what you've worked on and what kind of work you've done when it comes to this ticket. So let's say your manager is like, hey, uh, what's going on with this ticket? They can look it up and see what you've done. You know, And um, if it's, if it's uh, something you can resolve on site, you can say uh, configured dual monitor. And then click Save. And now, since you've resolved the issue, we have configured the dual monitor. At this point, it's resolved. Now we can close the ticket, right? We can go ahead and close it. And in this case, we have to go over here on the right-hand side where it says waiting for support. If we click on that, it gives you a bunch of different options for the status of the ticket. You know, you can see that whether you escalated a ticket, uh, you know, waiting for support, canceled or completed. We're going to set it to completed. Sometimes it would say resolved or this and that. And now the ticket is completed and closed. And by the way, notice this little eyeball here. That's a watch option. That means how many people are actually viewing and watching this ticket. We can see that both of these guys are watching this ticket. So that means how many people are viewing it and working on it, which is kind of useful, actually. So that way you can be like, hey, you know, ping them or, you know, send them a message. Hey, are you working on this too? You know, this and that. And uh, all right, let's move on to uh, another ticket that we can look at. And then if we click on all open tickets here, it's going to bring us back to the, the queue. We can see now that the other ticket is gone. It's, it's simply gone. It's closed and you'll no longer see it in the queue. But we do have other tickets we can work on. So let's do one more, which is a bit different. And this is a website down uh, ticket. So this is kind of important. Our website is down. We can't access our main website. And then we can see that the urgency is critical. So of course, we're going to have to prioritize these critical tickets. Now, let me see. Does this system actually say in the queue anywhere that it's a critical? It doesn't. So the only indicator you have here is on the left hand side. It's kind of these icons. And, you know, this is kind of unfortunate uh, that I couldn't show you that, that you know, um, there, there might be some other indicator that it's a critical issue. All you got to do is, all, the only thing you can do is go by whatever the summary is or whatever the title of the ticket is. So you kind of have to use your own judgment. In our case, I wouldn't have worked the first ticket first at all, I would have worked this one first. So you got to prioritize that. It's very important. But once we click on it now, we can see that it's critical. So of course, we're going to um, contact them again. But before we do that, since this is a critical, we may want to um, do something else real quick. And this is going to depend on, on your business, whether you're the only one working there or whether you actually want other people involved. So there are options for that as well. And if you look on the right hand side here, we can add participants. If we click here and add participants, if your manager, for example, is Joe, uh, Joe, Joe Schmo, <laughs> Schmo, did I spell that Joe Schmo? Let's do that. Joe Schmo, we're going to add him and then he can watch. Or even if we have Bob, it's a boy. Uh, you know, as a co-worker and he's working with you as well, we can add them as participants so they can follow what's going on, right? So that's pretty cool here as well. And then we can have, um, 
let's go ahead and work this ticket real quick. I'm going to reply. And again, there are no other way to contact them. So I have to contact them through the system. Otherwise, I would have called them, uh, messaged them, and this and that. And then what I would do here in this case, and this is just an example so we can work the ticket, but there are many things that you might want to ask when it's a big issue like this. Uh, the first thing usually I would say is uh, how many, I would say people are impacted. You don't want to say users. Usually that's something that IT would use within itself. You would want to say how many people are impacted. And then uh, when was the last time it worked? Are you using the correct link? You know, stuff like that that would help you resolve this a big of an issue, right? And then later on, uh, you know, if you do realize that it really is a big issue like this, uh, support team um, for this specific website that they may be uh, talking about uh, may need more information. For example, host names, IP addresses, this and that. So I'm going to start with this. Uh, typically, you would want more, but you would have to know what the website is and this and that. And this is just going to be depending on the work environment that you're at. Here we are learning how to use the system, not necessarily resolve issues uh, because we don't have enough information, right? So we're here learning how to use a ticketing system, and that's that. And then, of course, you add internal note right away and says contacted user with uh, requesting, I'm sorry, requesting more information. Now, this is an internal note, and this means that only you and the people that work the system can only see it. So you can say user this time because we are talking to IT people who might read this. This is for your own note, work note, uh, internal note, and for the people that are IT, user cannot see this at all. So it's okay to say user. Okay, now that we're waiting on that, of course, is a priority. This is something you would actively work on, but we're just going to leave it like it is for now. Now, let's see. Uh, the, the, there are different issues. There are different options here for the, this ticket right now, and that's because the issue is literally selected as a problem. Now we have different things, and this is going to you know depend on the type of work environment that you're working at, and then uh, you can see that now we have an option just to, just to close it. But that's only if it's resolved, and then there's cancel, and then there's under review. I'm not sure why it would be under review. That's kind of a weird option to have in a ticketing system. But I guess it could be related to some kind of an access request uh, for something. But the fact that it's just reported as a problem is kind of confusing. Anyways, now we know how to create tickets, how to work tickets, and how to assign them, which, by the way, we haven't done here so we haven't assigned it to ourselves. Maybe that's why the option there was a bit different. Well, maybe not. Anyways, again, there are many, many different uh, ticketing systems, many third-party systems, and you just have to kind of adjust to them accordingly. So let's go back and see what else is open. We can see that this one here is assigned to me, that I'm uh, working on it. Let's see on the next tab, assigned to me. It says zero now, but now it shows up as one because it took a little bit to refresh and then we got other tabs that you can get into, but these are the basics. These are the basics of working and working a ticketing system that you must know before going to work for a help desk of any sort. And of course, you can look at your own statistics here, and that option is not here. But I think if I click here, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys. Cues, back to projects. Usually managers can only see a report but then maybe we can view some reports here. Reports, workload, and yeah, so if you're a manager or, or sometimes even as just a tier one help desk, you may be able to see your own uh, progress, and here it is. You can see that I have one issue uh, that I've resolved. Any more detailed? So yeah, that, that just allows you to you know look up other people's tickets. Uh, satisfactions. These are all statistics that managers only look at. Of course, you want to, SLA is also, you know, those metrics of how fast you resolve issues, this and that. But what I taught you so far are the basics you need to 
work the system as an IT help desk tier one. So let's go ahead and look at what happened during this phone call and then we're going to stop it in real time and then I'm going to show you what happens on the back end. So meaning that what is going on with the person working help desk while they're talking to the user. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. Uh, what can I assist you with today? Hi, I, uh, I, I for some reason I can't log in to Outlook. Outlook keeps asking me for a password. I don't know why. I, uh, I'm i not sure what's going on here. Sure. Does it um, does it uh, give you an issue whenever you try to log in anything else, or is this just this specific system? Uh, let me let me try. I, I think it's just Outlook, but I'm not sure. I don't even know why Outlook keeps asking me for the password, but I think it's just Outlook. Let me try something else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this... Um, Oh uh, yeah, this other system is also giving me problems. It keeps asking for the password. I don't know why. I did have a little trouble. Uh, like I may have like mistyped the password this morning. Okay. Well, no problem. Let times. me uh, let me look up your account. Uh, what is your login ID for this? My login ID is Irvin underscore uh, C A N. Okay. All right. I got it pulled up here. All right, let's pause that for a minute. Now we know the name of this user. So let's go ahead and look it up in Active Directory to see what's going on with his account. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. I really appreciate that. That way I don't have to play any ads for you here. And that way you are supporting my channel. It only takes one second. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user, and he said Irvin underscore C A N. So it's going to click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account select apply or okay and this will unlock the user's account now we can get back to them and let them know to try again it wouldn't take my password I, I, I recently changed it I think I changed it like a couple of days ago so I may have mistyped it a couple of times. Is that why? Oh, yeah, the, that makes sense. So uh, if you mistype password once, you don't want to keep trying it. Usually it locks out after you try more than three times. Uh, but it's not a problem. I can unlock you. Uh, would you like me to reset the password as well? Or do you just uh, want to give it a shot without me resetting if you it? Can, uh, if you can unlock me, that would be great. I'd like to see if I can. Because uh, I don't feel like changing the password again. You know how it is. It's like you, you try to like come up with a new password and then it it's like you're just sitting there trying to figure out well which one do i want to use this time like you know so uh, yeah if you can just unlock me that would be great okay no problem i uh i have it unlocked right now i want to want to give it a shot and see if it works all right hold on let me uh let me try this here okay I I think I'm good now. Outlook came up now, and it's uh, okay. It looks yeah, okay. My new <laughs> emails are coming through. So okay, great. Uh, that's good. I I thank you so much. I appreciate. That. All right, no problem, no problem. I'm I'm glad to help. I'm glad that worked out for you. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with today? No, that is all. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their 
password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find, and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here. Since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the Active Directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password. Is that now? Since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. Today's video, we take a look at a call handling for help desk tier one, in which case user has a slow computer. I will show you the call handling and I will show you what I did to resolve the issue as well. Friends, if you have a one second, please click the like button. I really appreciate it. This way, I'm not going to bother you with any ads at this point. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get to it. I'm going to play the call and at certain times I will pause the call itself and show you what I'm doing on the back end in order to help this user. This was going to be a fun video, guys. Let's get into it right away. Thank you for calling Help Desk Tier 1 Support. Uh, my name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hi, my computer is running really slow. Is there something you can help me with this? For some reason, it's just so slow today that I can't do anything. No matter what I do, everything, everything is really slow. Sure thing. Uh, what, what's going on? When did you start having this issue? It started happening this morning. It was fine yesterday. And then today, for some reason, it's just very, very sluggish. I can't do anything. I really need this uh, to be fixed so I can do my job. All right, no problem. I can have a look uh, to see what's going on. Can you give me your PC name? My PC name? Uh... Yeah, it should be it should be under your PC information, or even there might be a, a sticker uh, on your computer or something like that. That it'll be either combinations of numbers or letters. If you can give me that, please, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I think I see it here. Um, it says T M C three five six five eight three zero. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, sir, do you mind if I uh, take control over your computer just for a moment? I want to see what is going on and see if we can uh, uh, figure out what's causing this issue for you. Sure, go ahead. All right, I was the phone call just for a second here. So the user is talking about a slow computer. So it's a slow computer situation. So what is the major reason for a slow computer? In a business environment, most of the time when a computer is slow, it's because of an update. So let's get a look at the updates that we can look up here. And we're going to just type in updates and check for Windows updates. And sure enough, guys, we have some pending restarts for an update for a Windows 10 update. So what typically happens is that Windows tries to update or the computer itself tries to update overnight. But for some reason, it's not able to do so when the computer is not being used, meaning that it tries to do this in after hours when the computer is not being used. But chances are, if the computer was turned off, shut down, asleep, or any of those reasons, it probably couldn't install these updates. So now we got to get back to the user and let them know that this is what was the cause of this and explain to them 
what we can do to resolve this issue. Of course, if your company has a specific tool that pushes updates to your computer, you would also check that to see if anything failed, because it's not just Windows updates that could be causing this, but updates for other software, and chances are uh, there is a different way to control that within the company that you work for. You would, it would be company-specific, so you would have to check that as well. Other reasons for a slow computer is highly unlikely in a business environment. You know, for example, like not enough RAM, this and that. That That's not usually what happens in a business. That's something that home computers may have issues with. For a business type of computer, they're going to be up to spec, and the main reason for it to be in slow is updates. Of course, there is another reason, you know, being a virus, but getting a virus in a business environment is so unlikely, it's unbelievable. So, updates, main thing. Let's get back to the customer and tell them about that. All right, sir. So, what I found is that uh, your, your computer is trying to get updates, but it's not able to. So, at this time, we need to reboot your computer so you can finish Windows updates. This typically happens whenever uh, your computer is either asleep and it can't get a chance to get its updates overnight. Usually, computers get updates overnight when people are not working during, um, you know, after hours where you know it's not a you know peak business hours or anything like that. So, but sometimes when the computer is asleep or turned off or if it's shut down, uh, it may not be able to get its updates. So what we got to do is just kind of wait for it to finish its updates. And I have a feeling once. We reboot it should be done it'll probably be much faster but yeah that's what usually happens and uh, that should resolve your issue so go ahead and reboot and if that uh, if that doesn't work then uh, we can help you further see if that works all right i'll give it a shot um all right i'll go ahead and reboot now and then see what happens all right great thank you so much for doing that i appreciate that Okay, looks like I'm uh, looks like I can log in now. All right, great. Go ahead and log in, and we'll see how it goes. Now, keep in mind we just rebooted the computer, so it may be a little bit slow in the beginning, but it should be fine afterwards. Uh, you know, usually when we're rebooting the computer, it kind of clears the memory. So in that case, it may take a little bit just to log in, but afterwards it should be fine. Okay. All right, I'm logged in. Great. All right, let's see. See if see if uh, see if it's running any better for you here. All right, I'm checking. All right, so far so good. Tell you what, it's definitely faster than it was uh, this morning. I don't. Okay. Yeah, it it, it seems to be fine now. So uh, let me see if I can pull up my email and uh, a couple of other systems that I use just to make sure before I let you go. Sure thing. No problem, sir. Take your time here. Okay. Okay. I I think I'm good now. Thank you so much. It it's uh I appreciate your help on this. Hey, no problem, sir. Again, you know, sometimes this just happens whenever computers shut down. Uh, the best thing, the best advice I can give you uh, is that whenever you're at the end of the day, whenever you're done using the computer, just go ahead and like reboot it or sign off. Because sometimes the computer won't even update properly, even if you're signed into the computer for some reason. But the best thing to do is just to reboot the computer, and uh, that you know that should. Uh, kind of a, be a, a proactive thing we can do here to kind of prevent this type of thing from happening. All right, will do. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. All right, no problem. Have a good day. Thank you for calling uh, Tech Support. Bye-bye. All right, guys, let's get into it. But first, real quick, please take one second to click that like button. This way I'm not going to play any ads at this point. This makes a huge difference for me. I really appreciate your help on this. Thank you so much. And now let's listen to the call. And then after that, during the call, we're going to pause in the middle of it and I'll show you how to fix this WebEx issue. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hey, this is Bob. I, uh, I have, I'm having trouble with my um, uh, WebEx meeting. The audio doesn't work. I'm trying to use my headset, but I, I don't know what's going on. It's just that I've been told that uh, they can hear me, but I can't hear them. Or something's going on with with my headset. I'm I'm trying to use it for this WebEx. Either like it doesn't matter if I create a meeting or join a meeting. There's always the same issue with the headset. I can't. And it's a new headset I just got from my boss. I'm trying to use it here, and uh, it's just it's just giving me trouble. Is this something you can help me out with? 
I sure can. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, get your uh, PC name real quick. There should be a, a PC information uh, on your computer for that. It's it's uh, it could be a computer name or a workstation name. There might be even a sticker on your computer. Can you please give me that? Sure. Uh, here it is. It's a three five C three T O five seven eight. Thank you very much for that. Do you mind if I take control of your computer just for a moment? I want to have a look and see what's going on. Sure thing, go ahead, no problem. Now, just real quick, I want to make sure the type of headset that you have, is it a USB one or is it the one that has two prongs or uh, two connectors, if you will? So it's usually, it's uh, um, if it's just a standard one, it's going to have one that's red and the other one is black and you plug it in usually in the front of the PC or is just a USB one? I have one of those that's just a USB one. All right, no problem. I'm, I'm taking a look right now. All right, let's pause the phone call here for a moment so we can troubleshoot, so I can show you how I would troubleshoot this. He mentions uh, audio issues. So every time somebody mentions audio issues, I would definitely look at the audio settings inside the computer. And noticed I specifically asked him if he has a USB type of uh, headset or if it's just one of those standard ones with two plugs. And uh, he said he has a USB one, so we're just going to use that knowledge as our starting point. All right, let's look at the system settings. We're going to right-click on our speaker icon here. I'm going to select Open Sound Settings. These are Windows 10 sound settings. I'm not a big fan of this. It is pretty simple, and yes, you can do several troubleshooting in here, but I prefer to click on the sound control panel here, which is the old-school way of pulling up and troubleshooting system sound settings for Windows operating systems. So I'm going to minimize this WebEx here just so I can get that out of the way and not distract you with it. So as in, uh, the first thing we see here is that we have Realtek high definition audio. This is one of those audio systems that will be on pretty much every computer that has Windows operating system. I guarantee you that if you open up sound settings on your computer right now, you will have a Realtek high definition audio. And we know that this is default sound for that PC, meaning that everything that's built into the computer is going to use this and everything that is plugged into it as in specifically microphone or a headset through the regular 3.5 millimeter connector it's going to use Realtek so we can ignore that part of it right now because we're not going to use it we have to concentrate on a USB headset and he specifically you said the USB the only other thing that shows up here is this Plantronics C610 which is a USB headset and you can see there's a little you know there's a green check mark here that means that right now that Realtek is set as default I'm going to go ahead and change this Plantronics to default I'm going to select it I'm going to click set as default now I know for sure that everything on the system is going to use this playback audio as in speaker as default so we changed our speakers to Plantronics C610 which is the headset itself there's nothing else there so we know for sure that that is the headset that he is using now let's go ahead and click on recording here this is going to be set up for our microphone and here we go again we can see that he has a microphone either built in or plugged in somehow but you know if it's a laptop chances are that it's just a built-in microphone and it's again set to Realtek we don't want that we want to set it to our Plantronics and we're going to set it as default now you don't necessarily want to do this as set it, set things up as a default depending on preference of the customer but a lot of times to make sure that the issue doesn't uh, repeat itself this is what I like to do is set their main audio to default, whatever that might be. And I will, of course, double check that with the customer as well. So now I know that my microphone is set to the Plantronics, which is set to Plantronics, which is the headset. I'm going to click OK. So now everything else that comes up should be using that as default. Now let's look at the WebEx. Now keep in mind, WebEx is kind of tricky when it comes to setting up audio. If I click on the little cog here and I click you know just to click on it to see what are the settings where are the settings here for the webex and of course you can see this that there is a preference and once you open it up you assume that the audio settings would be here but they're not unfortunately you can see that there is account my personal room 
meeting join phone numbers calendars notifications video system but nothing talks the audio is actually um, set up when you start a meeting or join a meeting so let's go ahead and click start a meeting and this is going to launch our little start a meeting pop-up so with the start meeting enabled here I know our pop-up comes up we can see there are some things here that are flipping through and we can see that the, this is the audio setting right here. We're going to look at that r here in a moment, but let's look at this real quick. You see how it says here, use computer for audio. A lot of times if you have a desk phone, like one of those physical desk phones that are just sitting on your desk, there chances are there might be some kind of integration there and that uh, you want to make sure that it's not detected because you can use a desk phone for uh, WebEx meetings and, and whatnot, especially if it's a Cisco phone, uh, usually I, uh, over IP phone, which all the new phones are. But in our case, we want to make sure that use computer for audio is selected. And uh, let's go ahead and select on our settings here that are kind of flipping through. We're going to click on that and see what we have. And here we have to make a minor change and change the uh, microphone here to make sure that it reflects our Plantronics headset. So we're going to select Plantronics headset or you can click use system settings. I prefer just to click it uh, microphone uh, Plantronics. So if you're going to set up WebEx only and only WebEx to use this headset, you would make sure that it's selected to the microphone and not use system settings. So in case you want to use system settings defaults for something else, um, basically what I'm saying is you can configure WebEx only to use the headset as well. Again, I'm going to double check this with the customer to see what his preferences are. All right, let's get back to the phone call. All right, sir, so it, it looks like there's uh, just a configuration issue with the audio. The headset is probably working just fine. I went ahead and made the changes in the system and the WebEx make sure that this is all set to use the headset most of the time. Now just keep in mind if you're going to use your PC speakers or if you have speakers connected to it, these, these settings may have to be changed back. But right now I set your headset to default so that way it's always going to use that for the time being. Um, if you'd like I can change it, I can only change, I can just change WebEx to use it and nothing else. No, no, that's fine. I don't use the speakers at all. I headset is fine. I don't want people to hear me talking anyways or hear hear what other people are saying on the meeting anyways. All right, no problem. I'll go ahead and leave it like that so it's all set to default now and it should work. Do you want to give it a shot and test it out? Sure. Let me uh let me get my coworker over here. I'm going to start a meeting real quick and test it uh, with her. Hey Susan. You mind testing this with me? All right. Thank you. Go ahead and join. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you fine too. Awesome. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you for testing this with me. Hello? Yeah, um, it's working. It's working fine now. So uh, <laughs> thanks for fixing that for me. It was, it was so annoying. Every time I joined the meeting, it just didn't work. No problem. I'm glad to help. Um, is there anything else I can assist you with today? No, that's it. Uh, you've been great help. Thank you so much. You bet. You have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And there you have it, guys. Another successful help desk tier one phone call handled like an IT professional. And this is an example of a help desk or a call center phone call in which you deal with an angry customer. So this is incredibly important to know because you got to have the skill in order to resolve their issues. Sometimes a customer is so angry that you got to deal with it in a special way so that way you can resolve this issue without it being escalated to your manager. So this is an incredibly important video, not just technically, and I'll show you what the problem is with the computer, but also in a way to deal with it. So it's a social video in a sense. All right, guys, let's have a look. But before we do that, please take one second to like my video. This really makes a huge difference. And that way I'm not going to play any ads for you. So what's going to happen, I'm going to show you the customer's phone call, an example phone call. And then I'm going to pause the video and show you how to I fix it. And most of all, on how I dealt with this angry customer. Again, thank you so much for your support and let's enjoy. Thank you for calling tech support. My name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Oh my God. Look, I need you to fix my computer. All right. Look, everything is broken. I can't open anything. All right, sir. No problem. I'm sure I can help you with this. What seems to be uh, the issue? You know, what are I'm you, trying I... to open up these Word documents. All my Excels, nothing is working. It's just, 
it, the, the icons kind of change. I, I don't know. When I click on it, nothing happens. It just doesn't want to. Look, I need this fixed right away because I got important things to do, all right? All right, sure. So, hey, sir, no problem. I'm sure I can help you. I'm sure we'll fix this for you. Just uh, uh, just give me a few moments here. Right? I hate to do this to you, but can you please give me the PC name? That way I can help you as fast as, I, as, fast as possible, all right? That way I can possibly take over your computer and just do it for you, all right? P PC name? What is this PC name thing? Well, there should, sir, there should be uh, um, an icon or on your desktop or something that says PC information or maybe a sticker on the computer that with a PC name. All right, all right. Let me let me see. Hold on, hold on. Let me see. Oh, I, I, I see it. I see it. I see a sticker here. All right, great, sir. Can you please give me that? That way I can just help you real quick. All right, it's uh, 3570COTAFL. All right, thank you, sir, very much for that. All right, all right, I'm going to make sure that I look at your computer. Okay, so what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, request to take control of your computer, and all you got to do is just click accept if there's a pop-up or anything like that. Just make sure you click accept on that. All right, all right, all right. All right, I see it. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for accepting that. All right, I'm going to have a look now, and I'm going to fix it for you. All right, don't worry. Just, just hang tight, please. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's pause the phone call for just a moment to see what's going on here. And you can see that the customer here is trying to open these documents and it just keeps asking for something to open it with. Uh, these are Excel and Word type of documents. You can see they are uh, extension on them is ODT and ODS. These are basically um, uh, open Office type of documents. They can also be opened with regular Microsoft Office, but in this case, we're just going to reinstall Open Office in this, and this is going to resolve the issue. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Of course, in a business type of environment, you would have a different type of tool, but in my case, I'm just going to install the executable that I've downloaded with Open Office, and this will fix it. Okay, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for holding. Look, I, I found the problem for you. Uh, I just need a few moments to fix it. But I guarantee I will fix it for you. The thing is, though, the uh, Microsoft uh, Office or uh, the software basically used to uh, open these programs for you uh, is removed for some reason. I'm going to have to reinstall it. Unfortunately, this may need a restart. Oh, my God. Sir, I'm really sorry, but I guarantee you this will fix it. Um, it, it may restart. It may not. But if it does... It shouldn't take too long, but I guarantee you will fix it, all right? So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to reinstall it, and then it should work for you. Just give me a moment here. All right, fine. All right, sir, I'm initiating it right now. It's happening, and uh, it, what I'm just kind of waiting for it to install, um, just, you know, just ask you real quick, do you need to save anything just in case the computer decides to reboot on you? Because a lot of times when you install these big programs, it likes to reboot for some reason. I don't want you to lose anything else, you know? All right, let me check. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're fine. You're fine. All right, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you again for being patient with me. I guarantee you this will fix it for you. You just need a few moments and possible restart, but it should be good to go. And uh, hopefully this, co this computer is fast, so that way we can get back to them real quick. So I'm just going to keep clicking next. And so far it's going really quick. And again, a uh, business you work for may have different type of tool that deploys these type of applications. You might want to go in there and do a repair or whatnot if it is Microsoft Office. But in this case, um, it is open Office. But either way, we're going to resolve the issue. All right, that was really quick, which is good. That means we can get back to the customer real quick. And you can see now that... We can open these uh, just documents. These are just fake documents that I created for the sake of video. And you can see now that it's working. All right, let's get back to the customer. It looks, yeah, well, it looks like it installed and uh, I don't see any reboot uh, requirements. So I think you're good to go. Um, you want to check it out before I? Let me, uh, let me have a look real quick. All right. All right. All right. Looks good. All right. Good. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. All right, no problem, sir. I, you know, I, I understand the frustration. It, it happens, but you know, you're good to go now. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, I'm good. Thanks. All right, thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a good day. All right, you too. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. There you go, my friends. That's how you handle a, an angry customer. I uh, I made this video as best as I can in order to show you guys how to do it because it is kind of awkward to, uh, uh, I guess 
pretend to be the tech support and pretend to be the customer as well in order to create this type of video. So I hope it came out good. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I also like to see when people just say hi. I really like that too. And uh, if you want to check out my channel, I have a bunch of different videos on help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, and all kinds of other IT stuff that you can learn from. And I also have, if you're interested in this type of stuff, I also have more videos in this type of format where it shows you how to deal with certain issues and technical issues that you may come across as a help desk technician. And again, if you're doing just call center type of stuff, these videos are also helpful. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Please share this video. If you have a second, click the like button. I really appreciate that as well. Thank you again, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we're going to prepare for a plus certification exam. If you go to comptia.org, you can find these training resources, and you can see here is the link. If you'd like to go to it, you can do so as well and get these free practice tests. As you can see, there are all kinds of different certificates that they offer, and they offer some of the practice tests that you can look at in order to prepare or at least get an idea of what kind of questions to expect during A-plus exam certification. All right, guys, if you got one moment, please click the like button. I really appreciate it, and especially if you find this type of stuff useful. Thank you so much, and let's get into it. We're going to go over both of these free practice tests. And the first one is A plus core 220-1001. Uh, and then there is 1002. We're going to go through both of those. There are a total 10 questions. So not only will I provide you answers with some of the basic stuff, but also show you what you can do in order to prepare. So if you're looking at these practice tests, they're going to be the exact same thing as I'm looking at here. However, if you find a different resource for practice questions, uh, this is a way that I will show you on how to actually figure out how to answer these questions uh, by doing some research, of course. All right. Question number one. Which of the following devices provides the portability of a mobile phone and functionality of a laptop desktop? So we're looking for a device that provides portability like a mobile phone and also functionality of a laptop or a desktop, if you will. And then first uh, option is tablet. Second option is GPS unit. Third option is in C is e-reader. And then D is a last option here for a fitness monitor. Of course, we know that we're looking for something mobile, like a mobile phone, so something small. The first thing you think about is a small screen that you carry, and then, of course, something that works like a PC, right? And the first thing, of course, is tablet. That's the answer. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Question number two, a user brings in a smartphone for repair. The device is unable to send, receive calls, or connect to Wi-Fi. All applications on the device are working unless they require connectivity. Which of the following is most likely causing the problem? So keep in mind, the main issue here is there is no connectivity no matter what you do with a smartphone, right? So first option for A is airplane mode. And then the second option is tethering. And then third option, as in C, is disabled hotspot. And then D, as in VPN. So a lot of these things can be confusing uh, to somebody who's not familiar with computers and stuff like that, if you're brand new to it. But the key here is actually to look at the overall picture. Uh, so the issue here is unable to send and receive calls. So first of all, uh, that means that the signal, cell phone signal, is disabled, right? And you're also not able to connect to Wi-Fi. So that's another issue. And of course, all applications and devices are working unless they require connectivity. Connectivity being the key word here. So we got no send receive calls. You cannot connect to Wi-Fi, and there is no connectivity. So 
what is the first thing that kind of disables all of these things? And that would be airplane mode. Remember, whenever you get on an airplane, they say put in put your cell phone into an airplane mode, which disables all of these functions that we have mentioned. Um, tethering, uh, of course, that just allows your phone to be connected or allows your phone to serve as a hotspot or whatever uh, but that's not the answer and we got disabled hotspot we already know what the hotspot is and then vpn has nothing to do with this okay third question here a human resources manager requests wireless ap's to be set up for the office a server will manage the wireless settings and authorized devices should be able to access uh, confidential records over Wi-Fi. Uh, which of the following settings should be uh, should um, be configured to meet the requirements? So, what is wireless AP? So, wireless AP in this case, in this specific situation, is wireless access point, a uh, place where you would just connect your device to a Wi-Fi connection, right? As simple as that. And but the requirements for this are that server has to have the ability to wire, to manage wireless settings and authorized devices should be able to access confidential uh, records over Wi-Fi. So uh, we can't just, we have to put another layer of security is, is what I'm trying to get at and not just regular Wi-Fi because we're talking about the confidential information. So we're, in order to provide the correct answer, we have to think of what's another layer of of uh, uh, security we can uh, add to this Wi-Fi uh, connection in order to make it secure. All right, so here are the options for our configuration. Number A is WPA encryption, and then it's set up with UPnP and MAC filtering. So if you are not familiar uh, what WPA is, um, we can certainly Google it, and that's one way to do it, but you've probably seen it. It's just a type of encryption that's used for your password. So if we look at this, we can immediately see that this is uh, basically an acronym for Wi-Fi Protected Access. So it's a type of access um, or security access that dictates what kind of password you would use and there are different uh, security requirements depending on the level. If you're talking about just the regular WPA, that's the first version of it and uh, it has less requirements when it comes to security um, connect connection and the security um, certifications that are allowed over that network. And with the WPA2, it kind of elevates that to another level of security, meaning that it has to meet certain criterias in which makes that connection uh, more certified in a way uh, as in that it's more secure. So um, the password has to be a little bit stronger than usual as well. And then, of course, we can look up what the UPnP is. If we look up what the UPnP is, it says universal plug and play. So do we necessarily want universal plug and play when it comes to a connection that's going to carry, let's see here, confidential records? No, we don't. We don't necessarily want. We don't want that uh, because uh, we don't want to allow just random people to be able to just walk up and just plug in and play anything on this connection that we're talking about here. And then, of course, we get Mac filtering, and of course, we can Google that as well. Uh, Mac filtering, as it says here, it kind of says security method based on access control, and what it deals is that. Whenever you set up a connection, uh, for example, on Wi-Fi, it only allows the specific MAC addresses to connect. So that's a good thing to have. Um, if you want to set up MAC filtering, only those MAC addresses uh, will be allowed to connect to those connections. The way you would set this up is whenever you connect a certain device, you know this is a device that needs to be connected to this um, to this router, um, you can see it, the, its MAC address, and you can s click um, to add that MAC address to that, so that way, next time, um, but of course, you'd have to change the setting, you would have to turn on MAC filtering on later, uh, but when you, with the MAC filtering turned off, this is just a basic way of doing it at home, for example, you turn, make filtering is off, you let the devices connect, and then you turn on MAC filtering on, 
and make sure it has those MAC addresses for those specific computers um, copied over and has the record of it. So that way it doesn't allow anything else but besides those MAC addresses connected, meaning physical addresses of those components. And then we got the next one, which is WPA encryption. So again, WPA um, is just a basic Wi-Fi protected access, the early version iteration of it, um, and is not as secure as WPA2, but it's not necessarily bad either. It's just that it's less of a security and less uh, certified. And then again, we got universal plug and play, and then we got blacklisting. It is simply a list of computers or devices that you blacklist access, meaning that you won't allow these, um, you you block a certain uh, IPs and addresses and devices that will, they will, you will just prevent them from accessing this access point. Okay, and then we got third one, which is WPA encryption and, and infrastructure mode. And then we got also Mac filtering, so if we look at what the infrastructure mode, do we really need this? Infrastructure mode is an 802.11 network framework in which devices communicate with each other by first going through an access point. So there you go, access point. That's something that we should definitely consider as a possibility. And then, of course, we got the Mac filtering. And then for D, we got WPA2, infrastructure mode, and QoS. So what is QoS? We haven't talked about QoS Let's Google it, and it's a quality of server. It refers to any technology that manages the data, the traffic that reduces packet loss latency generator on the network. So we don't necessarily have to have this in this type of environment um, because this looks for data packets that are dropped to make sure that uh, all the manage uh, all the data that goes through over the network is. Uh, has very loss, very uh, low packet loss. So we're talking about quality of the network speed. And this is, we don't necessarily need to worry about this in a situation because we're not talking about constant um, data transfers when it comes to using this access port. These are just people who are gonna use it to just connect to the access port and maybe access the internet. And of course, they're going to share um, confidential records over Wi-Fi. All right. So let's, that was quite a bit to talk about, and uh, let's kind of get back to it and pick the one, the first one that, that, that we looked at. WPA encryption here, uh, that's fine, but do we want the universal plug and play? We don't want that. Mac filtering is cool, and but you know we don't need a universal plug and play, so we're going to say no on A. Number two, WPA encryption, uh, and again, universal plug and play, we don't need that, and then blacklisting. Blacklisting is not really going to make the difference. This is just mainly good for access points that are getting a lot of connection requests. And we're not. this is not going to be that. This is going to be probably centralized somewhere where you're not going to have a lot of people trying to connect to it. So we don't need number two or B here. And then we got WPA encryption under C, infrastructure mode, and MAC filtering. So, so far... This is the best option for us here. WPA, so it's going to be a basic um, uh, password encryption. It's still going to be secure enough where you still need to have, a, you know, a certain certain level of uh, password protection. And of course, we have MAC filtering is in the key uh, features here in order to allow connection. So we will have will only allow specific computers to be connected to this. Um, network to this network so this is very very safe to have turned on when it comes to um, accessing confidential records and only sharing it between things that are connected to this access port in this case mac filtering is very crucial uh, because um, we're going to only allow those specific mac addresses and specific devices and nothing else connect to this and of course we got that infrastructure mode which again is just a framework um, that just basically sets up our access point and so we definitely need that infrastructure mode and basic you know basic level of uh, password encryption that's fine and then the last one again we talked about this QoS as the last thing and we don't need the you know quality of service uh, protocol or setup running at all so the answer here um, should be and and most likely will be C and because it gives us all the things that we need and none of the things that we don't want okay all right question number four 
which of the following technologies can be used for wireless payments? So there should be a pretty, pretty s simple one. So we got NFC for A, we got Bluetooth, we got IR, and then we got LTE. So which of the following can be used for wireless payment? So what is NFC, right? You all know what NFC is. If we Google it, again, this is the way to do anything in case of a, uh, in case you're studying by yourself. You know, this is how you learn about these things. This is how you come across the correct answer. I know during the test itself, you won't be able to do this, but if you're practicing, this is what you exactly have to do. So it's a near field uh, communication, right? That's what it stands for. NFC is a communication protocol between two electronic devices over a, a distance, four centimeters or one and a half inches or less. And NFC offers a low speed connection with simple setup that could be used to bootstrap capable uh, or capable, uh, bootstrap more capable wireless connections. So NFC, right? It's something that you just simply scan. You just kind of pass it over something. Think of um, those um, the way you can pay for things using your phone, right? You just kind of flash your phone. Um, you can also have NFC on your card. You just flash the card, and that's a wireless way of, of payment. Um, and then we got Bluetooth. We all know what Bluetooth is, but is it really good for wireless payments? Uh, not, not really. And then we got IR, which is infrared. And if we, if we look at that, Infrared networks enables computing devices to send and receive data wirelessly within a short range using infrared beams. How reliable is this, guys? And I mean, you can have it. You know, the, like think of just like your, uh, uh, like whenever you're using your remote on your computer. That's what infrared device is. You know, you flash it and you have to point it exactly that way. And I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's certainly not secure. And then we got LTE. We all know what LTE is. It's on your phone, right? Um, it's just an evolved version of 4G um, internet connection. So, logically speaking, what's, what, what, which one of these things apply the most when it comes to receiving um, wireless payments? And that would be NFC, right? And if we go back to it, we can kind of see that, again, it is a near-field communication type of protocol that you literally just flash something or put your card against something it scans it and it, it can be done with your phone or just a credit card that has a built-in nfc chip in it uh, by the way this is how people steal credit card information sometimes um they, if they're near enough let's say you go on an airplane we're going to talk about airplane again and you have your credit card in your wallet next to you and a person with an nfc reader has the pocket on the same side as your pocket, where they're sitting next to you, uh, <laughs> they can clone that. Um, they can scan it and clone your credit card. Uh, you know there are and there are uh, specific wallets that can protect from that. Anyways, moving on to question number five: Which of the following connector types can be plugged into a device, both right side up and upside down? So right side up and upside down. <laughs> Uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, first one is a USB. U then the second one is USB-C. Then we got mini USB. And then we got a micro USB. So it's something that basically plugs in either way you turn it. USB, we know that USB is not going to work. Because if you look at the USB, it only goes one way. Uh, it only goes one way. And uh, here it is. There's actually a pretty good picture of it. Uh, let me see if I can get a better angle of it. There it is. See, you only have, can only put it one way. I don't know why. I don't even have to explain to you guys. So that's that's not it. Uh, let me close some of these windows here. So it's not USB, right? We looked at that. And then we got USB-C. That's what that is. I know it's th this is the one, right? Uh, we know that this will work, but only from one end. So if we look at the USB-C, uh, that goes either way. Either way, you flip it, turn it, it's going to work. But that's only on the one end of it. Well, it depends. If it's just a USB like this and it goes to regular USB 3.0 in this case, well, it says 3.1, whatever. It's 3.0. The, the blue is 3.0. Oh, 3.1 um, is actually orange in most cases. Anyways, 
this end of it will um, go either way. So whichever you, way you turn it, um, it will fit. And then we got mini USB. If you search mini USB, this is the predecessor of it. Mini USB. This is this came before mini USB. Mini USB is like the first uh, change of a USB, as in something that you would plug into your phone, for example, to change, to charge, for example. And this is what it looks like. This only goes certain way, so it's not that. And then we got micro USB, which is which came after mini USB, which is just thinner, but still you have to face it a very specific way in order to plug in into your device, and that's how it looks like. Uh, no, that's uh, that's the other one. Here's the mini. Anyways, guys, the answer is USB-C, which is the most recent one, and that's the answer, USB-C. Question number six, a user, a user wants to build a computer with high-end CPU, plenty of RAM, and high-end graphics card for online gaming. All right. The user wants to verify the graphics card is compatible with motherboard. Which of the following connector types would user most likely utilize to connect the video card to the motherboard? So this is a basic, uh, basic uh, hardware stuff. Uh, and uh, let's see. The first option is, and we're and the key here is most likely, most likely. We got a PCIe, so PCI Express. We got ISA, and then we got AGP, and then we got USB. All right, we already know what the USB is, and I'm not saying it's impossible. There are GPUs that can be connected over USB, but it's incredibly slow and very impractical. Um, usually, it would just be a dongle that lets you push a display, um, like connect to an external display. That's it. AGP um, is the predecessor of PCIe, not PCI. PCI slot is something totally different than PCIe. This is AGP, Accelerated Graphics Port. If we if we look at this, um, let's see, AGP port. Accelerated Graphics Port is designed to high speed for designed for high speed a point to point channel of attaching video card. So AGP used to be the main way of plugging into your uh, GPU into it, but that's outdated and old technology, and it looked like this. Um, actually like this. It's been a while. Maybe this. Man, it's been a long time. It's probably this one. Anyways, uh, all of these very look very similar. PCI, it's all of these white ones, the regular white ones that you see here, regular white slots. Those are the PCIs. And then we got ISA, which is old, old technology. And I'm not saying that GPUs weren't used, it, but this is so old. And the... Uh, the, the most likely kind of just falls out of it. The idea of being that most likely just kind of falls away and it, it just disappears. It's a huge, huge slot. And you can see here that it's a quite a bit bigger uh, than just a regular PCI slot, which is the one right here. Uh, PCI is, is still used in some cases, maybe, but I think, I, I think it's just gone from new stuff, from new hardware, just a regular PCI slot nowadays. Um, you may still see it occasionally, but the answer is PCIe. PCIe uh, is, and this is how they look like. It's just this is the most common one. This is what you would see on a lot of, uh, you know, computers nowadays. It's just usually it's two of them in case you want to have more than one uh, GPU connected for a Crossfire or SLI or whatever. Basically, if you want to connect more than one GPU, and the biggest tell, uh, biggest uh, tell, I should say, uh, that differentiate this from regular PCI slot is that it's flipped differently. You can see how it's flipped uh, positioning that way. This little notch is actually over here as opposed to regular PCI slot. So the card is uh, inserted slightly different. Okay, so that's the most common um, GPU uh, slot for a high-end graphics card especially. And if it being a high-end graphic card, do you really want to try to use AGP or or just regular PCI? I mean, it's just, you know, it's it's be ridiculous nowadays. All right. 
Uh, by the way, different versions of PCI are uh, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, and they're even testing 6.0 right now, although it's not, you can't find that anywhere. It's pretty, well, what's, the newest one is 4.0 that's available to people to buy, I think. Uh, 5.0, not yet, but they were also working on 6.0. Question number seven. Which of the following peripheral types is most likely to be used to input actions into a PC? So an input device. We're looking for something that's input. You know, whatever you use to control the, the PC itself. So we got webcam. We got mouse. We got monitor. And we got optical drive. And then it says, which of the following peripheral types is most likely to be used to input actions into a PC. So action, anything that I do. I'm, I'm doing an action right now, so that's the thing here. And I'm sure you guys already know that mouse would be the most likely input device here. Okay. Question number eight. Which of the following resource types would be the best suited for saving photographs from a mobile device with a limited onboard storage? So we're looking for a resource type that will be best suited for saving photographs from a mobile device with a limited onboard storage. So we're offloading some data for off of just you know your cell phone, I guess, for example. And we got first option, which is cloud file service. We got B virtual desktop. We got off-site email. And then we got resource pooling. Uh, the first option here, we got cloud, cloud file services. If we Google this, we all know what that is. For example, if I go over here and then we got Google Drive, that's cloud file service. Anything that you can, any place where you can upload things to and just have it like a storage. Use that cloud-based storage. That's all it is. Virtual desktop. If you don't know what the virtual desktop is, it's just a virtual desktop, as in a virtual computer on inside of your computer. That's ridiculous. You don't want why would you want to do that? So that's not it. Off-site email. This is totally unrelated. No. It's just simple no. <laughs> resource pooling. All right, let's see what resource. This is not a common thing that people do. Resource pooling. Uh, is it in term in IT used in cloud computing environments to describe a situation which prior provider uh, which providers serve multiple clients, customer, and tenants with, with provisional and scalable device services? No. We already know that's in it. So what's the most likely here? Cloud file service. So that's the answer. Cloud file service. I'm just going to click a button, and it's going to automatically put my stuff in, for example, the, the you know Google Drive or whatever the Apple alternative is, for example. All right. Question number nine. An engineer's workstation experiences a BSOD. If you don't know what BSOD is, it's blue screen of death, right? This is what it looks like. You get this. Okay. Whenever loading very large CAD files to modify. Uh, CAD files... These are design files. These are 3D model files, okay? Used for just for 3D modeling, but it can also be used for like product development. Anyways, it's 3D models. Which of the following troubleshooting steps should technician take to isolate the issue? So, engineer gets blue screen of death. Blue screen of death means a lot of times, this is what it looks like. The computer crashes and it says it's dumping memory, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times and most of the time, it's a hardware issue, right? Something happened with the hardware most of the time. And then here, here are the first option. Install additional RAM rated at the fastest speed the motherboard will support. So do we really think that blue screen of death is caused because there's lack of RAM? And it needs we need to set it the fastest speed that the motherboard will support. I'd say it's it's irrelevant. Uh, computer didn't crash because it didn't have enough RAM. 
if it didn't have enough RAM, all it would happen it would just take longer to load very large files. That's all it would happen. Uh, B, perform a hard drive scan to identify and lock out any bad sectors from use. So, they're basically saying here, do a defrag on a, on a computer. And that's what defrag does. Defrag basically, you know, locks out any bad sectors from use. And, you know, this, this could happen. This could help speed up the computer, but it wouldn't necessarily fix blue screen of death at all. And C, run a memory test to verify all memory addresses can be reliably written to and read from. Now, here, here we're getting into something here. Run a memory test to verify all memory addresses can be reliably written and read from. Reliably written and read from. So what we're doing here, we're moving, we're loading large files. And whenever you're loading something, whenever you do anything on a computer, your computer has to write to RAM, to all memory, has to write to it, memory addresses, which is your RAM, um, or, or hard drive, and it has to reliably write to it and reliably read from. So if it can't reliably read from, here we get into hardware part of it, chances are we could get blue screen of death, okay? Keep that in mind. Now let's look at D. Increase the size of the swap file to ensure adequate virtual memory is available. Again, if the issue is not enough RAM, then you could increase the size of the swap file, which is the virtual memory. However, doing any of these things would still not cause blue screen of death. Okay? Things would run slower if you don't have enough RAM and you know, if you can kill your computer by leaving a certain amount of virtual memory. So if you run out of RAM, your computer can crash. There's no doubt about that. But increasing the virtual memory uh, will, all it does is just creates virtual RAM and it gives you the ability to just process something that requires more RAM. But, but virtual memory is automatically set by the operating system unless you tell it otherwise. It's automatically set. And your operating system will automatically adjust this. You don't have to do any of this. The answer here should be uh, run a memory test to verify all memory addresses can be reliably written and read from. Okay? All right. And then finally, we got question number 10. A user is enabled to browse internet websites. So internet websites are not working. There's an issue with the internet. A technician runs ipconfig and sees the following output. So you would do ipconfig uh, command. For example, ipconfig forward slash all. This is the result he gets. You get an IP address, which is, looks like to be a local address. Starts with 192. Um, if you guys can probably see that same thing on your computer. And then we get subnet mask, which is the default subnet mask, which is normal. And then we get default gateway, which is the router itself, providing you a gateway to the outside, which is the internet. So this is the basically the IP address of your router. or And through this is how you get to the internet, which, again, is the location or the IP address for the router itself. And then the technician pings the gateway and gets a reply. So... Whenever somebody, whenever a technician types in ping 192, ping space 192.168.0.54, they get a reply. That means it's working. That means the router itself is working. The gateway itself is working. And then technician then pings the external IP address and also gets a reply. So somehow this technician uh, figures out what the internet IP address for a website. For example, let's say it's Google. All he does is types in in command line, types in ping space google.com and gets an IP address. And then he takes that IP address and then he pings it and he gets a reply. That means he can reach it. That means the website itself is reachable, but we are bypassing uh, DNS, which is the main name system, which routes google.com uh, um, to that IP address that he just pinged. Meaning that google.com itself goes to a specific IP address. 
and you can get to that specific IP address by typing in the address directly, but when you type in google.com, it doesn't work. Uh, for it to work, uh, DNS or the domain name system is used for that. It basically takes your domain name, which is google.com, and then it tells your computer, okay, google.com is actually located over here, and then it understands that google.com is the domain name for it. Okay, here are the options for our answers. Uh, number one is netstat-nbt. So what is netstat command? I mean, we can look at it in a couple of different ways. Netstat is used in Windows as well as in Linux. Here's an example of a Linux uh, utilization of netstat commands. It gives you basically information on TCP IP. And in this case, this is not something we would do as technician. This is more of an advanced stuff, for example, for network administrators. Uh, but it's also used by Microsoft itself. So it is used within Windows if you, for example, use any of these switches or commands, if you will. Um, we will give you basic, for example, information, for example, netstat uh, dash a displays all active TCP connections and TCP UDP ports at which your computer is uh, listening to. And you can do things like display Ethernet statistics, display active TCP connections. But this is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about from one point to another, in which case uh, we're mostly worried about not being able to reach a specific website by using just the domain name. In this example, again, google.com. You're not going to be using it. And then we got NetSH space INT. IP reset. Well, let's see what that is. So to reset TCP IP stack in Windows 10. All right. Well, let's look at what's relevant when it comes to that. It's Microsoft. Here we go. We're talking about NetShell utility. You know, this is something that network administrator would be using to remotely reset TCP IP of a device. As a technician, you think I'm going to have access to this? No. And then we got IP config forward slash flush DNS. So this is the flush DNS command, which flushes DNS or resets the DNS record on your local computer or refreshes it, if you will. We talked about DNS, didn't we? This seems very relevant. And then last thing, we got NS lookup under D. So what does the NS lookup does? Well, let's, let's do a Google on this as well. NS lookup. Let me see if I can get a, here we go, Microsoft document, sure. Uh, displays information you can use to diagnose the main name system infrastructure. So now we're getting into DNS infrastructure. Uh, you, you know, th this is something that's used by network administrators uh, when it comes to troubleshooting these type of different type of things. As a technician, you, you're not going to be doing this. The best thing you can do here is do IP config forward slash flush DNS because we know that this computer can reach the IP address for this domain and hopefully by updating DNS locally um, next time you type in google.com it's going to fix it so the answer should be C IP config forward slash flush DNS alright guys that took a little bit longer than I expected uh, I will do a second part as well because remember there are two of these practice tests here is the second one 220-1002 uh, and if enough people are interested in this, I will definitely do a follow-up and do the other one. Uh, but for now, I'm just seeing if enough people are actually interested in this type of stuff. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because lately there really haven't, hasn't been that much interest uh, in my videos, uh, which is honestly a bit confusing to me. But that's okay. <laughs> Not a problem. I understand people got other things to do uh, or other things to watch as well. So... Uh, but yeah, let me know if you like this. Uh, leave a comment. I'd really appreciate to know if you want to see the second part of this. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. Today's video, it's all about a practice test for CompTIA A Plus Core 220-1002. Previous video, we did 1001. So if you want to check that out, it's also a good one, and it leads into this one. Today, we're concentrating on this one, 1002 Core A Plus Action. So what's the point of this video? Just like I mentioned in my previous video, is to prepare you for A Plus test. These are free, completely free practice questions. Uh, there are also answers uh, from CompTIA itself. You can see that this is directly from CompTIA. So we're going to go through it. We're going to talk about each question 
and I'm going to show you how to research every little thing that you may not be familiar with. For example, things that have acronyms, command lines, all these things that are not very common knowledge. I'll show you how to research that. It's very simple. But I will also go through each question and we're going to answer it together. So this is a really good learning practice and it's completely free. All right, question number one. Which of the following is the best use case scenario for a Chrome OS device? So you guys know what Chrome OS device? Chrome OS device is a laptop. A laptop that runs Chrome operating system. Very simple, usually very cheap laptop. But they're good for people that just need to do some data um, entries or like, you know, some basic college stuff that you need to use it in browsing internet. It's pretty good for that stuff. And if you use Google Apps, it's also really good for that. So here's an example of that. I just did a really good or really uh, quick, I should say, uh, search for it. And you can see that they're pretty cheap. I guess they can get pretty pricey too. But anyways, it's a laptop and it has a Chrome operating system on it. So what's a good a best use case scenario for that? They are very simple. Keep in mind, usually very simple. Number one, or I should say A, it's web browsing and email. Then we got B, photo and video editing. Then we got C, application development. And we got D, database queries. So again, this is a very simple, not necessarily super fast laptop. So what's the most common thing that we can use that for? And that's web browsing and email, right? We know for sure that that's, uh, you know, that's something we can use it for because Pretty much every computer can do this unless it's something ancient, right? Something ancient with like Pentium 1 or something. <laughs> and then we got B, photo and video editing. For photo and video editing, well, for photo, you can probably get away with it for a little bit. But for video editing, you definitely need something that's going to be a lot faster. So B is out of the question. We got C, application development. Uh, not necessarily, because we could be talking about a HTML, which could be fine, but if we're talking about application development as in 3D design or uh, game engines or stuff like that, this thing ain't going to handle it. So C is out of it. Database queries. Database queries uh, can also uh, demand a lot of processing power, in which case uh, you would query databases, which you know can take some processing power as well. So chances are for this are very unlikely. Most people that buy Chrome OS device is for web browsing and email. Now, I just want to mention real quick, Chrome OS device can't is not just a laptop, but it can also be like, you know, those things you plug into your uh, TV to make it a smart TV. So it's like a, you know, something that's going to make your TV smart, I guess. I, mean, I don't know how else to explain it. Anyways, the answer is web browsing and email. Okay. Question number two, a technician implements a group policy change and needs to apply it without restarting the workstation. Which of the following commands can be used to accomplish this task? So what is a group policy? Group policy is something that affects a group at a domain level. So let's say you work for a company and you do tech support. Your login ID for that domain or for that computer belongs to a certain group, right? So if you make a change to a group policy, we have to keep that in mind, okay? And then we're going to go through we're going to go through these you know answers and see what which applies the best. For A, we have a command that says GP update, and for B, we got GP result. And for that netstat command, these are all commands, by the way. If you don't know what these are. These are CMD commands. And then D, we got D-I-S-M. DISM. <laughs> it's a DISM. That's kind of funny. Anyways, so let's let's Google what GP update does. Okay? So this is how you research if you've never heard of it. We're gonna pretend like we don't know anything about this stuff. This is the first time I are seeing it. And some of you are. There's nothing wrong with that. So this is how you do the search. We're just gonna right-click it. And search Google for GP update and see what that does. All right. Here we go. Microsoft document for GP update. Let's see. What is that? That we're going to click on it. Microsoft being the source for it. So it should be good for it. I apologize. My internet is kind of slow. I'm actually streaming at the same time. So it's taking up a lot of my bandwidth. I apologize for that. Anyways, here we go. GP update. What does GP update do? And here it is. GP update. And here we'll see what it says here. 
updates group policy settings. Well, let's see what the question is again. A technician implements a group policy change and needs to apply it without restarting the workstation. We go back here, GP update command updates group policy settings. So here's our answer. Okay, now <laughs> we know the answer is GP update at this point. It's kind of weird that both of them are A, one and two. Uh, the answer to both of them is A. It's kind of weird. Anyways, let's see what the GP result is too. We're going to Google that as well. GP result. All right, same type of source. It's Microsoft Doc. Microsoft Docs. And here it is, GP result. What does that do? What does that do? What does that do? What does that do? I'm sorry, guys. Displays the results. Uh, the displays, displays the result set of policy information for a remote user and computer, right? So this command, what it does is simply gives you information for a remote user uh, and a computer. And if you look at that, and here are examples on how to use it, um, you can target specific name or a system. And so basically you would type in, um, where is it, the GP result, space forward slash S, and then you specify a system or a computer name or the IP address for that, and then it will display results for that. All right, now let's look at the Netstat. What is Netstat? Google it. Here we go, Netstat. We had Netstat on a previous um, previous uh, session that we did. And here we go. Netstat means this plays active TCP connections ports on which computer is listening. Ethernet statistics, the IP writing table. So it displays the TCP um, statistics or information for a specified computer. So the way you use it is just simply type in Netstat in command line and type in, for example, A to display all active connections. If you want to do something else, you would use these other switches here. And accordingly, you would display all these specific uh, things that you need, you know, whatever you need. So if you want to go over this as well, I highly recommend it if you want to learn a little bit more about networking. Very good stuff. All right, let's see what DISM is. DISM. So DISM, uh, let's see, Windows Central, I'm trying to figure out, let's do this one, Docs. I like to go to Docs. All right. So this um, is Deployment Image Servicing, right? Servicing and Management. So this is specifically used to deploy images or software um, that's associated with that. So the way um, you can use this is to basically push uh, Windows uh, operating system installation and you can put it like in, in, in a different uh, format. You can mount that. You can simply just set it up so it's booting from the network. It's just a way to install an operating system. And DISM here, Deployment Image Servicing and Management, allows you to do that in different ways. So instead of just putting in the CD in your computer and installing image or USB, uh, this gives you different options where you can just, you know, do it differently, basically. Uh, but yeah, it's a deployment um, tool that allows you to deploy these operating system images in just different way and in a more organized way that's used by IT. Okay, so our answer is GP update. Uh, we're going to move on from that. All right, question number three. An end user has requested assistance from the help desk to install new video editing software, okay? The user wants to create several .wma files. Which of the following should the help desk consider before installing the software? Okay, so for number one, or I should say A, um, it's disk space. For B, we got network connection. And for C, we got aspect ratio and D, power supply. So let's think about this here. They want to install video editing software. And the user wants to create several WMA files. Uh, we should know by now that WMA files are just a type of video file, which is Windows Media uh, type of file. Um, there is that. If you want to Google it, you certainly can, but it's a video file. And then we know what video is, and we know what editing software is. So it's a piece of software that allows you to make changes to videos like I'm using right now, basically. 
um, the way I'm editing this video in, in the way. And for that, we kind of touched about talked about this when we talked about this Chrome OS device and how these things are not usually very fast and they're not very good at doing heavy loads, if you will. Uh, of uh, that didn't sound right. They're not very good at processing uh, things that require a lot of uh, uh, heavy lifting. I should say, not heavy loads. That didn't sound right. <laughs> so it's video editing software. We need something that's going to be fast and something that's going to need a lot of that's going to use a lot of processing power. So first thing we need the, for A, it says disk space. Chances are you'd have enough disk space. You don't necessarily need a whole lot of disk space. You do need disk space for video editing storage, um, which, which is fine. I guess that's something to consider. So you do need it in that sense. Uh, but in my opinion, for video editing software, you need a lot of CPU cores and RAM. But let's see if they'll even talk about that. Maybe we'll have to come back to this, and maybe that will be the answer. We'll see. You definitely need that space, but again, not for processing necessarily, but for storage. Because WMA files can be really large. Any video files can be large, but WMAs are, you know, particularly large. And the B, got network connection. See, this is where we get into a point where I could argue that you can set up um, network connection that shares processing bandwidth between two different computers that will process heavy video editing, um, heavy video editing um, software. So, okay, let me give you an example here. If you're, for example, doing special effects for a company, right? Let's say these people are doing special effects. Let's say they're making a new Marvel movie or something. Let me tell you, like even 10 seconds of that movie that has all those special effects and all those 3D things can take days to process on a regular computer. You can set up a network connection between two different computers that will distribute the load amongst them. Um, this is also, what's it called uh, when you have multiple servers? Um, uh, man, I'll, I'll have to convert. Anyways, uh, basically you're distributing the load between two, two, two or more servers or computers, and for that you need network connection. Okay, But in this case, they're probably not talking about that. We're talking about a end user, just the end user. But then again, you know, we can get really into detail this. Uh, the reason I'm not talking about it, about it so much is because I want you to know there are these things that exist, um, not necessarily the correct answer here. Aspect ratio, you know what the aspect ratio. For example, this like a square box. If you're looking at the square box video, that's four by three. If you're looking at the widescreen uh, video, like this video here, it's widescreen, that's 16 by nine. We, what we don't we don't necessarily have to worry about this. The user is going to deal with this on their own. You know, it's not something we have to worry about. And then we got power supply. Eh, eh you know, power supply. Your your computer is going to work. You 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 have the correct power supply. That's nothing to worry about. So I guess in the end we're going to have to, since we have no other choice. I wish we had CPU and RAM on here, or maybe even a GPU. Uh, on top of that, uh, like a workstation type of setup, uh, I guess the only thing that applies here is disk space. So in this case, we're going to pick this space simply because we need a lot of space to store these WMA files. That's the only reason, to be honest. Okay. All right, moving on to number four. <clears throat> okay, so number four. Oh, uh, I just remembered. So distributing... Uh, workload between multiple uh, computers on a network is called um, clustering. That's what it's called. Okay, you can have a server set up in a clustering mode where they are distributing the the workload equally. Okay, question number four: A new security requirement for logging onto a company network has been put in place for all users. So it's a security thing, and all the users will be. Uh, you know, we're going to be, they're going to be affected by it, by this new security requirement uh, for logging onto a computer network, okay? So the, the, the security is stricter now. Which of the following should a system admin enforce to be the best, to, to best meet the requirements? Select two. So this work of implementing new security requirements for everybody that logs in to computer or to, to their computers, I guess, essentially to a network uh, has been in place for all users. 
So in this case, this is applying to everybody that logs into their computer. Whether they realize it or not, they're logging into computer a company. So that's what they mean. They're just logging into their computers. And because all the computers are connected to the network, they're logging into the network, right? Which of the following should a system administrator, in this case you, let's say you're the system administrator, you got the full control of what's going on. You're going to implement this in force to best meet the requirements. So what, what are two things here that we have to change as a system admin to make sure that the system requirements are met? Okay, number one, or I should say A. I keep always saying number one. I'm used to seeing one, two, three, four, or whatever for answers, but... I guess it's um, letters here. A, strong passwords. Okay, not bad. We got folder redirection. Uh, C, we got C, email filtering. We got D, multi-factor authentication. E, we got remote desktop. And then F, we got anti-malware. All right, so we can talk about all these things without necessarily Googling anything. Um, I, I may have to do it on some of them, but I'll, I should be able to just, um, I think it'll be simpler just for me to uh, just kind of talk about it. So A, strong passwords. We know this is a good idea, right? We're going to have to change the requirement as a system administrator. What we're going to do, we're going to make it so that your password is going to be have to be more complex. That's always a good thing. So that's one of the things we should probably pick. we got folder redirection. What's folder redirection? Folder redirection is every time a user logs in to their computer, all of these users, whenever they log into their computer, their desktop, um, usually, just for example, to keep it simple, your desktop um, receives certain amount of data or certain files automatically, automatically to their desktop. So that's what that's what's called folder redirection. Uh, they will basically get specific folder push to them every time they log into their computer. Okay, that's what folder redirection is in a nutshell. And then we got email filtering. Um, what this does, uh, it emails, it filters emails. So it's like a spam filter. Man, you know how you have spam in your email? That's what this is. So we can filtering. That's not, that's not bad either, you know. Uh, but we're talking about Logging into the computer co company's network or their computers, right? And then we got multi factor authentication. Aha, we know what multi factor authentication is. You surely probably registered for an account somewhere, and that's like a bank account, for example, or anything that requires, for example, your phone to, for example, be a secondary um, authenticator. So let's say you have a password, you log in your bank account, you type in your password, right? Your, your login ID and your password, and the bank is like, well, we got to make sure that you are you. So we're going to make you uh, type in our, our code that we send to your phone, to your phone. That's a multi-factor authentication, right? There are more, more than one factors uh, in order to actually log into something, not just password. And that's just an example. It could be an email. Um, it could be a some kind of token, uh, Macy, meaning as in, uh, what they use in VPN, it's a randomly generated code that you have to type in. Uh, anyways, that's what multi-factor authentication is. Just multiple ways. Uh, you have to type in multiple things in order to log into something. Um, in this case, comp company network or their computers. And that's definitely a good thing. And we got remote desktop. Remote desktop is simply a way to access a remote desktop, a remote computer. This is irrelevant to this. Technically speaking, you can set up a some kind of weird security thing uh, where they want you to use a remote desktop, um, especially if it's like a dummy terminal, meaning it's just a basic computer that you'll log in. And to actually access anything on the company's network, you have to initiate remote desktop to get to it. Chances are they're not talking about this here. They're talking about specifically logging to company network. It, it, again, it, technically, you can set up something like this where your main computer is actually a remote desktop, but chances are that's not going to be a setup like this in, in majority of businesses. And then we got anti-malware. We know this, what this is, anti-malware. You know, like SpyBot or... Um, you know, like, what's what's some popular, like McAfee, ImmuNet, 
whatever, your Windows antivirus, anti-malware, or whatever. You guys know what that is, right? So what's the most likely two things that you could uh, you should do as a system administrator to um, justify or not justify, to basically implement new security requirements for logging into computer network? And uh, yeah, so we're going to pick strong passwords, and we're going to type in Multi, we're gonna type in. We're gonna use multi-factor authentication because we're strictly talking about login here, logging in on to company network, and those are two things that are most related to this. Okay, moving on. Question number five. Let me take a sip of water. Sorry. Mm. Oh, okay. My my throat was getting dry. Question number five. Which of the following password choices increases chance that a brute force attack will succeed so brute force attack okay well let's we're going to see what brute brute force attack is here in a moment but let's see what options we have so we got a dictionary words we got b special characters we got c long passwords and d we got capital letters now i know most of you already know what the answer is but look at look at what the brute, brute force attack is Brute force attack. I'm going to Google it. Okay. So, brute force attack. Brute force attack. So, basically what it is, it's a computer that strictly tries to use many combinations of words or letters to basically crack a password. So, let's say you go to a website and you try to log in and your password is something simple. Let's say a banana. One, two, three. The brute force attack, the first thing they're going to do is go through most common words. And banana is definitely one of them. So they're going to try to one of those words uh, first. And they're going to try to brute force their way into your account by trying to type in banana123. But first they're going to start with banana, banana1, banana2, banana3, banana4, banana5. Okay. That's what brute force attack is. A really <laughs> simple answer. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let me talk about this here just a little bit more. Yeah, that's what brute force attack is. They try basically all kinds of different passwords to log in. But first thing they're going to do, they're going to try to use some simple passwords, okay? They're going to simple words, simple uh, numbers, combinations, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, stuff like that. But for that, they use computers that are very, very fast. Sometimes they can set up virtual machines that are very, very fast because when you go to cloud computing, you can, you can get a hold of a lot of processing power. And that's what that is. Okay, knowing that, knowing that, that now, now that we know what brute force attack is, let's look at this again. Number A or number A? Uh, answer A, dictionary words, right? We just talked about this. They're going to definitely try to use dictionary words first because they're the, you know, these are the words that people use normally. Special characters. We all know what special character is, like asterisks, uh, you know, um, commas, all these things, um, uh, whatever, umlaut. Uh, those are all special characters. Uh, those are a lot harder to guess, you know. Instead of being banana123, you can type in uh, banana and instead of a type in at sign right that's a special character that's a lot harder to guess than well okay it, it will try at some point to use that but if you do banana banana at sign and then instead of one you type in umlaut or you type in you know comma question mark uh, exclamation mark then it's gonna be a lot harder to guess instead of just banana okay and then we got long passwords the long passwords are definitely always good. They take longer to crack because brute force attack, it's going to start from very beginning. It's going to start with one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And after it goes through all the numbers, it's going to go through the dictionary. It's going to start the dictionary. You know, they're going to do banana, banana one, two, but then they're going to try also apple, apple one. You know, so long passwords is definitely going to make it take a lot longer because brute force attacks are. Uh, they're just going to keep trying until they can get through. And then we got capital letters. Once you add uh, capital letters into a password, it complicates things. So by the time it gets to the capital letters, so let's say you do banana, 
one, two, three, but you make N a capital, for it to actually get to that point, it's going to take a lot longer. So it's going to go first through banana, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then go through, you know, they're going to try to first B as a capital, and then they're going to try A, and they're going to try, you know, N as a capital, but then they don't know which combination of those things. So uh, <laughs> this will reduce the chance of a brute force success brute force attack to succeed. So the question again is, which of the following password choices increases increases the chance that the brute force attack will succeed? Dictionary words. Don't use dictionary words. Okay? Combination of letters, numbers, and special characters and try to make it long is also good. But even if it's like a five character uh, password, or let's say I think usually requirements are eight minimum. Um, as long as you have a combination of letters, capital letters, and just make a complex password, guys. <laughs> Brute first will, you know, figure out that you typed in banana one two three. That's that's the moral of the of the of the question there. Question number six. A user connects a printer to a workstation. All right. As the printer drivers are installed, an error message appears. Okay, that's not good. The default drivers appear to be incompatible with the OS. Okay, so the drivers are not working. Which of the following should a technician use first to troubleshoot the problem? What is the first thing you should do when you have a default driver that appears to be incompatible with the OS? It's not working. The driver is not working for this printer. Okay? A, services. Should we look at the services when a technician uses the first uh, what's the first thing you should do is look at the services. You guys know what services are? Here are the services. Look, this is services specifically for my login. These are not system services, but these are services for my login. Should we look at this to fix the printer? That, I, that wouldn't be my first thing to look at, just personally. Then we got a device manager. Okay, we're going to type in device manager. Here we go. This is device manager. Would a printer be showing up here? Yeah, possibly. We got programs and features. We know what programs and features. All it does, it has programs installed on it and features of the Windows. Is that related to the printer? No. And we got task manager. We got task manager. Here we go. This is the task manager. All right, this is the task manager. And I'm assuming they mean task manager as in, you know, like the first thing that you see processes. So let's look at it again. A user connects to your print, connects the printer to workstation. As the printer drivers are installed, an error message appears. It says the default driver appears to be incompatible with the OS. Which of the following should the technician use first to troubleshoot the problem? So we cannot install the driver to begin with. What should we do here? What's the main problem here? Here's a task manager, then what? Here are the services, then what? What am I what am I looking for? Okay? One thing that can be a possibility, but in our case it's not happening, is that the service for the printer, also known as print spooler, is not enabled. And yes, that would be in services, but not in this services. It would be in the system services. I'll show you. In system services here, if you go to print spooler down here, here it is, print spooler, it's running. If this was disabled like this, then no printers would even attempt to install whatsoever. Okay? So I'm going to bring it back because I don't want it to disabled. Okay? That's the only reason you would look at services. Task manager, for what? Why would we be looking at task manager? What's here? This is just things that are processing in the background. There's no printer running in the background. Okay? That's, that's out of the question. Progress and features, these are programs. It's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the printer. And then again, we just looked at task manager again. And just, let's go back to the device manager, right? What can you find in a device manager? Well, you can find the list of all the things that are installed, all the devices that are installed on your computer, including a printer. Unfortunately, I don't have a printer installed here, 
But you can see there is this thing, print queues. These are just the basic, uh, like, these are not real printers. Uh, this is just a converter, but it shows up like a printer. But you can go in here and just update driver, properties, install, uninstall. So that's the only thing that's relevant here, and that's what we're going to pick. So be device manager. We're going to go through it and see if we can reinstall and install printer properly, because that's the first thing as a technician should do. Look at the device, because we're installing a device. All right, guys, let's move on to question number seven. Joe, I know it, Joe. A user forgets his password and was unable to log in into workstation. Oh, no, Joe. Joe remembers the password later, but he's still unable to log in. Aha. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the issue? His password later, but he still can't log in. What's going on, guys? <laughs> oh, okay. All right, we got A, reset account. We got B, uh, delete deleted account. We got C, locked account. We got D, limited user account. And we got E, unprovisioned account. Okay? So we got Joe again. A user. He's somebody who's using a computer, forgets his password, and is unable to log into workstation. And then he remembers it later, but then he still can't log in. What's going on, man? Like, imagine you're talking to him. It's like, Joe, okay, you can't log in. You don't remember your password. He's like, no. And then, like, 10 minutes, he keeps trying it, right? He keeps trying his, the, the, whatever he thinks the password is. He keeps typing it. He keeps typing it. Type, 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 type. He tries, like, 10 different times. And then he's like, Oh, I remember it now. And he types it in, still not a login. What, what's going on? <laughs> he, he remembered the password. That's the correct password. Uh, <laughs> so the correct answer is, I'm going to tell you, it's a locked account. Because there's a limit of how many times you can try it. How many times you can try is usually like three to five times. It's usually three, but I've seen it up to five times. Depends on what the system administrator sets it up to. But I think it's three times by default for everybody. So three times, the fourth time, it's going to lock your account for trying too many times. Usually when you wait like 15 minutes, it will unlock itself. So the account is locked. You have to go to Active Directory and unlock his account. Let's go back to the uh, answer number A, which is reset account. We don't need to reset the account. That's, this is irrelevant. There's nothing to reset. Uh, that we got deleted account. No. Chances are... This is somebody who's been using the computer. They work for the company. Why would anybody delete their account? That's very unlikely. And then we got the limited user account. What? No, this is ridiculous. Even if it was a limited user account, uh, you'd still have, you'd still be able to log in, right? That doesn't make any sense. And then we got unprovisioned account, meaning that an account that hasn't been set up properly in Active Directory, all right? Guys, if you want to know what Active Directory is, I'm not going to Google it, but I do have videos on that. So if you want to check those out, they're good videos and shows you how to do this exactly, all of this stuff, okay? So the answer is locked account because he tried way too many times. So if you go in into Active Directory, you can unlock him so he doesn't have to wait 15 minutes. Done, okay? Question number eight. A user, we've got another user guy, report, reports a phone battery does not last the entire day and the phone's navigation is slow. Which of the following should technician do first to troubleshoot the device? So it's a, he runs out of battery and then it's slow. Okay. First option is under A, examine the running apps. That's the first that they that they're asking, is this the first thing you should do? Second, update firmware. C, reinstall the most used applications. And then D, turn off all network services. Okay, so didn't say what kind of phone it is, but we do know basic stuff. We're gonna use some logic here. It's a phone battery, and it doesn't last the entire day. We know that if I use my phone all day, whether it's just normally or on a toilet or whatever. Uh, it's going to it's gonna run out quickly. And why does it run out quickly? Because we're using it. So we know that either a user is using it or something else is using the phone battery. Uh-huh. Okay. And then phone navigation is slow. 
Hmm, what does that mean? Doesn't that sound like there's something something using processing power? There's something going on that's causing it to go slow. That usually indicates that there's something else using the processing power. Because remember, whenever you're using a computer or a phone in this case, which is a smartphone, hopefully not a rotary phone. I God, I hope this is not a rotary phone or just like a regular digital phone, that home phone. <laughs> Can you imagine if they actually meant that? We're assuming it's a smartphone. And uh, <laughs> this is so silly. Anyways, so phone's navigation is slow. That means that for anything that you do on a computer, you for it to be fast, you want to make sure you have free resources, meaning processing power to do it. Otherwise, it's going to feel slow. Okay. So the first thing we're going to look at is examine the running apps. That's what I would do, right? This first thing I would do, it says examine the running apps. We're going to look what's going on, what's running in the background, and see if they're all like taking up all the RAM or CPU power, you know. And then update firmware. Why would we do that? Usually you'd update firmware on anything, uh, meaning the, the, for the reason you would do that, it's like for the same reason you would update operating system Windows 10, and that is for security issues, like security patches, you know, updates, little changes to the operating system. Uh, no. It's super rare. It's so rare that you would fix this with updating firmware, unless a really bad version of the operating system or firmware is already installed, that's the only reason you might want to do this, but no, not in this case. We installed the most used application. Why? Like, what would this do? All of this would is just like reset it, reset the settings for it. That's it. That this wouldn't, you know, whatever. It, that's not it. Turn off all network services. Why? It's not like, so basically turn off all network services. Why would I want to do that first? We're not talking about a PC. If this was a PC, if this was a PC, then you would want to turn off all network services if you see something like this going on, all right? If it's a PC. Uh, and the reason for that, if you happen to get a virus that's communicating outside of your computer, and that virus sometimes likes to gather a lot of information at once and send it over the network, that's the only time you'd want to turn off network services. In this case, I would just look at the examiner running apps. I mean, it's a phone. To get a virus on a phone, I haven't heard it yet. Not saying it's not possible, but to get a you know virus on, on your phone is super rare. So in this case, I would just do examiner running apps and close the ones that are just not being used. I would just close them. Chances are, you guys know, there are a bunch of things running in the background. Just go through and close them real quick. That's all there is to it, right? All right, let's go to the next question. Question number nine, right? Yeah, question number nine. Which of the following is the proper way to dispose of batteries? Ah, oh, okay. Not many people actually know this. Uh, A, shred. Definitely do not shred, okay? Do not shred the batteries. Please do not shred the batteries. B, recycle. C, dispose in trash. And D, incinerate. Do not, please do not incinerate this. Okay. Do I even have to talk about this, guys? We know that we should recycle batteries. It says on each, on each battery that we should recycle them. Okay. Question number 10. To prevent electrical damage to PC while working on it, which of the following should be disconnected before work begins? Oh, to prevent electrical damage to PC while working on it, while working on it, which of the following should be disconnected before work begin? Huh, I wonder. A, power cable. B, video cable. C, USB cable. D, serial cable. Now, guys, I don't mean to be mean when I say this, uh, but you should know what all these things are. I'm just saying. And <laughs> I don't have to Google it. But again, if you really have to look up things like serial cable, I can see some people not knowing what serial cable is, uh, but everybody should know what USB cable is. Again, feel free to Google it. I, know, I, I apologize if I offended anybody, but we all should know what this is. All of these things are, video cables and all this stuff. And we know that power 
uh, runs through the electricity runs through power cable so we're going to run so we're going to disconnect the power cable every time you work on a PC you know to prevent electrical damage to PC uh, or, or to yourself you don't want to get shocked and all that stuff all right guys let me know if you like this the last thing uh, I, uh, I said that I would make a second one if enough people were interested I only heard back from a handful of you, uh, which is kind of disappointing because I really want to make more. If we go back, there are a lot more practice tests I can talk about. Look at all this stuff. But you need to let me know. If not enough people are interested, I just feel like it's a waste of time if nobody's going to watch it. You know what I mean? So I'd really appreciate it if you take time and let me know or you know, leave a like or something, you know? Or share it with your friends. That's one way to know. If I see that there are enough views, that means there are enough people interested, right? Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I wish you best of luck. I hope you get this. Uh, I hope you get the A plus certification. This is awesome. It's awesome stuff. And yeah, you can check this out. It's free on CompTIA. Um, yeah, free practice tests. Good luck. Take care. Bye bye. Welcome, my name is Koboman, and in this video I will go through 20 sample questions and answers from CompTIA A plus 220-801 version exam. These questions do not represent the full extent of the exam and only serve an example of what is to be expected during certification exam. All questions and answers are written and voiced. Question number one. Beep codes are generated by which of the following? A. CMOS B. RTC C. POST D. WINDOWS The correct answer is C. POST Question number two. What is the main advantage of selecting a 64 operating system over a 32-bit operating system? A. The ability to use software-based data execution prevention, also known as DEP. B. The ability to use unassigned drivers. C. The ability to access more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. Or D. The ability to run multiple 16-bit programs in separate memory spaces? The correct answer is C, the ability to access more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. Question number three. You just turned off a printer to maintenance it. What should you be careful of when removing the fuser? A, the fuser being hot. B, the fuser being wet. C. The fuser being fragile. D. The fuser releasing the toner. The correct answer is A. The fuser being hot. Question number four. 80 millimeter and 120 millimeter are common sizes of what type of PC component? A. Case fans B. CPUs C. Heat sinks D. Memory modules The correct answer is A. Case fans Question number 5. On a laptop, which of the following would most likely be a pointing device? A. Serial mouse, B, PS2 mouse, C, USB mouse, D, touchpad. The correct answer is D, touchpad. Question number six. What is the maximum distance at which class A Class 2 Bluetooth device can receive signal from a Bluetooth access point. A. 
100 meters, B, 10 meters, C, 5 meters, D, 1 meter. The correct answer is D, 10 meters. Question number seven. Which type of cable has only two twisted pairs? A, UTP, B, POTS line, C, fiber, D, coaxial. The correct answer is B, POTS line. Question number eight. Which of the following power connectors might be used by hard drives? Select the two best answers. A, 8-pin, B, 7-pin, C, Molex, D, 15-pin, E, Berg. The correct answers are C, Molex, and D, 15-pin. Question number nine. Which of the following tools could be person used to test an AC outlet? Select the two best answers. A, multimeter. B, PSU tester. C, receptacle tester. D, loopback plug. The correct answer is multimeter and receptacle tester. Question number 10. Which of the following devices is the least likely to be replaced on a laptop? A. CPU B. RAM C. PC card D. Keyboard Correct answer is A. CPU Question number 11. Why would the display on a laptop get dimmer when the power supply from the AC outlet is disconnected? A. The laptop cannot use full brightness when on battery power. B. Power management settings on the laptop. C. To operate properly, laptop displays require an alternating current power source. C. Security settings on the laptop. The correct answer is B. Power management settings on the laptop. Question number 12. Which of the following form factors does a VGA connector comply with? A. 8P8C B. 15-pin D-shell C. Micro-ATX D. RG6 The correct answer is B. 15-pin D-shell Question number 13. How many pins would you see in a high quality print head on a dot matrix printer? A. 24 B. 15 C. 8 D. 35 Correct answer is A. 24 Question number 14. You want to upgrade memory in your computer. Which of the following is user replaceable memory in a PC? A. CMOS B. BIOS C. DRAM B. SRAM or E. ROM The correct answer is C. DRAM Question number 15. In current motherboards, which memory bus width can be accomplished by using the dual channel technology? A. 64 bit. B. 128 bit. C. 256 bit. 
C, 448-bit. The correct answer is B, 128-bit. Question number 16. Moving your CPU speed beyond its normal operating range is called what? A. Overclocking B. Overdriving C. Overpowering D. Overspeeding The correct answer is A. Overclocking Question number 17 what is the PC equivalent of FireWire? A. IEEE 1284 B. USB C. IEEE 1394 D. ISA The correct answer is C. IEEE 1394 Question number 18. Which device limits network broadcasting, segments IP address ranges, and intercorrects different physical media? A. Switch B. WAP C. Firewall D. Router The correct answer is D. Router Question number 19. A customer reports that an optical drive in a PC is no longer responding. What questions should you be asking first? A. What has changed since the optical drive worked properly? B. Did you log in with your administrator account? C. What did you modify since the optical drive worked? Or D. Have you been to any inappropriate websites? The answer is A. What has changed since the optical drive worked properly? Question number 20. Which device can store a maximum of 1.44 megabytes on a removable disk? A. Floppy drive. B. CD-ROM. C. ROM. The compact flash. The correct answer is A. Floppy drive. Thank you so much for watching this video. Keep in mind that there are many more questions that you will have to study for in order to pass A plus certification exam. I hope this will give you the confidence you need in order to make the first step towards your new career in IT. If you find this video helpful, please share it with friends or visit facebook.com forward slash koboman and like my page. Best of luck to you, my friends. So there will be a time when you come into work and suddenly there's a lot of work that needs to be done. How would you deal with that? Hello, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a situation in which you would have to think fast, think fast, think fast to resolve computer issues. So this video is good for help desk tier one, tier two, or desktop support or tech support, or if you're the guy that just simply works at a location as tech support for a company. So in this case, we have four different uh, trouble tickets that came through the system, but they are something that was left over from the previous shift or from the previous group that was in charge of that. So I'm going to show you how I would quickly resolve these issues. So this kind of uh, give you, will give you an idea of how I'm thinking and I will actually give you a kind of uh, uh, an idea of my level of knowledge or level of expertise, a level of experience. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It makes a big difference for me and without any further delay, let's get into it. Okay, so here we go guys. Uh, we've got some tickets we're going to work on. What is this? 
Oh yeah, I don't know if you guys watched my previous video um, on actor directory. Uh, I do uh, suggest you check it out. Uh, we worked on some of these people. We created some user accounts, put them in their different groups, and we got you know the different people that we created on there, like Mary Pipkins, Mike Bobson, and Larry Buffett, and we put them all in there. If you want to check that out, I do have a video on that. It's uh, uh, I think it's actor directory for beginners or something like that. Yeah, check that out. It's a good video. All right. So I made some of these tickets during uh, testing of the live stream that I made, I want to say a couple of weeks ago. So they are uh, quite expired. So as you can see here, time to do is negative 85 hours. So that's many, many days past due and you, you don't want to see this in a ticketing system at all. Uh, you want them to be fresh. You don't want them to have that. Well, you know, okay, let, let me just create that, uh, just a fake ticket. Just so you guys can see, fake ticket, how it uh, looks like whenever uh, you have a freshly ticket that comes through. Of course, this is going to be a different uh, looking for different uh, ticketing systems, but for this one, we're just going to, it's going to, yeah, there it is, pops up. And it, it, when it just creates it for Jira ticketing system, it's eight hours um to do it to fix it that's the deadline eight hours all right so let's see we have my desktop icons are missing and uh it says here i am missing desktop icons please help me so what can cause this now there are many things that can actually cause this from user deleting the files from uh, some kind of a change on domain so let's say somebody uh, gets transferred to a different department they get moved into a different group within a domain or within active directory if you will and um, suddenly now they are missing different icons because uh, this can be due to the like different redirects that different groups may have and again if you don't know what i'm talking about at this point you might want to check out my active directory video that i mentioned previously and uh, when it comes to this uh, video, I'm just going to kind of give you quick answers and show you quick answers on some of these tickets that how I would go about resolving them. If you want to know exactly how to do these tickets, you know, in, in the sense on how to contact the customer, how to add internal notes like this, how to reply to the customer, how to talk to them in general, and customer service just in general, how to work actual system. I have many, many examples of videos on that, and do check that out. They're literally, so if you go to my channel, youtube.com forward slash Coleman, and go to the search box within my channel, and just type in ticket, and you'll see all of those individual examples that literally go into super detail on how to do all of this stuff, and it's very, very good, especially for somebody who has never done it. Anyways, I'm sorry, I had to get that out of the way, so you guys... Uh, you know, have more resources to actually check out in case you haven't watched my previous videos. So again, I'm going to go through all these tickets that are in the system and I'm going to give you quick answers of what I would do in order to resolve them. So this one is, I'm missing desktop icons, please help me. So it could be just something that, you know, user went through like this and just like deleted or went through like this and just kind of drag things into the recycle bin or anywhere else. And, and then again, it could be somebody who moved to a different department. You kind of have to ask them all this stuff. They moved to a different department. Uh, why are you, you know, it's kind of unusual to have missing desktop icons. So when somebody moves to a different department, they're moved to a different group within Active Directory, which can have different desktop redirects. Uh, these desktop redirects is something that is set up for individual departments that allow for certain desktop icons, uh, files, even files like this, or anything else within that you can put literally in a folder. And um, those people within that group will get desktop redirect, meaning that they will get all of those uh, redirected files pushed to them. So let's say somebody logged into this computer and they belong to a certain group. And let's say that certain group is going to always have, for example, these files in it and their desktop will always have these files. They will get automatically redirected. Uh, they will, they will automatically get these files redirected to their desktop like this, you know? So if they've been moved to a different group, chances are they may no longer have these. You know, so that's another thing you can do. Obviously, you can look through a recycle bin to see if there's something in the recycle bin, if they've deleted it. And uh, it depends what it is. They may be asking about 
uh, specific software that it's missing you know software could have multiple icons because you know there's some software that has more than one function and they have more than uh, one app within that one software so they could be missing those uh, is it all icons if it's just some you know all these things we have to um, kind of ask them first in order to kind of help them and kind of trace back the steps and help them figure out where what happened to them so that's how I would approach this ticket here. Here's another one here where it says, I can't hear people through Zoom meeting. So if we look at this and it says today I had a meeting, but I can no longer hear people. So what is this? I mean, Zoom meeting, we all know what Zoom meeting is, and that is just a software or an application that's used for communication, right? So, you know, if they can't hear people through Zoom meeting, that means there's some kind of an audio issue going on. And of course, for that, I would go through the uh, sound control panel. What I usually like to do is I would right click this uh, volume icon and of course make sure that it's, you know, normal stuff, that it's not muted and this and that. So what I like to do is go open, you know, open sound settings and go to, uh, well, first, like right, right away, you can, you know, make sure that their output is set to whatever it is. So in this case, we got Realtek set to Realtek high definition audio. If we know Realtek high definition audio is just a built in audio for the computer. That's not their headphones that there might be using. So you might want to drop down and select the headphones that they're using. You know, so that's just one place where you can look at it. I mean, they haven't mentioned anything about people not being able to hear them, but if that's the case, obviously you want to go to input and make sure that the microphone is selected. Or if you see an issue like this where it says no input device found, then we have another issue. Then for that, I would go to sound control panel, which is over here, and then uh, for you know, but since the issue is they can't, he I can't hear people through Zoom meeting. Um, chances are that the, their headset is not selected. In this case, there is no headset. The only thing that's selected is just the real tech, which is the onboard sound. So we want to make sure that their headset, whatever it is, um, might be selected. As a matter of fact, I'm going to plug in a headset over there so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so there it is. I plugged it in over there and automatically selected it, which is good. Uh, so yeah, of course, uh, the issue might be simply that their headset is not plugged in, but chances are pretty low, you know. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that it has that uh, green circle with the white check mark that it's selected. So if you have it uh, set like this, so you can, you know, this automatically actually selected it to be a default the communication device, which is fine. That could work too. Uh, but let's say it's set up like this and you, you know, it's not set up as default. You might want to do this and set it up as a default. And you can do this, make sure it's set as a, uh, you know, uh, automatically communication device. But, uh, and here's the part of it now where the microphone comes up. Now we can see that it's selected and you can see that there's nothing plugged in. It's a recording part of uh, just the real tech part of it. Uh, that being said, uh, make sure that if you go inside of the application, whether it's Zoom, uh, WebEx, or whatever it is that they're using for meeting, make sure that you go inside and make sure that this their headset is selected just like so. I have many videos on this, so I'm just going to move on from this. But this is typically what the issue is when it comes to audio issues. We want to make sure that everything is selected, volume raised, tested, whether it's uh, them not being able to hear somebody or whether they're, people are not able to hear them. So just go through those settings and uh, yeah, should be able to get you on the in the in the right direction. Here's another one that says I am missing a program on my desktop. So they usually uh, users usually realize this when there's an icon missing when there's an icon missing on their desktop. So you can start from there. Let's say they're, say they're saying, I don't have my Google Chrome. You know, chances are maybe it's just a shortcut that's been deleted. So you want to go to the programs and actually look for it to see if it's installed there. That's your first step. If indeed is a missing, and you know how they they say in this example, they're saying my program on my desktop, chances are it's just the icon. So if it's just the icon, go to Recycle Bin and see if it's been accidentally deleted and bring it back. But if, if the software is in indeed missing uh, you would have to basically go inside uh, usually within the start menu somewhere here or within uh, the programs themselves you would know you know the company that you're working for you would know what kind of uh, distribution software that they're using to push different programs so for example you see all of these things that are installed on here chances are aside from Microsoft stuff but like let's say there is other stuff installed in here for example uh, we got OpenOffice, we got Oracle, 
and uh, you know stuff like that chances are that this type of software will be controlled by another software that does the distribution meaning installation of the software for all the computers within a company so it's a program that controls installation of all of these things so you would go in here and search for that program and look it up either here or the root of C depends how it's all set up but you would make sure that indeed that program that they're missing is listed in there so all you have to do is just make sure that it, it, see if it's in see if it allows you to reinstall it and there should be a way to do it a lot of times you would select it and just select install you know and they have different options like uninstall this is the repair maybe this and that that's how i'll go about it but if they are uh, no longer have the the software that they need this might be some kind of a licensing issue you have to kind of figure out what happened to their program so Sometimes, sometimes people that control what they call subscriptions, uh, software subscriptions for the company, for each computer, for each individual within the company, sometimes um, they will remove uh, licenses, licenses, uh, program licenses from the computers, and they would sometimes automatically remove them, or meaning that the, they would remove the program automatically. So. The way you can check this is basically by finding out what the uh, host name is for the computer typically. So you would find out what, so the name of the computer, host name or computer name is the same thing. Host name is generally used in a uh, business type of environment. So host name, computer name is the same thing. So you would n take this name, tech support, uh, as the computer name, as the host name, and look it up in the system that uh, allows you to look up different subscriptions that are uh, added to this computer named tech support so and then you will look for that specific subscription for that program that they're missing and if they're missing that subscription they may have to or you may have to assist them in order to get that software again you know so all right that's how i would go about approaching this one so let's move on and for that we have a ticket here it says i think i may have a virus on my computer from Mike Moser. It says here, this morning I received a weird message that said my computer is infected. I can't click away or use a computer at all. So this is a really good uh, example of something that you may encounter um, in a help desk, but also desktop support. If you're in a help desk, you may have limited tools, but if you're doing desktop support and you happen to be a guy that's like on site, then there is something you can do about it. Depending on the help desk, you may be able to do something about it as well. But generally speaking, if, if it's a message like this, you definitely want to take care of it right away. So if you are just a text, if, okay, well, let me, let me start from the beginning. I apologize. If you're help desk, all you can do here is kind of uh, go with your feeling on this. You know, the, the, the ticket literally says, this morning I received a weird message that my computer is infected. That you might as well assume that there is a virus on there right off the bat. So the best thing you can do to them or, or to them, not to them, but with the user is ask them to disconnect the computer from the network and turn it off. So that way, or, or just, you know, unplug it from the power. You know, that's what I would do. Just let them, tell them to shut down, turn it off. Especially if they can't click on anything, you want them to turn it off. And when you're tier desk, when you're tier one help desk, that's pretty much all you can do. And then from there, you may have to refer them to their local uh, tech support people. You know, they could, they may have somebody at the office in their building. So let's say there, it's some kind of a large building. There's, you know, I don't know, 500 employees. They gotta have somebody there who is that their tech guy who deals with this type of stuff. Now, if you're that guy that deals with this type of stuff, uh, there are steps that you have to take in order to remove this virus. Generally speaking, in a business environment, the best thing to do is just, you know, re-image the computer, meaning that you would delete everything from the computer. But sometimes you have to recover data that's on there. Let's say user saved a bunch of important stuff on the computer. Then you got to take certain steps in order to uh, retrieve this because you can't just pull them off. So typically you would, what you would do is take a hard drive uh, from this infected computer. You would physically take it, put it into another computer, and set it as a slave drive. But make sure that other computer 
is updated, meaning Windows updated, make sure that their virus definition is updated, and make sure it's completely updated uh, to make so it doesn't get infected as well. Make sure that the computer is off the network, meaning that it's not connected to the, the company's network or anything like that, because if you don't know what kind of virus this is, this could be something that could spread, you know what I mean? So this is all in case you have to recover data from it. All right, from there, um, you know, the, 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 this drive is slaved. Whenever you slave a drive into a computer, meaning you add a second hard drive to the computer, in this case, this infected drive. You take it, you put it inside the computer, and you just plug it into the power and the SATA connection, chances are. And then what it's going to look like is just going to show up as a second drive like this, you know. So as long as it's like that and it's not the system drive and you don't execute anything, meaning you go inside of this drive and you don't click on any executables or anything. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even go in, into it right away at all. I wouldn't even open it up. Um, you know, the chances are that as, as long as you don't run anything, your computer is compu completely safe because you are running things off your C drive and the, everything that's running in the background like this. See, these are all background processes. They're all running from your local C drive and not from the slave drive, uh, like in this example. So as long as you don't execute anything, you, there's no way for a virus to actually execute itself. You know? uh, that, would be have to, that would have to be some highly sophisticated virus. It's, it's, it's I want to say, 99.9% .9 impossible for that to happen. So the reason you want to have it slaved like this is so that way you can actually scan it. So if you right click it, then you can just scan it, for example, with, you know, Windows Defender or whatever the installed antivirus software is it or and is is on on your computer. That way you will find the uh, the in infection, you would remove it, and at that point you can go inside and recover anything that might be on there that they need. You know, so that way it's perfectly safe to go in and ask them or just kind of look around to see where they might have data that you want to recover. Of course, the drive itself, when you slave it, might have a BitLocker encryption on it. For that, it's going to ask you for a key. You see how this one has a little locket on it. That means it's unlocked. But, you know, if you uh, if you do get a prompt, like you would double click it and it would ask you, I made a video on this, on how to actually unlock it. So I do have a video on how to deal with the BitLocker encryption. You double click it and it would say, nope, you need a password or you need the BitLocker uh, key. And then you would get that and then, you know, go from there. That's another layer of security, which is good. So that's how you would go about it. And of course, after you're done with it, remove the drive and I would just, you know, uh, wipe it. I would wipe it clean. Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast because this is a video and which I'm trying to make uh, just in my spare time. I really don't have that much spare time, so I apologize if I'm going too fast for people that are used to me going slower. And I think that's it. This is the last thing. One, the last one here is the fake ticket one. And again, I have a lot of examples of this type of stuff. How to do everything from from the beginning to an end. All right, guys, I'm gonna go to my uh, face cam outro, I guess. Well, there you go. I hope you find this video insightful. Sometimes you got to think fast in order to resolve all these issues quickly. In this case, we had few tickets that were left over and we took care of them. Uh, there are many, many things you can do with that. But with experience, you will become faster and more knowledgeable and will be able to resolve these issues quickly. It's not a big deal once you know how to do all of this stuff. So never shy away from trying to learn things on your own. It's incredibly important because that's how you learn new things and that's how you become smart. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to a help desk ticketing crash course. If you have friends that are interested in this type of stuff too, please let them know as this is premiering right now. All right, guys, we have a lot to cover. This is going to be about an hour and a half. So sit back, relax. If you want to get some coffee or something to drink, now is a good time.
And while you're getting a snack or a drink, please take one second out of your time to like this video. I really appreciate it. And with that being said, let's get right into it. So first ticket is based off my feedback that I got from Eddie. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, you know who you are. Thank you so much uh, for giving me an idea for this ticket. So let's have a look. And the first ticket here says, I can't log in to my computer. And the error is domain not available. So the reporter name is Mike Moser. And Mike here says, please help me. I only get an error domain not available when attempting to log in. So I'll log into his computer, right? I am able to log in using my phone app, the contact help desk. So I don't think it's my password. So here's what's going on. Uh, this user, whenever they try to log into their computer, they simply just get this message. It says domain not available. And there are a couple of different reasons for this to happen. And the first one is the computer simply needs to be joined the, the, the domain that it belongs to. So that way it doesn't get this error. And the second uh, reason for it is that computer is simply not connected to the network of any sort, you know, physically. Um, if it's a computer that is like work from home type of computer where it simply needs a network or internet connection, chances are this would not happen, although it may. I've seen that happen as well. But generally speaking, when it's work from home, uh, this would not necessarily happen. Uh, but the, the reason you would, the second reason you would get this is when you're not physically connected to the network that the computer belongs to uh, when it comes to the domain itself. Okay, now I digress. Let me tell you what domain is. There are a couple of different domains, right? There is a first domain that you can think of, right? Here's, for example, cosmicnova.com. That's one example of a domain. Cosmicnova.com is literally name of the domain, it's also known as the website, right? So that's that. However, it's different from a business environment. Business environment has its own domain, which all the computers on that network are joined to specifically. And that is found on their computer properties. So this is just one way of getting to it. It doesn't matter which way you get to it as long as you get to it. But if you right click this PC, for example, or just go to system settings, you can just type in system settings or something like that. And it will get to this point. And the the part where you want to look at is here where it says computer name, domain, and work group settings. This computer is on a local home network and it's joined this work group here where it says new server zero. When a business environment, it would literally say domain here instead of work group and it would give you the name of the domain, which looks like this here. This computer here. So this computer here, if we look at the same settings, you can see that it literally says here domain instead of work group, and it gives you the name of the domain. You, have, you see how it says here tech support dot coboman dot com. It's kind of similar to what we saw as a website, for example, cosmicnova.com that I showed you, but it's different. This is just for the business. That's the name of the business. And that's what is going on with this ticket. Again, let me show you here comparison real quick. This is what my local computer looks like. You see it says work group instead of domain. But then this one here, here it says domain. So if the issue here is, I'm just going to minimize this here. If the issue here is that this user's computer needs to be added to the domain, this is how you would do it. You would go back to the system and you would go to advanced system settings and then under computer name here the very first tab you will get an option to change computer name and then if you look down here where it says to rename this computer or change its domain or work group click change and then you would select literally change select domain and then type in what it was it tech support dot coboman dot com is that what we had here? I know we did. I just want to show you that it is in that techsupport.coboman.com. Minimize this real quick. And then we're going to click OK. And after that, you have to reboot the computer. See, it's not going to do it now because this is a local computer and the other one is just a virtual machine. You would get a notification that says, Do you want to join this computer to this domain? If you do something like that. It's been a while since I actually manually had to do this, it's super rare. 
But I digress. It would say it would, you would have to reboot afterwards, and then it would be added, and it would here would say it would say domain instead of workgroup, and it would be tech support dot coboman dot com. Now there is a there are other reasons why this might happen. It could be just an error in the in the system itself, the operating system. But another reason also could be is that this computer is not physically connected to the network where the domain is located. So if it's like a business environment, let's say it's a large building, and the computer gets this error, um, you know, it's either what I said before is that either it's not added to the domain or it doesn't exist on the domain or it's not physically connected. So you might want to check the cable. Just adding a quick note while editing this video. This can also happen whenever a user receives a new computer and they don't log into it before taking it home, meaning that you have to be connected to the domain for your first login so it can create a domain-based login or local profile for that user. This is why this error happens. Otherwise, at home, they can just use their password and log in locally, even though it's not connected to the network or domain of any sort. Uh, th these are the only things I can think of right now when it comes to this error, and that is how I would deal with this specific issue. So, if this user is at an office, I would physically go there and um, you know make sure that the computer is you know, plugged in. If 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 it's if it's a guy that's literally within the same building, I know some people do tech support, or you know, desktop support or whatever in a building where there's like I don't know, hundred users, two hundred, five hundred, doesn't matter. They can physically go to their computer and check all these settings, make sure they are added. I can't think of any other way to do this instead of having physical access because you can't log in. So you can't really take uh, control remotely if this is somebody who's working from home, for example. And this really shouldn't be happening when somebody's working from home. And the reason I'm uh, mentioning working from home is because obviously a lot of people are going to working from home, especially in the current situation. But I've seen it happen couple of times and for each one of those times user had to bring the computer back uh, to the office or you know location where you can actually make these changes the reason being is so you can physically connect it to the network so that way you can re-add it in there um, using a local admin so by the way in order to make those changes where that i showed you in there when you go to advanced settings to add the computer uh, in this case you might have to do it using local administrator privileges and uh, it depending on the business setup business environment you may be able to because here's what happened in order to for you to do it remotely to add the computer back to the domain which still may not work properly because they're working from home but let's say you are somehow doing it you would have to get local admin uh, login so that you can actually log into computer to begin with and then make the changes here right you'd go in and make the changes otherwise you have no other way of doing it and you would have to literally have the user type in all the information and you would literally have to guide them to do it and you know whether your company allows this type of thing realistically it's best to just have them bring it to the tech guy at their office and just have him deal with it but hey every company has different rules maybe you are allowed to do this maybe you are allowed to share this information uh, local admin uh, password uh, with with the <laughs> with the user i don't know uh, but this is how you would go about resolving this. Okay, so I'm just going to reply to him and say, uh, well, first of all, I would talk to him. I would talk to him on the phone and uh, make sure that this indeed is the error and that he can't log in any other way. And uh, I'm just going to say, in this case, just to be safe, okay, uh, can you please bring back the computer to the office so we can fix it and you can provide details typically on a ticket when you're adding um, internal notes or any notes you want to be specific uh, in this case I don't necessarily want to be specific if I'm just talking to them 
But since I've talking to them on the phone, I highly suggest that you do talk to them on the phone. Uh, if you can't, you know, if it's again, if it's not at the local office, make sure that uh, they're already aware why you want men, why you want them to bring it back. At, at least give them that. Doesn't matter whether I understand it or not. Uh, this just tell them this is what you have to do, and this is how we can fix it. You know, and then I'm just gonna say computer needs to be added to domain. And again, this is all with assumption that I'm talking to the customer. I already talked to them and ensured them uh, that this is going to get fixed and how I'm going to go about it. So I'm just putting down basic information instead of just, you know, this is just a formality at this point. Okay, so we're going to wait for the customer to um, come back. By the way, I forgot to assign this ticket to myself. I really got into it. It's been a while since I, I made some of these help desk ticket based videos. So yeah, make sure you assign the you know ticket to yourself, and uh, we're gonna get back to it, and possibly route it to the local IT tech support people. Depending how your computer or, or how your tech support is set up, you may have to route this ticket to them. But in this case, he's just gonna bring it to me, and I'm going to just resolve it. All right. Next ticket, it's thanks to uh, feedback from this gentleman on Discord. Uh, let me show you here. Well, first of all, let's uh, let's read the ticket. It's the ticket that I created based off of uh, his feedback and idea. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, is I forgot to change my password and now I can't log in. And it's kind of specific here in description. It says, "Hi, I forgot to change my password last Friday, and over the weekend my password expired. I can't log in to change." So it's kind of specific to the way why he can't log in. It says, I forgot to change my password last Friday, and over the weekend my password expired, and I can't log in to change it. Usually, usually customers or users would get notifications on when the password is about to expire. And I've also seen where, you know, user either forgets or just kind of ignores it because sometimes you just get one notification i've seen that too it's only one notification like 14 days before it expires or something like that uh, and uh and that would be pretty much it and then they forget about it but the reason i made this specific ticket is in a scenario that this gentleman on discord described to me again i appreciate your help and here it is what he says mr rtm thank you and it says, if I catch a help desk call and user wanting to reset their password, uh, I'm sorry, if I catch a help desk call and a user wanting to reset their password uh, to easily guess passwords such as password or password 123, I advise them that their desired password is not very secure to coach them and how to make the password more without driving them crazy or resort to writing it down somewhere. So he's giving an example of how he's handling um, password resets whenever he uh, works basically a help desk uh, call. Or I'm assuming, at, from what I gathered, he works at a location where he probably takes turn, and he can correct me if I'm wrong here, he probably takes turn on basically on answering a help desk call that probably comes through their central line for the tech support guys at, at uh, locally probably there. And then he says, off-site users do not get system notifications of when their password will expire. You see, this is something I kind of touched on. I've seen it. Usually, Windows will just say your password. You get a pop-up notification. And it kind of goes away to the side. And a lot of people don't see it. But in this case, they don't get any notifications, which is something wrong with the system. To help with this, I let them know when the new password will expire, expire, and we built expiration date into the new password. Uh, so he has to let them know. Uh, but see, I'm not sure if he means that he set the system to do this, but I don't, I don't think so, because uh, from when I talked to him l l further down, it didn't, didn't seem to be the case. And then it says here, for example, if the new password expire on 12.16, we might use something like this password without quotation marks. So he's giving me a really good example of a short but a secure password. This is a really good uh, password. It has a combination of with the asterisk as a symbol and then combination of numbers. And then it says, I tell them with 
I tell them about one of the passwords checking checking sites, and on one of the sites, the password check results are that that would be take computer 23 years. Okay, so he's basically giving him an example of, hey, this is a secure password. It's really simple to remember, but if you want to test your password on how long it would take to crack, you know, he's basically saying that uh, to the user that the password is very secure. They don't necessarily have to worry about it. And uh, it says our password lasts 90 days, which is normal before the account gets disabled. So the new password is strong enough and it's not uh, so complex that they would struggle with it. The password also checks all the requirements for the password complexity. So, yeah, this is a really good password. Um, the, what I find interesting about this is that he is given him permanent passwords. Typically, in a business environment, uh, what you want to do is give him a temporary password. It, it, again, it, this, this highly depends on the environment, on what business prefers. Uh, but when it comes to security, you you realistically you realistically want to give him a temporary password in Active Directory. So if we go to Active Directory here again. And uh, again, I'm sorry. Well, again, well, yeah, again, because I made a lot more videos about Active Directory. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's again. And uh, it's just kind of finicky here. I had to send them, send that alt control delete so I can get to the login part of it. Anyway, so when you typically go in and let's find Mike Moser here. Mike Moser. And, you know, somebody says, my password is expired. You would just basically change their password and give them a temporary password. Meaning that whatever I type in here for the new password, I confirm password, and then leave this checked, which is checked by default. It says, user must change password and next log on. It's a temporary password. So whenever they log in, they will create their own Hopefully, in a perfect world, a secure password like this gentleman suggested. But since in his uh, situation, in his business, the notifications for the password expiration have been expired, and probably for some other reasons too, uh, probably because they can't log in, uh, he has to give them a permanent. This is, I'm assuming these are remote. Well, he, it is, say, off site users. These are all remote users, so they can't. Uh, type in the new temporary password in at all uh, because their current computer will only take their old password. So chances are they can log into the computer, but they can't uh, change their password at all. So the computer wouldn't even register because it's not connected to the VPN, uh, VPN at all, and it's not connected to the domain. It doesn't have access to the to, to the business network. I'm sorry. One more note. Man, this goes to show that there are so many that can go wrong that to think about when it comes to resolving these type of issues. But another reason person cannot log in to VPN to change their password is because when your password expires, your account is locked. So your VPN will not allow you to log in at all. This is why he is given them permanent passwords, which enables their account once more. So he doesn't realize that the password has been reset or changed at all. So he has to give him a permanent password, which is something I've done and still do occasionally because this is the only way. And then later on, I offer them uh, an option to actually change their password again. But once they're connected to the VPN, then they can set it to whatever they want. So this is the setup that they have over there. And which is fine. This is how his business runs things, you know. However, Technically speaking, it's a security risk to for him um, also to know the password for all the users, you know. And again, I mean, this is technically speaking, you know what I mean? If the user is fine with that, um, you know, that's fine. This is a very secure password. And if the business uh, gives 100% trust to the tech support guys there, that's perfectly fine too. Who am I to judge? But technically speaking, uh, it's more secure to... Uh, give them for them to have their own password. I, I mean, you can argue this back and forth. Uh, I can see, uh, I, I can argue for both sides, either way, as you can tell. But you know, in this case, this is what's uh, this is the situation for this gentleman. And then it says here, 
users, and then I asked them, uh, because I wanted to clarify, uh, does this user not get a password notification with VPN? And then, and then I realized that they were off-site. So chances are they wouldn't even get it. Uh, but because the, the the notifications are not working to begin with for some reason, so even before it expired, they didn't get it. But of course, if they're not on VPN at all, it's not gonna. You know what I mean? It's what is there to send if there is no connection? What is there to send a notification if there is no connection? Just like you get notifications for YouTube or any other website, you have to have network a lot of times. They're just SSO credentials, meaning single sign-on. The other issue we found was that the users get got confused in the Windows login and it was prompting for a change. So we pretty much advised them if they get a notification to get to go to the internet site for now. So yeah, it looks like they have some kind of a website set up for that to help them deal with these password issues and to check probably to check let them check uh, when their password is going to expire. We are implementing a ping SSO system that should complete later this year. Um, and uh, but the awareness training of a secure password doesn't drive you crazy like sticks with them and and crazy sticks with them um so yeah so he basically goes around and trains and he mentions this uh users that you can have a secure password without actually having it be too complicated and it says i actually teach this in a security awareness training in the new employee orientations so he's a really good guy. He's going above and beyond when it comes to teaching passwords, pass security, basically. I also plan on taking a laptop um, on a rolling cart throughout the hospital and spend a few hours just letting users come up and check their complexity of their current passwords. So he also plans uh, to go around. He, you know, this is really cool, actually. I work uh, right now. I'm working from home because of the whole situation, but I also work in a building. It's kind of a campus type of building with three built buildings connect together, and that's pretty cool when you can actually, you know, grab a cart, put your laptop on, and just go around and just help people. You know, that's really cool and fun. And then he's going to do that. He's going to go around and have people check the complexity. And I have a feeling that what he's talking about here is that he has a password. Uh, testing website that he they can go in and type in their password and it will take their it will test the complexity or security of their password which is pretty cool and um, and then he says if it's not very complex I show them how to improve and still be easy to remember yeah this is really cool I I really like his feedback and just different way on how he's dealing with things uh, when it comes to tech support it's very interesting and a bit different from the things uh, that are done, the way things are done uh, in, in, in my particular business environment, but nonetheless still valid in my opinion. And then he goes to talk about we have outside clinics that are not part of a hospital or have remote access to our patient records and have stress, uh, have stress password security for, with everyone. And I stress password security with everyone. That's cool. I like that. And then their help desk um, is aware of this. Uh, probably practices the same type of thing. And that was pretty much it. I kind of uh, tried to get more understanding of what's going on, but then, and, and then why the basically issue wasn't addressed to begin with, which in this case is the fact that they're not getting notifications for the password resets in his environment. But it's something that he can't help. A lot of times we are limited. Even if we want to help, we are limited in a company that um, that doesn't necessarily want you to mess with things that are above your pay grade or don't give you the tools to do it, you know. So the way I would deal with this issue is the same way. I would actually uh, call them and talk to them, especially if they're a remote user and set up this password just like he did it. I would give him a permanent password. I, I made actually a video about this in which I dealt it with the same way. Um, it was a, I think the video is called VPN password or something like that. I highly suggest to, uh, for you to actually watch this if you're interested in this specifically as I expand on that um, in that video as well and how you would uh, deal with that. But yeah, if you know, if the password has expired and they can't 
change it, I would do the same thing as this gentleman. I would give him a, a permanent password and uh, offer them to uh, basically reset their password again so that they can get a prompt to change it again. You know, give them a temporary password. But this is after they log into the computer with the permanent password that I've given him, just like that gentleman explained. And then, assuming that I'm talking to them on the phone, I'm just going to call this, uh, I'm going to give it an internal note for my boss. I've reset user's password and just call it that. I'm not going to leave anything else there because it's it's uh, redundant. Um, that's all I've done. That's all there is to it. If management is completely aware in these type of situations that uh, if you, somebody's on a VPN and they can't change their password, this is how you would do it. You know, there's no other way unless there's some kind of weird system set up. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's all there is to it for this particular ticket. We have a couple of tickets we're going to work, but before we do that, please take one second out of your time to click the like button. I really appreciate it. it means a lot to me. The first one we're going to actually work is this one here where it says my printer is not working. Typically, you want to work tickets that are in order. For example, this one says ISD 34 and this one says ISD 35. But the reason I'm going to work the ISD 35 first is because it's in relation to suggestion or something that somebody from my Discord actually asked and I kind of made it into my own idea, I guess. All right, let's see who said this. So a couple of days ago, I asked for suggestions on my help desk training videos, basically ideas for tickets or issues that I can work on or talk about because I really need more ideas, guys. I have over 420 videos or something like that. So chances are I've covered majority of topics. So I'm always open for those. And please don't forget to let me know if you have any ideas or anything that you want me to talk about, whether it's in the comments section below this video or on discord if you want to join my discord there is a link in the description so the idea i got for the other one for the printer ticket is from mr rookie bob so bob said is there a way to tell if device device if device drivers are installed correctly short of a device manager and he said had an old machine that i restalled uh, that i reinstalled and is network uh, wouldn't connect via Ethernet, and device manager said the driver was up to date. Had to manually download from the site and install before it started working. So basically what's going on here, he's saying that uh, everything looked fine in the device manager uh, when it comes to the Ethernet adapter that he had installed. And let me show you how that looks like. So if I go to the device manager and a look at the device manager, and in this case, what was happening under the Ethernet. Uh, everything looked fine, but yet Ethernet did not work. By the way, thank you very much, Bob, uh, for uh, basically giving me that suggestion, which I kind of made into a printer issue. But I will talk about specifically what you mentioned. So he said network adapter looked fine. So in this case, for example, we have Intel R Ethernet connection adapter. And that's the physical one. The other ones here is for the virtual box and one for Hyper-V. So they're virtual adapters that are tunneled, uh, that tunnel to the Intel R Ethernet, which is the physical one. So what he's talking about, that it looked normal. Everything looked normal. There are no um, issues in device manager. What usually happens is when you have an error, uh, in, when, when driver didn't install properly or something doesn't install at all, in device manager, usually on the bottom here, there would be a list of things with exclamation marks on them. In his case, it looked fine, but it still didn't work. So if you look at it, the properties, uh, you know, everything looked fine. It says device started working properly, this and that. But it didn't start working until he actually went to the website for the specific hardware that he has and installed that specific driver. And this can happen uh, when uh, Windows operating system installs generic drivers. And uh, it used to be worse before. And uh, you can see here, he mentioned it's an older machine. So chances are it's an older operating system as well. It has gotten better with Windows 10. 
with Windows 10 operating system uh, because of that whole plug and play thing gotten better. Although they started suggesting that I think in Windows XP times, maybe even earlier, maybe Windows 2000 or something like that. Basically, uh, what I had to tell him is there's no way, there's no easy way to tell a site. There's no easy way to tell aside from assuming that the wrong driver is installed. So yeah, if it doesn't work and it looks normal in the device manager, then chances are you have to go and actually download or update that driver specifically for that specific piece of hardware, whether it's Ethernet adapter, a graphics card, sound card, or anything like that. And then I said, I've noticed Windows OS likes to generic drivers that sometimes do not work even though looks normal in device manager. So that goes back to me saying or talking about generic drivers or basic drivers that they use. Uh, I guess generic would be more a technical term. And this usually uh, is especially true with older hardware, but it has gotten way better with Windows 10. Okay, now let's segue into this. So yeah, basically to just kind of wrap this up, you would update your driver or install this driver package specifically for your computer, for your computer model or this and that. Okay, now let's hit the printer ticket because it's kind of in relation to that. Again, make sure you assign to this to yourself when you're working these tickets. This is a Jira ticketing system. Tutorial, we're actually just going to 